good morning. Welcome to Sewing Quarter. My name's Amy Burrows and I'm with you all morning today. Now, Monday morning, first day back at school, has the potential to maybe be a little bit depressing or it's that back to school blues, but we've got none of that here at Sewing Quarter this morning. Despite the fact I have been told I maybe look a bit like a teacher sitting in front of the blackboard here at work today, but no, we're not having anything depressing. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you today. I'm really excited to be joined by two guests who I've never had on my show before. So this morning, let's look at the menu at eight o'clock. I'm joined by Paul Clark from the Great British Sewing Bee. And we've got sewing school, so we're going, we're going to do a bowling shirt this morning in this first hour. Then at nine o'clock, we're so fortunate to have Susan Briscoe in today, who's the author of the Ultimate Sushiko book, and we're doing some Sushiko technique. At 10 o'clock, Paul is back for a very cute dinosaur toy that's aptly been named Derek the Dinosaur. And 11 o'clock, Sushiko again with Susan Briscoe, again looking at some other techniques and introducing that into a wall hanging. So you can see it's not a depressing morning here at all. I know it's Monday and we know it's back to school, but it's all fun here at Sewing Quarter, so we've got nothing to be sad about. Now also remember, we love you to get in touch. So if you've got any questions for our guests this morning, for Paul or for Susan, please do send those in. You can either head to the website and if you go to the uh, live feed of today's show, so you click the watch icon at the top there, and just under that live feed of today's show, you'll see if we just scroll down a little bit, there it is, that bubble there on the right-hand side. You can message the studio. So what's producer Hannah going to say to us this morning? Hello. That's very, very unexciting. Hello and one exclamation mark. But yes, you can drop us a message that way. And just under that is also all of the products from today's show. So there'll be a shopping list there of everything you can add to your basket. You can click on those, check them out on the website. And also if you want to, you know, check, check any details or measurements or colours of anything, all of those are listed there, you know, in the product descriptions. Now, also, if you, want, if you do want to send in a question, they can go straight up to producer Hannah upstairs. You can email us. So if you email studio at sewingquarter.com, we can get that straight onto our iPad here on the set so we can ask questions to Paul and to Susan. Um, or also, if you want to uh, send in any photos, perhaps you've, you've had a go at some of the projects that Paul did last time he was in, or perhaps you've done some sashiko, attach a photo and share those with us so we can show them on the show this morning. So... Right, let's get cracking. As I said, we've got a bowling shirt this morning and it's so lovely. This is the first time we've ever had a men's garment on the show. We've never done any dressmaking and made, you know, a men's shirt. So I'm glad we're moving into that sort of territory. We're doing something a bit new. So first of all, we've got the pattern that we're working with this morning. This is from Quick Sew and it's a bowling shirt. So it's quite a traditional uh, bowling shirt, but there are three different options here. You can see if you want to insert um, a panel here, either in the center section, or if you want to do that on one side or just without the panel at all, which is I think what we're doing with Paul in this first hour. All of these come in this one pattern and also you've got the option to add the pocket. You can just see here, and I know Paul's going to show you how to do that this morning. And this pattern as well is for, oh, let's get it the right way up, is for small um, up to extra, extra large. So you've got all of that, all of those sizes in this pattern. You don't need to worry about, you know, buying a different pattern for different sizes. Everything's covered in this one. Let's have a look at the picture of the shirt. There it is. That's the one, that's an example of one that Paul's made in this bowling shirt pattern. And he's also, he's also modelling one this morning too. So you can see that in just a second. So let's have a look at the fabric options that we've got. Now, for any of the sizes of shirt, um, it's two and a half metres of fabric that you'll need. Obviously, if you're using a smaller size, you might have a little bit left over, um, but up to the XXL is two and a half metres of fabric. And I'll start with this one that's, that you just saw, that the sample that Paul's made for us. So this is a lovely sort of a deep blue here, and then you've got a lighter blue square, but it looks really great in that sort of classic bowling shirt. And it's the ANDS with a Z, ANDS range squares fabric. And this is being sold off the bolt. So it's in half metre increments. So you can buy as much or as little as you want. If you're buying, you know, multiple um, units of this, we do advise you to ring the call centre 0800 112 4433. So that's your first fabric in your blue. Where should we go next? Let's go for CAFE. So, well, this morning I said, we, Paul really liked that. Let's get, get your words out, Amy. Paul loved this fabric from CAFE Facets. So I said, we're gonna call him Paint Pot Paul. This is the Paint Pot fabric, fabric from CAFE Facet. You've got really bright, bold circles here. And actually, if you're going for a bowling shirt, we could say these are like bowling balls, couldn't we? Why not? Lots of different lovely colors coming through in the background there. 
That's one of our cave choices this morning with your splashes of pink and lilac and yellow and blue. And then our next cave facet. Oh, I've never seen this one before. This is lovely. This is a gorgeous print. So you've got really lovely sort of slight curves coming through in the actual um, cornflower blue pattern there on the background of the fabric. But it's, it's a nice twist on a stripe. Almost looks like um, a woven rope, doesn't it there? You can sort of see how that's all weaving together. So that's the blue raked fabric from Kaif. And also, we've never done any dressmaking in Kaif, so we've got two new things this morning. We've got our first men's shirt and we've got our first time we've used Kaif for dressmaking. Then we've got elephants. And I'm, I've, Paul is quite a fan of elephants from what I know. And we'll talk to him about that in just a moment. But we've got our red elephants on a really lovely natural colour background here. So there's sort of little mini elephants you can see there, two different directions. Again, the pattern for the shirt requires two and a half metres of fabric. So this is the red elephant on a crew, and this is a cotton, 100% cotton. 3.55 per half metre. And then we've got two more. Let's just show you these last two. Now, this one here, oh, this is lovely. This is sort of a midnight blue, and this is a floral, almost a ditzy floral. Um, but you've got some darker, darker flowers in this, sort of a, a dark navy edging towards a black. And also some little tiny splashes of almost a silver, if you can see there. Do you know what? I'd, I'd quite like this shirt in this fabric. This is the Meadow Cadet from the Blue Sky range, again, being sold by the half metre. I'd like a, a skirt or a shirt or a dress in that one. Really lovely. I like that fabric, haven't seen it before. And finally, this is the one that we're making with this morning, so you'll be seeing this. Here we go. This one here, you've got lovely little dashes of um, navy and also a lighter blue. Producer Hannah is swooning over this one in my ear. She's a fan of this. This is the Baltic or the Breeze Baltic fabric, again from the Blue Sky range. 5.95 per half metre. Now, all of these fabrics, remember, are being cut off the bolt for you, so you can have as much or as little as you like. If you do want one of these fabrics, you know, perhaps for your stash or for a different project, you can buy it in half metre increments. So if you did want, say, two metres of fabric, that would be four units. If you wanted four metres, that would be eight units and so on and so forth. So I'll take the pattern with me. We're going to head over and meet Paul and get cracking with the bowling shirt. So there's the shirt you can see on your screens there. And Paul is modelling one. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. How are you doing? Very good, You're thank good. you. Yes. Never, never had you on the show before. Well, you've been on once, but I've not had you on the show before. That's right, yes. So, if anyone hasn't seen you, tell us a bit about how, how are you here at Sewing Court and what's oh, your sewing? how am I here? My sewing history, um, <laughs> going back to three years ago, I was on the sew, Great British Sewing Bee. Actually, it was televised two years ago. So, but I've been sewing all my life. So no. it's funny, it almost feels like you've only been, it's only been three years, but actually it's been... It, it's taken off over the last three years, it's just gone, you know, sky high. But, uh, yeah, I started about um, 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah, so, so well, I'll tell you all my life, a large part of my life. Um, my mum sewed a lot, so I learnt a lot from her, picked it up just sitting, watching her. And, just picking uh, up tips yeah. and tricks and... And the Great British Sewing Bee has sort of changed your... Changed your life, really. It, it threw me in at the deep end yeah. and you had to learn to paddle very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Just go, yeah. go, off yeah. you go. Learn techniques that you'd never even heard of before. Um, but, yeah, great fun. And a great experience, I'd imagine. Fantastic and experience, yes. And a career changer, really. Yes, it has been. Yeah, because it's opened up coming here, it's opened up doing workshops, doing some teaching, doing some demonstrations, different stores. Fab. So, yeah, it's really, really been good. And do you make a lot of your own clothes? Paul's got the bowling shirt on this morning. I make a lot of my own shirts, yes. So this is one of them. That one I, I made Come at the, and stand at the here weekend. and give us, you might have to give us a twirl. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see this is the shirt we've also got on our mannequin here yeah. behind us that Paul's made. But you, So you make a lot of your own shirts? You, what, what sort yeah, of other things? Yeah, I make things? classic dress shirts with um, stand-up collars, um, full-length sleeves, so it's got all the techniques you need for shirt making. It's got the, the cuffs, plackets... The whole lot. This is a bit more simple. It's a bit more chilled, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a bit more laid you know, back, quite, a bit more it's casual. It's a nice sort yeah. of summery yeah. holiday shirt. Or you could layer it up, couldn't you, if you wanted to? Yeah. 
Now, we've got a question already from Diana. So, uh, morning, Diana. Um, morning. How much fabric do you need for the shirt? Two and a half metres yes. for the shirt. So, um, the pattern here that we're using this morning, um, you've got all of the different sizes, obviously, on the back. But I'm going up to XXL, and it's two and a half metres of fabric for the, um, for the larger size. And, obviously, you can um, use those for the smaller sizes as well. Lovely as a gift if you're sort of getting organised maybe for Christmas. Yes. Already thinking ahead to that yes, time of yes, year. Yes, buy the whole bundle. <laughs> yeah, surprise somebody. And how did you find this pattern to use? Quite a simple one to do. There's about two, three fiddly bits in it. It's mainly fitting the collar on. So if I can get through that bit today, that is the, the tricky bit that once you've got that, the rest is pretty much straightforward sewing. OK, so should we demystify some of those tricky bits? We'll have a go. Let's have a go. <laughs> so where would you like to start? Where, where's the tricky bit? Um, Pockets? With, with this pattern in particular, um, the one thing to remember is that the seam allowances are so different from a normal pattern. OK. The seam allowance on most dressmaking is one and a half centimetre. In this one, it said seam allowance is six millimetre. So, so it's almost difference. like a quilting seam allowance. It's a quarter yes. of an inch. So if you quilt it out there... But if you want to move into get dressmaking... Get in there, have a go at this, <laughs> yes. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's the one thing to remember all the way through this. Um, Just because your yeah. finished shirt would be a slightly different size if you do go for... You know, it, if you do use the regular one and a half. Yes, because if, if you did the regular one and a half, it'd be a lot smaller. So stick with what they say on the pattern. Important to remember to always read your pattern before you start. Easy so it's a good, good learning up. point. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. But obviously, all of your instructions in here, your pattern pieces, you've got all of the um, the breakdown of the three different options for the shirts. You can just see here, depending, you know, if you want to insert that panel or not, um, you can do that in the central section or to one side. And then everything marked here for all of your different sizes and all of your different instructions. Fairly easy to follow. Did you find? How did you find the instructions? Very easy to follow. So um, it's not a beginner's shirt but uh, probably advanced beginner an advanced so beginner if you're feeling yeah like you want to have a go have a go okay so an adventurous yeah. beginner we like that yeah. we like adventurous beginners yeah if you've made any shirts send us some pictures we'd love to see them this morning exactly so um the pocket is one of the tricky bits that we're going to look at the fiddly section it's not so much tricky it's just it's a nice technique oh okay um, great so we'll start with that one because that's always the starting point on a shirt pattern uh is get all your pieces put onto your main pieces so this is put onto your front panel. Uh, that is the front panel, your left-hand side. Okay. Traditionally, men's pocket go on the left side. It does always, yeah. It always sort of seems to be on that yeah, side, Yeah, I, I don't understand why, but... No, we yeah. were talking this morning... If you know out there why... Yeah, why the pocket's on the we, left, and we were talking... Let, let us know, because... I'm not sure on that. No, and the debate this morning as well about why we always, you know, with buttons on one side and the other and to do yeah. with, you know, um, if you have maybe in Victorian times a lady in waiting that's going to get you, get you yeah. dressed in the morning. But we do traditionally stick to those buttons going yeah. one way for men and the other way for women. Yeah. But if you wanted to make this as a women's shirt, there's nothing to stop you. Exact same pattern. Yes, good thing about this pattern. It's, it's uh, symmetrical, so if you wanted to put the buttons on the... Where well, are we? Buttons on the other side. I'll say the other side. Uh, <laughs> and the buttonholes on the opposite side. Do that, and then it's okay for a lady to wear. And sometimes ladies are wearing these loose fitting shirts. Yeah, absolutely. So, I said yeah. a lot of my friends would it's buy it. these sort of shirts in maybe vintage shops and yeah. lay them up or wear them with leggings or jeans, or they are quite trendy. You can see that one there. You've got the pattern on your screens at the moment. And the um, fabric that's on the bottom of your screen is this light blue one that Paul's about to show you with the pocket. So what's this magic magic? Or nice pocket technique. Okay, the nice pocket technique. Uh, you start off with your pocket shape. I've already stitched one corner, so um, I'll show you on the other piece. That would be your pocket shape. Can we get to see yeah, that? Of course. Yeah. So you double fold it to the inside. Just no a normal pressing. Okay. But then you fold it back out to the outside to stitch it. So I've stitched down one side there. I just stitched down that other side. Now, remembering that quarter of an inch seam allowance. So, luckily, I think this is a quarter inch foot. It's funny because here. I so naturally, we have to do so much quilting that I'm so used to hearing a quarter of an inch, but for yes. dressmaking, it Dr isn't. Dressmaking, it's a strange one. So, you've just got to bear that in mind when you're doing this pattern. And it's just worth looking at each pattern when you first get it. Do that little read through and um, find out what the pattern is actually saying, because it will... The P 
pieces will have been cut in that way. So you've got your pocket, that would normally be the outside of your pocket and you've got like this little flap here. So that would be totally wrong. So if you just turn that inside out the other way. Oh, this okay. Way we need Derek. Derek the Dobber. <laughs> Have we got Derek the Dobber here somewhere. as well? We've got Derek the Dinosaur, Derek, Derek the Dobber, <laughs> Derek the Presenter. Derek's <laughs> appearing everywhere today. Just get into your corners there and then that gives you that same seam allowance running down the edge of the pocket. So you're going to encapsulate that top section all the way down? You're yes. You're just going to sew that into place now? So this we would press into place. So. Do you want to do that? Like so, like so. If I just finger press this for now, okay. we can do most of the ironing later. Um, but that fold in the corner there gives you your natural seam allowance that you've used at the top there. So oh, you just so carry that it, down. You've not had to actually You haven't had to measure it or... as such. So you do those. That gets stitched along that top line there. So you get a row of top stitching across the top. Fold over the two edges and then pin that in place. So this is one I did earlier to <laughs> show the actual pinning in place. So you've got this, I don't know if you can see it on here, this top stitching there, which holds the fold into place. Yep. And then you just pin it in place. You've got your pattern markings on the pattern. Pin it in place and then stitch all around the edge, as close to the edge as you can. So that is called edge stitching. And this section here is Top stitching. Which this is top stitching because yeah. it's away from the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Simple it's difference like between the two. It's plainly obvious. Yeah. <laughs> At the top edges, do this little triangle. And if we can make that oh, out. It's, like, it's, it's hard to, to see, see it's hard it? to see on that. If, can... if you want to use a different a contrast. Oh thread, yes, here. You'll see it. You'll be able to see if you can just see it's a tiny yeah. a sort of triangle there. And that just secures the pocket and stops it pulling. So it just makes it a stronger fix to the main body of the shirt. So that's your pocket. OK. And in okay. terms of the actual um, the panel that that's going on to, does it tell you in the pattern exactly where to place the, for the placement of the pocket? Yes, it will do. You've got pattern markings on. Uh, you can see there, I've done a, a, just a little dot on that corner. So that would be for there. If you're using the elephant fabric, then you might want to match the elephants up. So pattern matching. So just... pattern matching. So you might have to move your put your pocket up or down an inch or two. So we have elephants all in a row. Yeah. <laughs> or if you you put a contrast pocket pocket on. Oh yeah, that would you be could quite put funky, a different wouldn't color, it? Put a contrast pocket on. So your pocket could move around, but with this fabric, you put it anywhere. You're not going to see where the pocket is. You really cannot see it. <laughs> it's hard. To, that. There is a pocket on this one. You can barely <laughs> it's see hard it. It's hard to find. You go like this, trying to find your pocket. To put something in wherever you want to put in. So once you've popped that, um, so once you've done the pocket, yep. so you've obviously you cut out the main your main body uh, pieces. You put yep. the pocket on. What what would be next? What would be next? Right. I'll show you where to go on. That's most of the shirt put together for later on. So this is your next piece. These are this is your facing piece, which becomes the inside of your collar and your main part of the, the body, the yeah. front. This would be where you would sew the pocket on. So that's, if you wanted one on each side, you could put one on each side. Yeah, if you want, Again, yeah, absolutely. unusual. Don't put them upside down, things fall out. That's no good at all. <laughs> no, that's very that's true. pocket for but It's later. one of those obvious things, isn't it? Because, you know, when you see it like that, you think, oh, it could go either way, but actually you do need to remember, obviously, yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. a top and bottom side to a pocket. So, oh, we've had a picture sent in of a shirt that somebody's okay. made. Oh, fabulous. Let's have a look. Oh, this like is from that. Diana. Lovely. Yes, nice one. Oh, so she made this um, for a 26-year-old son who works in a cocktail bar using the Anna Maria Horner fabric. Fabulous. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, so he's, I hope he's making some mojitos and strawberry daiquiris in his, uh, in his homemade shirt. That's great. Thanks, Diana. But that's the beauty of this pattern. It does fit really good fabrics like yeah. that. Really bright. Bold, Bold. Sort of statement yeah. fabrics. Yeah, like this. Absolutely. It's quite a Hawaiian feel, quiet isn't it? Quiet and understated. Yeah, just, yeah, you know, very, very modest. The fabric so, that we're yes. using at the moment is the Baltic Breeze. That's the one on your screens at the yeah. moment. And we will look at some of those other ones in just a second. Right. But let's just crack on with this. So these pieces and the collar piece are the only two pieces that you interface. OK. So that is iron-on interfacing. So you put that on. It, one inside collar and there's one already on the other shirt. 
So you've got yeah. your interface in here if you do need any. And as you say, that's just you just iron that onto your Just iron that those on. Sections. Um, I've actually made that one without interfacing. So if you want to go oh, yeah, for a, a softer color. feel, um, you could just not bother just with depends. the interfacing. Yeah. It, it gives it sort of quite a crisp, a nice sort of crisp finish. It, it, it does, but this is quite lightweight as well, so it doesn't really affect it a great deal. It does help when you put the buttons in; it makes it a little bit stronger. Mm, so when you put durable. the button holes in and sewing the buttons on, but I like the softer feel, so I don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> no. One, less, one less lot Step of Step away from the normal. <laughs> so this piece is literally just a straight sew down. Don't bother about the curvy bit yet. That comes in when you're stitching the collar on. So if we just do this part, again, your quarter of an inch seam allowance. Keep reminding yourself of this when you're making this one because uh, it's different to normal. Now, for anybody that w that's watching that perhaps does dressmaking but have made maybe a lot of... Um, women's clothing or, um, you know, dresses or sort of tunic tops or blouses. Is there much difference in sort of making men's clothing or a men's shirt? Is there, there's nothing drastically... No, it's still putting pieces together. Same. Yeah, it's putting pieces together. The only thing, as we said before, is which side you put the buttons on. Yeah, often. that's literally the only yeah. difference. Yeah. And if anything, it might even be simpler because you've got no... You know, you're less likely to maybe have things like darts or anything or too yes. much curve. Yeah. Um, the most you will get in, a, if you're doing a dress shirt, you'll maybe get some darts down the back of the shirt, mm. centre darts down the back, either side of the centre, and they sort of pinch it in and create it, that tailored fit yeah. in the shirt. But otherwise, no, there's no darting, there's no bust darts or anything. And actually, we've got a question from Rachel. Morning, Rachel. Morning, Rachel. Um, she says, morning, I'm starting dressmaking for the first time in a few weeks. Do you have any tips? Start simple, uh, but something that you know you're going to wear, otherwise you never get around to using it. Absolutely, no, and that's... it's no good making something that's going to fit in a wardrobe. That's so, very true. Yeah. I have to say, I think the whole satisfaction of, if you're going to spend, take the time to do it, and yeah. the patience, and you're going to you know, invest your time and energy, not just into the buying the fabric and all of that, but yeah. you want to wear it, you want to feel proud of yeah, it. Yeah, and... you don't want looking good in a wardrobe, nobody's going to see it there. <laughs> just sort of for a hanger, don't make yeah. anything for a hanger. So I hope that helps, Rachel. Make something that you want yes. to wear. Um, right, so this is where you start pressing. Yes. Each point when you're doing garments, press all the seams. It holds them in place and it's sometimes easier to press when you're first sewing them rather than wait till later and try and get round corners. So manoeuvre them. So if we can get the, Let's the get mat your, out. Uh, mat. Where is it? Okay. So this piece, you're pressing the seams towards the main body. Just to flatten them, that's the, the general idea. If I swap sides with you, Paul. OK. <laughs> You're not safe with here. an iron. <laughs> oh, well, I can iron. I had a lesson from Joy, actually, on ironing um, quilts, uh, like blocks, last week. Okay. She um, did, did me quite a good lesson about knocking it back and doing it to the side. And... Always to the dark side. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, it's got steam with this as well. So we're using the ironing blanket as well. I don't know if you can see that um, Paul's got there. But that's just um, obviously protecting the table. But it's great if you are sewing perhaps in a room where you don't want to get your ironing board out or you want to just pop this next to your sewing machine, then you've got that there to use. Um, you know, you can fold it away and pop it away like we do just underneath our desk. And it is easier than sort of getting the ironing board up and down all the time, which can be a bit of a nuisance. Although when you're doing stuff like this, you've got quite a big run at it. Sometimes you want the whole ironing board, so... Just so you've got it, it It's whatever your, your preference is. Yeah, that's... Let me that there. You've folded this facing over now, and as you're ironing it, just roll it into place with your fingers, so you're rolling to make sure that the seam is actually on the edge. While you just finish ironing that, I'm just going to recap those fabrics, and okay. we'll pop back in a second, so... Right. I'll just, I'll leave you on ironing duty, Paul. Is okay, that okay? Fine. <laughs> so, that fabric that Paul's using at the moment, first of all, is the uh, Baltic Breeze. So, this is a really soft blue fabric. Um, we have, right, it's two and a half metres for the XXL size in the shirt. So, for that pattern, if you do want to make the bowling shirt this morning, then it's two and a half metres of fabric, which would be five units. VEMY42. And obviously, depending on your size, you, you might have some left over too. 
Now, the most popular one is actually the elephant. So let's have a look at that. This is the red elephant on a crew. And now we know Paul likes elephants as well. So you can see here, lovely as well, if you want to, um, you know, perhaps have a little go at pattern matching, you could use the elephants to sort of um, make sure they match up all around the shirt. And as um, Paul said, perhaps if you wanted to use um, a solid fabric or something slightly different for the pocket with the elephants, then you could do that. CEJQ48. Our elephants are very popular this morning, 355 per half metre. Now, the one, I have to say, I think these K fabrics would look absolutely fantastic on a shirt, particularly I really like this one. Gorgeous cornflower blue on a white background. And it's got a lovely sort of weave to it and nice curves as well. This one also really, really popular this morning. This is the blue raked fabric. WDRW58. Really gorgeous. I can just see that as a shirt. Some of them jump out more than others, don't they? This one and actually the... Um, I'll show you the floral in a second, I think it's really beautiful for a shirt. And then we've got Paint Pot, Paint Pot Paul. This is the one that he liked. <laughs> so you've got that deep orange background and then you've got mint colours, you've got yellows, you've got corals, pinks, in all of those splashes of the um, different paint pots there from CAFE. HXRW93. And also, if you are going to make a shirt for someone, perhaps you really do want something bold that's going to stand out and that you, that you don't see in the shops, that you're not going to get everywhere. This is something a bit different and a bit quirky. So that's the yellow paint pots fabric. I have to say, the background of that, it, it, to my eye, is not yellow. That's definitely more of a, a copper or an orange. Um, but obviously, you've got yellow paint pots um, on there, just to clarify. Now, this one, yeah, this one is my favourite. I just had to do a double check of the table, but this one is my favourite. I think this is beautiful. It's got a nice silky feel to it. It feels slightly thicker actually as well. Um, but it's like a ditzy floral with a navy, a navy flower on there as well, but also some silver little dot elements coming through. Slightly more understated if you, you know, from a distance that would look more of a solid colour, but when you look more closely, you can see that pattern there. This is the Meadow Cadet fabric. ZKMY28. 5.95 per half metre. And finally was the one that you can see made up on our mannequin behind us and um, that Paul's already made. So this is our square fabric. This is on a sea blue and you've got a lovely light blue square on this in a couple of different sizes. So you just, it's quite a, quite a classic um, shirt fabric, I would say. And that's the Anne's Range square fabric, PTMY09, 5.95 per half metre. Oh, Sue's just messaged in. I don't know if we can share the secret. Oh, her husband's at work, so I can say. She's going to, she's bought the elephant fabric. She's going to make a shirt for her husband for Christmas. So I'm glad he's not watching. You know, I haven't spoiled the surprise. But send us a picture, Sue, when you've made it. We'd like to see that one. Lovely. People all getting organised for Christmas. Now we're back to school. I, I tell you what I have to say. I think once you're over that summer holidays, back to school section of, of the year, really the countdown to Christmas does begin, doesn't it? Everyone starting to get organised. Now the pattern itself that we're using this morning, as I said, you can use that for small up to XXL, um, two and a half metres of fabric for those shirts. And there are three different options here to um, add different additions if you want to perhaps add the central panel or a side panel on that classic bowling shirt. And as well, the pocket is optional if you want to add that or not. I mean, we're saying that this is a men's shirt, but as I said, if you, is that sort of a vintage feel to it if you wanted for, for women to maybe wear it with jeans or you could, you could have it wear it as a loose fitting shirt, maybe with a top underneath. Um, lots of different options. So let's take this over and head back to Paul. We've just finished your ironing. Oh, we've got a nice message for you, Paul. Let's see. This is from Diane. We've got Diana and Diane. Oh, uh, lots of Diane's this morning. Popular. <laughs> um, so, love the show. Paul is great. And then the end of the message has been cut off. But Paul is oh, great. Thank you. So that's thank you very good. much. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I do agree. So, where do we get up to? We're going on to the collar next. Um, collar. One side interface, the other side not. Right, OK. Now, purely for the reason the outside of the collar is the, will be the stiffer part. The inside will be against your neck, so you want that fairly soft. So you're only going to interface you're one side? You're only interfacing one side. Um, I've done this with a, a thicker interfacing and I really felt like a bit. it was a bit too stiff. So I got to unpick that shirt and then put a different interfacing in, which will be difficult, but I might just unpick it and 
So you want a pull light, out, pull a light out a bit. Weight yeah. Really. So you go from I think this is a medium weight on this. Yeah, medium See? weight on yeah, that. This is medium and weight it's size. fairly it's fairly lightweight really. So right sides together, and again you're sewing all the way around the outside of. Is this an obvious colourfish. question? When you're only interfacing one side, were both of these pattern pieces the same? Does it matter which one you uh, iron the interfacing onto? On this, there is a upper collar and a under collar piece. When you're cutting okay. them out, you cut them both on the fold, so they will both. They look identical, but the under collar piece, the piece that you don't put the interfacing on, is the is slightly narrower. Very slightly. Yeah. Okay. So that when the collar folds back, you've got a little bit more fold that goes over. So it's going to lay flat rather yeah, than being... Yeah, exactly. And that stops collars turning when you've got to the edge of the collar. Same on standard shirts. Uh, you've got an under collar and an over collar piece. So the, itself there. With, the, um, with the interfacing, that's going to be going on the over collar piece. It goes on the over collar. The wider one. Yeah, because that is going to be the, the piece that's on the outside. It's not against your neck. Okay, so as normal, when you're doing a collar, you want to cut the edges because when you turn them inside out, it gets that nice little point. That crisp. That crisp you can point. See here, actually, you get yeah. that nice crisp finish. So I don't tend to cut straight across like that. Okay. I don't know if you see that. It says to just cut straight across on the angle. I'll cut it twice, so I cut up to that angle. Get a good pair of scissors. I think these are getting worn out now. <laughs> and then cut across again. Careful, you don't get in very... Don't get too oh, okay. close to that stitching. So you see on there, cut across. And then across again. So do you find across. this helps to give that professional point to those...? It, it's less fabric going into the point there. You, so you're cutting into it like that instead of just cutting straight across. So then when you turn it... Through. You're sort of encouraging it to go in that way. It is. Aren't you? There's yeah. less bulk actually going into the corner there. So that when you put it through, you're getting a sharper point on the collar there. Lovely. So that, lots that's of messages really... in for you, Paul, this morning. Yeah. We've got another oh, one here this wow. morning from Wendy. Morning, Wendy from Essex. Good morning, Wendy. Um, love Paul's calm approach. Great explanations, too. Thank you. <laughs> we just, it's all very nice and chill this calm, morning. Man. Nice and calm. We don't Glad need to I do any rushing. Being calm. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, and Rachel's going to get the pattern and make one for her son. Fabulous. Thanks, Rachel. Fabulous. Thanks for sending that in. What fabric? What fabric? What Have fabric? to let us know, what Rachel. Fabric, Send Rachel. us another message. Yeah. Uh, okay. So collar turned inside out. Uh, press neatly. Some patterns you could actually top stitch around the edge of that to hold the collar in shape. Right, OK. Yeah. It's your choice. Again, just would that help? To, I imagine that would make it slightly stiffer. It just fixes those points. It fixes the seams. It fixes the points. This pattern doesn't call for it, but it's your choice. So if you want to add that Yeah, in. if you want to add that extra little touch of your own, you can do it that way. That's cool. Yeah. So that's the collar done. Now this is the, to me, the fiddly bit. So I've gone ahead I've and I've pins. already started <laughs> with this one. We've got a few pins yeah. in here. Wait till you see this. So this is the piece I'll, I'll show. The front pieces then get attached to the back piece at the shoulders. So that is the front piece I've just done with the interfacing on. Yeah. Yep. I just attach that to the shoulder. So you attach the two fronts to the back. Sorry if I'm uh, rushing ahead on this, but there's a lot of shirt to get through in a short That's time. That's all right, it's all good. We just want to show those key yeah, points. Yeah, so really. I'll show the key points. But you need these two shoulder seams sewn before you can attach the collar. So you attach both of those. Because some Scissors. people might think that you would put the collar onto the back piece or the front, you know, or the front piece before you, but actually you're attaching the shoulders and then you insert the collar. Yes, yeah, because the collar goes across comes all the way down to about there, so it's coming across the shoulder seams. So it needs to be front so and back. it needs to be front and back. So that's what you have. 
you've got your back piece here. You make that out. You've got one front piece and another front piece there. Your collar has on it, I don't know if I can lock them on here, two notches. There's a notch there and one there. These notches match up with your shoulder seams. Ah, oh, OK. OK. And you've got your centre back of your back piece. So if you fold it in half, like so, crease it, you've got a little crease there for your centre back piece, which will probably match up with centre back piece. The back of one piece of fabric, but, oh, it was cut on a fold. It's cut on a so fold, you so it. you will have that crease in there, so yeah. you're really giving a good eye <laughs> in how to get rid of that later on. So if you match up the centre of your collar, like that, match up your notches with your side seam that you've just sewn. The shoulder seam there. Yeah, match up them. Now you're going to pin all the way along. The tricky thing about this is you've got to include this facing piece into it now. Right. So what I've done, pinned it so far along, and also, remember, you're only pinning the non-interfaced side. The under collar. The under collar, because this, when you're wearing the shirt, that will be the under collar and this will be the bit that you will see, because that's how you will wear it. So it's going to, that's going to be like the bit that, that moves yeah. away from the shirt. Yeah. All the instructions in the pattern there. Sometimes you have to keep going back to it now. Which side did I do <laughs> last time? So the softer side in my mind is the under collar. Okay. Right? And the non-interfaced. On the top. Start at the centre, work out, because you get so far along, then you run out of collar. <laughs> I've then folded the interfacing interface piece back, the facing piece. So that when you turn it back out, that becomes your collar and your point. Now, when you say that interface piece, that was the, the front that was attached to the front panel. That's that, that's strip this that went panel. Around. Yeah. yeah. So that's actually creating this. It's creating the, this the lapel. Part is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get my teeth in. <laughs> um, so that to me is the fiddly bit. So I pinned all the way along to there because you're pinning a piece that curves that way to a piece that curves that way. We're going maths, concave so and convex that's, curves. That's the something one. like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so put this loads fabric, of pins by the way, in. is so popular. Is it's it going flying well? out this morning. If you do like this one, please do check out your baskets. So we've had a message from David, who's going to make himself a shirt in this fabric this morning. So send us a picture, Excellent. David, when you've made it. Oh, it's good to hear some more men sewing. It's great. Yes. It's, it's, do you have to say, do you find it's still very much a very female dominated very. area? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All the workshops I've done so far, I've only had one man on all the workshops. Really? I've done. Yeah. Wow. Maybe it's because I'm making the workshops are for women's clothing. I don't know. But he, well, came, yeah. he came along and made a dress for his friends. So fine. I'll tell you what, my. Um, my granddad sews actually, and yep. he and he makes but he makes a lot of um, curtains. But he, he does, makes things for the boat, so like sailing covers I, and yeah. things like that. Very like big, big bulky items. Actually, yeah. they're quite tricky to do. But he because he was in the army, so he sort of, he'd sewed a lot when he was there. Mm. This is the most popular fabric, by the way, at the moment. The red elephant is way out in the lead. The elephants are storming ahead. C E J Q forty eight. Please do check out your baskets on that. Do you mind? So how do you find the fact that it's still very... Would you like it to go more, become more of an equal? I don't think it needs to be equal. No. I think it's just, it's nice to encourage men that it's sewing can be done by anybody with hands. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't, it's, it's, not, it's not a gender thing. No. So why not? But you almost, almost school is maybe a bit to blame for that because I remember at my school, like, boys did woodwork and the girls did textiles. Yeah. That was just what, what happened. And yeah. It's nice. A programme like the Great British Sewing Bee, actually, is lovely for opening it out. It and really does, because they, I think they try and balance it a bit more. On the year I was on, there were four men, six women, so it's almost 50-50. Yeah. We have 60-40, so uh, it so shows that men can do it. Oh, absolutely. No like you say, anyone um, that's got hands. I saw a lovely message on social media the other day of a, a young lad in Africa who was so proud about the fact he'd made something himself on a sewing machine. And, 
that's, so it's that's what it's encourage all about. these people get them get them going out there they could be the designers of the future well and actually a lot of designers are you a lot know of are, are are male. as well so it's yeah. you know but yeah it's just encouraging people to get started and to give it a go and not to be yes. afraid to because the sense of satisfaction or a sense of achievement is universal you know very whether much. you're male female or making for yourself or as a gift very much um, right, where are we up to on this? Uh, <laughs> we're, <pinning the laughs> we're just chatting. We did, yeah, we're just we chatting did notice to the shoulders and we, we pinned from the centre out. Yeah. If I just sew into the centre from there, um, and then I can show you how it all turns out. Okay. Uh, rather than just you sit around for five minutes watching me pinning pin? in. Uh, it's a lot of curving, so I put a lot of pins in there. Be very careful when you're sewing. And on a curve, you go for a vertical pin as opposed to pinning horizontally. I've gone more for that, yes. But really be careful of all those gathers underneath when you're sewing. So, Just let's see if I can get so that. Can Just so you can see Put those pins in there. Lovely. Yep. And would you sew from the centre out or from the edge of the collar? It doesn't really matter. I'm sewing right from one edge, right across and cross to the other edge, okay. so it's all in one seam. I'll just sew to the centre on this one because this is all I've pinned so far. Just so that when I turn it out, you can see how it all works. Again, a very small seam allowance. Take your time over this. Let's do half a centimetre or so, make sure everything's lying flat underneath. My machine doesn't like going over pins, so <laughs> I don't like pinning this way generally. Lots of, it's, there's a couple of different schools of thought, aren't yeah, there, on sewing yeah. over pins? And I like pinning along the seam that I'm going to sew because it gives me a visual line which to sew along, but you've got to remember to pull your pins out when your go. machine gets to <laughs> them. <laughs> so, again, one other bit to watch out for on this one. The... Can we see into this bit? Yes, there yeah? should be Let's in there. see what's yeah. going on. The facing part, I've folded back that same seam allowance. Uh, so a quarter of an inch. Okay, a quarter there, of an yeah. inch. Because when it gets folded inside, you'll probably be able to see on this, it gets stitched to that shoulder collar, shoulder oh, seam. Oh, so you're going to pull that, take That's, that down. That is hand stitched. So it's easier if it's sewn into place as you go along. So you get to that fold. Now you want to fold that inside collar back a little bit. Because you only want to attach the single part of the collar. Yes, so every time back. reminding yourself that yeah. the over collar with the interfacing, yeah. you're not attaching. You're not you attaching want that to be able both. to. You want to do a grease lightning moment, hold your collar up. Yes. Do, you know what, you want to yeah. honest, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but also the way it's then hand stitched, you stitch all these raw edges inside each other. So they'll become hidden. Anyway. Yeah, they become hidden. So fold that one back. So normally when I'm pinning, when I'm pinning one on, I will pin that back as well, so it's out the way. Okay. Okay. So stitching across there and then you're just stitching across one thickness well two thicknesses the collar and the back piece so if I go to the centre there they inspect all the inside of everything don't they on the sewing bee sometimes they do it depends whether that has been part of the challenge so were you really aware of what was be you know the inside sometimes needs to look as so yes, as yes. The, as the outside. Yeah. So one school of thought is that when you're making a garment, it should look as good on the inside as it does on the outside. So someone, if someone wants to yeah. check yeah. it. Yeah, so it's... all your seams should be nicely, nicely done, turned, French seams, whatever. So um, it always looks good from both sides, but that's sort of a lot of pressure on. And it depends uh, on time as well, It depends it? on time, but if you're doing, doing it for yourself, you will probably do that. I'm more inclined to do it neater for other people than I am for yourself. myself. <laughs> if you're the only one seeing it. Yeah. So we've had a couple of messages in about how much fabric you need. It's two and a half metres of fabric for the shirt. Um, and it goes up to XXL using this pattern. So small to XXL. And two and a half metres of fabric is enough for the uh, for the larger size. So Paul's using the uh, Baltic Breeze fabric at the moment. And then the one you can see behind us is our Anne's range. This is the, um, the squares. You can see that one there on the bottom of your screen. And range squares fabric in blue, PTMY09. 
And I will just encourage you once more, please do check out your baskets on our elephants this morning. These are flying out. I'll just show you. It's on an accru background, so a lovely natural colour background with that red there. Over half the stock of that's gone. And actually, maybe Christmas, because it's red as it's well. Red. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's why Always it's good. popular this morning. <laughs> And the pattern as well has been incredibly popular, so you do need to, lots of you have got that in your basket, but you do need to check it out or give the call centre a ring, 0800 112 4433. You like elephants, don't I you? I love elephants, yes. <laughs> I've, somebody bought me one for a Christmas. An elephant? Uh, not a real one. <laughs> well, actually, somebody sponsored one in Africa for me. Oh, that's a lovely Yeah, present. so I've sort of seen her grow up over the years. Um, they get regular updates on her. Yeah, and what she's so, up to. That's lovely. Yeah, that is a really yeah. lovely present. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, somebody bought me one as a little gift back many, many years ago, and since then I've been collecting them. Little miniature uh, sort of ornaments. It was a jade one about so big, and I was so loved it that I thought, I'll get a few more of these. Now I've got about 200 of them all around really? the house. I just um, dotted around? Yeah, yeah. Loads of shirts with the fabric. And so this would be one for you? Yeah, perfect for me. <laughs> yeah, I think on my first show I wore one similar to that. Oh, did you? It's a, a, a white background with um, this colour red elephant on. Go for the elephant. Yes, yes. What's your elephant called in Africa? Uh, Kaya. Kaya? Mm-hmm. That's pretty. Um... No, back to the trip. <laughs> what, what we were just having a chat about serving and then... <laughs> I'm thinking elephants in Africa and all sorts of stuff. Then. <laughs> the... This is to create the lapel now, that point on the lapel. Cut across the corners again. I've cut twice. And clipping into the curve because this, when you turn round a curve, yeah. you don't want it sort of ruching and gathering. So it stops the bulk, yeah. it's just going to help us turn so it through. So turn that inside out, it's a doubt to somewhere. Point out the lapels, and then that is how you create that lapel on the shirt. Over a third of the patterns have just been checked out just since we've just referenced that then, so please do check out your baskets. EFBR12 is for the uh, quick sew pattern, and that's for small to XXL. So that is what you've, you've got on, on the model there, and Done it. similar here. So that was so. what you did there was you, you went from all across from one side, didn't you? Right to the centre section, but you would have yeah. run that all the way around. Normally, if you'd pinned. pinned it all in place, yeah, go right across, so you'd be turning the two out at the same time. And then it's just attaching those together to turn, yep. to turn that through. Yeah. And then what you've got, this folds over and gets sewn down to that shoulder seam. OK. By hand. And the rest of the inside of the collar gets turned inside. Turn that over and hand sew. So your hand sewing... Is there any reason Long it's there. hand sewn? And across, pardon? Is there any reason that it would be hand sewn? Just as a, difficult to get in there? With you, the... could, you could machine stitch across there, across that bit, but I think hand sewing that would be just a little bit neater. OK. I'm just going to quickly recap these fabrics and then okay. we'll have a look at... Did you want to look at the buttons or the sleeve? What was... Um, I was going to do the sleeves, yeah, the we'll, sleeve. we'll do about okay. setting the sleeve. a little bit of in. time, so we'll try and get to the okay. sleeve. I'll yeah. just, we'll whiz through these, <laughs> right. just because we've got some people asking what fabrics we've got. So, and that elephant one that I've been referencing, this was our elephants on a crew, and that deep red, obviously lots of people, over half of the stock of this one's gone. Um, as we said, maybe it has got a bit of a Christmassy feel with that festive red. So two and a half metres for the shirt, if you do want to make the bowling shirt this morning. But for by, being sold by the half metre... Sort of a sandy colour background there. Really, really popular. CEJQ48. 355 per half metre, so fantastic value. A lot of people have got that in their baskets. Please do check it out. It's not a guaranteed order until that's gone all the way through. So, over half the stock of our elephants have gone. What's the next most popular fabric? Is our paint pots. Paul's made a good call this morning on elephants and paint pots. So, let's have a look at this one. <laughs> you can see this one is, so you've got lots of different bright circles here like bowling balls for our bowling shirt and um, you've got yellows and pinks and it's quite it's a really playful print actually from k facets so obviously a really lovely quality fabric 100 percent cotton hxrw93 and that one's 6.95 per half meter lovely then we've got another k facet fabric which is a cornflower blue mixed with a white. 
Let me just open this one a little bit wider so you can see. Oh, here we go. I really, really like this one. The lovely sort of curves to it you can just see there. Again, this is um, an artisan fabric from K Facet. And that's the blue raked WDRW58. It's almost like lovely intertwined rope on there. Then next up, we have got my favourite one, which is a ditzy floral on a really lovely deep navy background. I think thinking more for winter as well, perhaps if you, you know, if you want to make something a little bit, I think sort of, the, you know, that darker colour palette there. ZKMY28. And this one's called Meadow Cadet. It's from the Blue Sky range. Again, being cut off the bolt, so 5.95 per half metre, two and a half metres of fabric for this shirt. Then we've got, this is the one that Paul's been working with this morning. We've got loads of love for Paul this morning. We've had so many messages being sent in. It's lovely. So this one here, you can just see on a really lovely soft powder blue background. This is the one we've been working with. It's the Baltic Breeze. V-E-M-Y 42. And finally, we've got our squares, which is the one that you might have spotted on the mannequin behind us today. So this is on a slightly darker blue background with a lighter blue square. Let's open that one up a bit for you. So again, being sold by the half metre. 100% cotton, really lovely and soft. Nice and breathable. PTMY09 is your item number for this. The Anne's Range Squares fabric. So if you are buying two and a half metres, if you're planning to use these fabrics for a shirt, we do recommend giving the call centre a ring. So the number's on your screen. Um, sometimes people have um, trouble adding more units on the website. So if, you are, if that is happening, just do it um, on the phone. And the elephant, you really need to check out your baskets on that one. It's really limited on stock there now, flying out this morning. So let's take our pattern. The pattern you've got just coming up on your screens there, EFBR12. Three variations within the pattern. If you want to add a different panel, then you can do. Over half the stock of that pattern's now been checked out, so 8 95 for those three different male shirts. But as we said, if you wanted to perhaps use them for a women's shirt, there's nothing stopping you doing that. So we were going to look at the sleeve, weren't we, Paul? Quick go at the sleeves. We've got five minutes. Right, five minutes. I'll run through a quick finish then. Sleeves are great because I like setting in sleeves open like this. I hate setting in sleeves where you've made the sleeve and you've got to set it into... Because it's a full hole. circle then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I hate doing that. So I'm ha much happier doing this sort of setting. You've got three marking points on your sleeve. You've got a centre notch, which is on your pattern. You've got a single notch on one and a double notch on another. One reason, that sets the right sleeve in the right place because the double notch is for the back. OK. Single notch for the front, centre notch. Self-explanatory, <laughs> and that matches up with your centre seam. OK. So, match all those up. Did you pin up. that from the centre out? Yes. Did you match the centre seam I've to that? match the centre, match your notches, and then magically... It fits to the it edge. It meets at the edge as well. So, that's the pinning in. Right. Right. Here's one I prepared earlier. Is that stitch round, stitch curve. Yeah. So, okay, very careful when you're going through the machine. Make sure that underneath fabric is not getting caught up. So just double checking as you go. Yeah, double check that one. Then you press towards the body of the shirt. Oh, okay. okay that's why I already did this one. This is where the tailor's ham. Yes. So we're going for anything with a bit of a curve. Yeah, because use. it's ideal for getting in there, straightening all the fabric out, and then pressing it over. So you're pressing in Brilliant towards that. In towards that sleeve. Towards the body. In towards the this, body. This is your sleeve, sleeve is there bit. and then you're pushing it yeah. in towards the body. So you're ironing over that way. Then the reason I pin this again, because you then stitch this close to the edge there. Yep. To give that double stitching effect, which you can see you here. Can see I don't know if you on can that see. Shirt. We're just here. The tailor's hands on your screen at the moment. We've got very limited stock on that, um, but you, it's used oh, well, lots of the dressmaking shows we use. A lot, them, yes. So. It's great for bus starts. Yeah. Uh, and you can get a longer, narrow one, which is brilliant for putting the inside sleeves and 
getting that inside. I like it well when they use seam. it to bash, to it, bash it, things brilliant. into place. Yes, yeah. Taylor's ham or a Taylor's gammon, ham. whatever you want to call it. Yes. We've got one here this morning, but just using that for attaching the sleeve into the body yeah, of the shirt. Yeah, and, and pressing, you use them for pressing over, they're brilliant for that. So that is your sleeves attached. You've stitched once, top stitch again, for more for a design. Now, the last bit I wanted to show you... Yes, we've got two minutes. Is so two minutes, good. two minutes, right. Don't rush, it's OK. No. <laughs> it's <laughs> We're loving the calm, get, I'm loving the calm demeanour this, this morning. We're just going to keep it calm. Uh, your interfacing on down the front. Your interface facing down yep. the front. Fold it back the other way again, a bit like we did with the pocket. Oh, yeah, the double fold. Fold it the opposite way. Stitch along an inch from the bottom and then cut... Cut that bit out because then you're going to turn that the right way round, which gives you the edge of your front piece. Oh, so when I that's see. all turned round like that, gives you a nice neat edge there, and it also it gives you that. It does it again. Your seam it shows you exactly what that seam allows. It, it's, yeah. you know, it stops you having to measure. It just. Yeah. So once you press that, fold it under again. And that's your double hem. OK. And then that, there you've got that nice, neat finish as yep. well. Just yep. folding that back. Yep. Your buttonholes down the front. Yep. On left side. Yes. <laughs> left side yeah, we figure out if we've been going for male or female buttons. It, yeah, if you want to swap it round, put them on the other side and you've got a ladies' shirt. The reason that has been left is for these little edges that open vent... Oh, yeah, at the side. ..at the bottom of the shirt. So then it's just side seams, hem sleeves. all together. Done. Happy days. Done. And this is the Elephant fabric that's been so, so popular. Please check out your baskets on this one this morning. Um, and also the pattern is on your screens as well. And Paul, you're back in an hour. I am. We're doing... A dinosaur. dinosaur. We're totally doing a dinosaur. Different. Another Derek, not Derek the Dobber, Derek the Dinosaur. Derek the Dinosaur. So um, <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. We've been great doing a nice men's shirt this morning. So, so popular. So grateful to have you here as well, doing... Thank you. You know, showing us that it is for men and women. There's nothing stopping yes. anybody having a go. Yes. So... Well, we'll crack on with our dinosaur in a couple of minutes. We'll see you in three. <laughs> follow us on Pinterest. Search for our sewing quarter page and follow us to discover sewing work we create and love. Today I'm going to be showing you how to do diagonal tacking, which is also uh, known as pad stitching, but depending on what you're using it for. Diagonal tacking would be a temporary stitch just to attach layers of fabric together, like interlinings or interfacings, and you'll be doing that to the wrong side of the fabric. So normally you would use two layers of fabric, but I'm going to be just using this fabric here on a hoop, just so I can show you, show you the stitches. So I'm going to be taking my needle through my fabric, and then I'm going to be doing in and out to create a diagonal shape. And then I'm going to go further down and again coming in and out. So you can see that I'm moving from the right to left, but if you're right or left handed, then this can change either way, whatever is more comfortable for you. So it's this small stitch here that gives you the diagonal shapes and you just keep going down your fabric. So once you've done these stitches down here, you then need to go back up to create a second row of stitches. But this time you need to come in and out the other way. So this time I'm going from right to left, so I'm mirroring that stitch. Like so. Join us on Wednesday the 6th of September for a day of stylish bag making with our experts. We're joined by the Girl with a Sewing Machine author Jennifer Taylor, who will be turning her talents to a useful cutting mat carrier to help you sew on the go. She'll then fashion a chic patchwork city shopper using some gorgeous linen look fabrics. 
We're also joined by Joe Carter, who will demonstrate how to make a variety of bags and purses suitable for almost any occasion. Amongst her creations will be these stunning frame purses, which come as a handy kit with full instructions so you can make your own at home. So don't miss this bumper bag making special from 8am to 12 noon on Wednesday the 6th of September. Only on Sewing Quarter, Freeview Channel 78. Good morning, welcome back. How lovely was that? Paul's just got a lovely, calm energy here this morning, feeling very zen. And in this hour, I'm joined by Susan Briscoe. So we're so lucky to have Susan here this morning. She's the author of The Ultimate Sashko Source Book. And also we've got, well, we've got the Simple Sashko book as well this morning. So the, when we've looked at this um, sort of subject or topic before, um, and we've had other designers looking at it, today we've got the actual author. We've got Susan here with us who's going to talk us through the basics for Sashko. So if you've never heard of it before, perhaps you want to give it a try, then this is the person to get your questions in for this morning. So if you want to get in touch, please do send, send your questions to the studio, studio at sewingquarter.com. And Susan's very happy to answer anything you might want to know this morning. So get those in for us and make the most of her, make the most of her being here today. So Sashko, we're going to be looking at this technique this morning. It's a Japanese technique, a stitching technique. And we're going to look through all of the basics for that, how to mark up, um, mark up your patterns. And also later on, we're going to look at a wall hanging. Now, this is Susan's book and this is the ultimate book. So in here, we're looking at the whole journey um, of, you know, the origins of Sashko, where it came from in Japan, looking at some of the historical sort of influences on the technique. And then it also goes through and looks at, you know, all of the different basic techniques. So the different stitches, um, some different lots of different you can see in here this is an idea of what the actual technique is but it gives you lots of ideas how to create different decorative patterns and simple techniques this is just some examples of the sort of projects in here we've actually got a um we've got a little video of the book should we have a look at that so you can see there that technique Lots of beautiful different inspirations there and ideas. You've got different projects, so you've got your cushions and placemats and different techniques that you can incorporate into quilting, perhaps if you wanted to. Look at this beautiful example of something. This is something that um, Susan's made, absolutely beautiful. Oh, this wasn't made by Susan. This is an antique one. I've just been past this and no, this isn't true. This is an antique Sashko piece. So let's have a look at that. Lots of, look at those beautiful stitches there. A really traditional um, piece. Now, obviously, the uh, blue background is the really traditional colour that's used for Sashko. So we've got you lots of different blue solids this morning um, to give you different, you know, different ideas if perhaps you wanted to use darker colours or lighter blues. So we've got a whole spectrum from our range um, of different blues. We'll start at the dark end and we'll work all the way through. So first of all, we've got a spectrum solid black. So this is obviously just your rich uniform black colour um, that you can use for those traditional, that traditional technique from Makawa. Then you've got a navy, so a nice dark navy there. Moving along, you've got a slightly, um, a slightly softer navy as well. All of these are 100% cotton. This one here is your navy. All of these are 325 as well per half metre, so it just depends which colour you like. This is a still, I would still call this a navy, but it's a slightly lighter one. If I just hold those up side by side, you can see the difference. But this one here is called dark blue. This is like a blue test this morning. A test of how many blues can we possibly fit on the show? I think we've got eight. So this is a, a slightly lighter blue again. Um, more of a steely blue, actually, I would describe this. This one's called ocean blue or ocean. They all look very similar on the web. So if you do have any questions or you want to see those clarified, I can just show you those again later. Then we've got a brighter blue. So this one here is a, is a more bold, uh, sort of vivid blue, really. This is nautical blue. 
Then we go to a softer um, sort of cornflower blue, I would call this, um, or a powder blue. Again, 100% cotton from Makawa. Oh, and it's called cornflower blue, as if by magic. <laughs> Then a slightly lighter blue again, running out of blue. What other blues do we have? I'm trying to think of other, of other blue references, but this one here is a softer blue compared to that. This one is slightly warmer. This one's, sli I'd say, a slightly sort of colder blue or a more icy blue. This one is called Blue Sea. And finally, on the end here, you can see our softest blue this morning. And this one again, 325 per half metre from Makawa. Baby Blue, KZMY69. So as I said, we're joined by Susan this morning. I'm going to take the books over with me, author of the books we've got here today. So let's go and meet her and get cracking with our Sashko. So good morning, Susan. How are Hello, you? I'm fine. It's nice a pleasure to, be... to have you here. It's great to be here. We're so, honestly, we're so privileged to have you here in the studio this morning. And also, just to clarify, because I know lots of there's a debate, isn't there? People think Sashiko but it is pronounced Sashko. It's pronounced Sashko. It means little stab or little pierce, and it's a Japanese dialect word. I know when we read it, because we read it like an English word, so we think, you know, Sashiko. No, it's Sashko. Sashko. It's Sashko, yes. And the way that some people say to remember it is like a window company, Sash yes. company. Yes, Sash Sashko. <laughs> Sashko. If you need a simple way, producer Hannah was struggling to say it this morning. She was like, it's Sashiko, but it's Sashko. We're going, yes. that's, that's the text. Sometimes it is difficult to get your tongue around some of the Japanese words. <laughs> <laughs> and this beautiful quilt behind us, this is one, that, the antique one yes. I just showed before, but this is one that you made. Well, this was made with lots of samples that appeared in the Sashko book. Can I, can I just ask the book can. for a yeah, moment? Absolutely. Um, because, of course, in, in the book, we have a very big section with lots and lots of different stitch samples in yes. it. And when I'd finished making all of those, I thought, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> so the obvious thing was to make a sampler quilt. Absolutely. And there's actually 60 different designs in that. Wow. Yeah. But also, it does prove that this is a technique that you can incorporate into, oh, yes. into quilting. Yes, you know, absolutely. it's not just for small projects. Or absolutely. For for yeah. dressmaking yeah. or for, for cushions, you, as a whole big quilt. How did, you get, how did you get into this technique? How did you discover it? How did I discover it? Well, it goes back quite a long time, actually. I have to confess, it's now 25 years ago. I went to Japan as an English teacher. Oh, and okay. I, I was on the JET programme, which is for teaching um, spoken English, really, in Japanese classrooms. So I ended up in a very lovely small town, a very picturesque part of the country, a little place called Yuzamachi. And I had never heard of Sashka before I went there, but it turned out that it's one of the local stitching traditions and they used it, um, particularly the very, very small stitch patterns, different ones to what we have on here. But I brought a little piece to show you. Um, <laughs> if I can just grab it. Of course you can. Um, Yes, their, their stitch patterns, the very, very small ones. So I did introduce them in this book because the, the pattern directory in the book has two different sections. One of them deals with the very big patterns, the moyuzashi type, it just means pattern sashiko. And the other section deals with the hitomizashi. Hitomizashi. And hitomizashi. I'll just hold this up a little bit. You can probably see. see. So this is smaller, more it's intricate. very dense, yes. And this is the type of sashiko that was really done mostly in the town where I lived, in that region. Um, in fact, now they've set up a sashiko guild in the town and they're passing on all the traditional patterns. Um, yeah. Wow. So trying to keep it alive, Absolutely, you know? Absolutely, because amazing. It is a, it's a historical technique, isn't it? It it's... is a historical technique. It was used on farmers' clothes, fishermen's clothes, particularly this type was used very much... Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> this, was, this was used very much on, um, on farming clothes. It's, it's very tough. Feel how thick it is. It's incredible. But it makes the fabric more sort of durable, doesn't of course it? it, if does. you want yeah. it to, it's, it's making yeah. it and warmer, it's, I imagine, as well. It makes it a lot warmer. It makes it about three times as thick by the time you've done a lot of sashiko work it is on your fabric. It's so beautiful. It's really sort of a detailed technique. Yes, can, it and is. And there are so many different, different things you can do. Exactly. There's so many different patterns. It is highly addictive. Once you get into it, you just <laughs> want to keep stitching it and you want to keep exploring new patterns. So, you know, you have this style of sashiko and then you have the type that we've got as I said before, on the sampler, which is more like the style on the old Faroshki wrapping cloth that you held up at the beginning. Um, and, of course, that's not quite as densely stitched. But there's, there's just so many different it. kinds. Yeah, it's wonderful. This one. Actually, there's a pattern on here which is on the sampler. Beautiful. If I can find it, um, I'll hold it up. I'm, actually, I'm showing you the back. There we go. 
There you we're go. We're so lucky to have it here. I feel like we're, this should be in a museum or something. It's, you know... It's probably over 100 years old, this one. You see wow. the pattern on there? Yes, there is a mouse hole. I, I, think, I think it's been chewed by mice once when this is in an old storage unit before I got <laughs> it. Um, you have that, and I'm just trying to find it. Um, can I hold this up a yeah, little bit? Yeah, of course. The same pattern. It's oh, this one got... here. Yeah, that one's called Sayagata. And, of course, that's in the book. So it's in, an absolute treasure trove. Let's have a look at the book then. So yeah. um, the beginning of this mm. book talks a lot about, as you've just explained, the history of, of Sashko, does, yeah. um, sort of the origins of it. You can just see yeah. here, actually. Yeah. A Sashko history. And how, so did you say before you went to Japan and then you decided to venture into Sashko or what? How, I'm intrigued well. how that goes from <laughs> teaching English to, to this. I did. Um, I, I, I actually did visual art and drama when I was at university and part of that was theatre costume design. Oh, so, of course, okay. when, when I had the chance, I really wanted to go to Japan for a long time so I could find out a lot about Japanese culture. I mean, you, you go with a lot of ideas. I'm going to find out about this. I'm going to find out about that. Then you get sidetracked. Um, so I arrived in Yuzumachi. I discovered that the shop opposite my house was actually the town kimono shop. So I was interested in that. <laughs> and I joined a tea ceremony club. Then I needed kimono. So I went to my neighbours and said, will you teach me how to sew kimono? So it all went from there. But until I went to Japan, I was very much a machine stitcher, you know, overlockers, industrial machines, stuff like that, because of the, the theatre costume I was doing at uni. Um, but I went there. And I persuaded them to teach me how to sew kimono, thinking that we would be using an industrial sewing machine because there was one at the back of the shop. So you just assumed? As I you kind might. of assumed, yes, that it would be machine sewn. I thought, this is no problem. Turned up for my first lesson, discovered it was all hand sewing, and I wanted to run out of the door. <laughs> It was, it was really funny, but I couldn't back out by then. So I not after you'd convinced them. Not after I convinced them. No. Arms. So I, I, I ended up learning how to tailor kimono in my part time, you know, my sort of leisure time there, nipping over to see my neighbours every evening. Um, and it, it really wasn't until I went back for the Millennium New Year that I really got seriously bitten by the Sashko book. I was kind of interested in it a little bit, but I was doing so much kimono sewing, there was no time to learn. And I went back for Millennium New Year, discovered my ex-next-door neighbour was now running a patchwork group. In fact, I don't know which image we've got on the screen at the moment. Oh, the one that's on the that's <laughs> behind us. It's just flashed off. That was one of her quilts. And she was using patchwork and Sashko together. Well, I'd started doing patchwork since I came back, and I thought, oh, I can use this. So you can incorporate yes, those. So in terms yes. of Sashko, how, if someone was, was maybe looking at this book and the different, mm. seeing these different stitches and thinking, oh, it's beautiful, it looks lovely, what, what, where can you actually use this? And just about anything. Anything. <laughs> it's, it's as tough as old boots. Um, my, my <laughs> There's friend, loads of projects in well, here. My, my friend and next neighbour, Reiko, she's got a pair of jeans that she's completely covered in sashko. Oh, really? You can do all sorts with it. It really, it really is tough. You know, when, when you've made something like a cushion in sashko, I would have to say you don't have to worry too much about pop it in the washing machine. It's not like when you're doing something like cross stitch, where it's quite delicate and you've got to keep it nice. Um, it is, it's hard wearing. It was supposed to be hard wearing. It's still hard wearing today. So the whole so point is to almost, is to upcycle or to toughen up the material or if you wanted to. That was the original idea. And Sashiko in some parts of Japan is done on old fabric. Um, the area that I lived in, they tended to use fabric that wasn't too worn out. And in fact, this sampler that I just laid out on the table is very, very, very dark blue, almost black. In fact, not dissimilar to the darkest blue that you were showing earlier on. Yes. Um, this is the colour that they used traditionally because the farmers in that area were not allowed, if you go back to pre-modern Japan, um, when Japan was closed off to the west, the farmers in those days were not allowed by law to use colours other than indigo. They were only asked to use indigo is dye. That true? Yeah, it's true. Wow. They, they were what they call sumptuary laws. They could, they could only wear certain fabrics, they could only have certain patterns. In that region, Gosh. the patterns couldn't be bigger than a grain of rice and the stripes couldn't be wider than the width of a straw. I think it's all mentioned in, in the book, actually, at the beginning. But they, the way the farmers kind of got around it, because it was a prosperous area, it's a big rice-growing area, still is, and some of the best rice in Japan comes from there, was they bought the most expensive indigo they could get, and that was the darkest one. And although this is very, very dark blue, when a lot of people see it, they think it's black. Yes. Yeah. But then they, and actually the stitches, I love that, that about the grain of rice, you can see that actually. Mm -hmm. Can't you? Yeah. They, they almost look like yeah. you, you've, you could have they, they almost very do, neatly arranged rice onto they the fabric. They almost do look like it. But, and yet, the, the, another funny thing is, of course, um, in the West, a lot of people say, oh, you know, Sashiko is supposed to look like a grain of rice. Well, if you've seen a Japanese rice grain, this doesn't look like a Japanese rice grain. Japanese rice grain looks like pudding rice. It's oh, a little round so it's, thing. It's like a this, fat yeah. one. Yeah. And I, I think it's. 
um, it's just something that probably that, that Sashiko teachers outside of Japan have used to sort of explain how it should look. To the Western world. Yeah, yeah, because when I've said to my friends in, in Yuzumachi, you know, is it supposed to look like a grain of rice? They go, oh, no, no, it's supposed to look like snow on the ground. Or else they say, uh. oh, you mean rice stitch? And we've actually got a sample of that on here somewhere. That's rice stitch, the one here. And they... And, Oh, it's, like called, it's called rice stitch because it looks like the kanji character for the word for rice, which is a cross with little diagonal legs sticking out. Oh, that's yeah, cute. Yeah, it is really cute. So, yeah. So in terms of the book itself, um, the Ultimate Sashko book, we've got mm. loads of different projects in here. So if you wanted to do, and there are greetings cards, I was just showing there, but um, cushions, you could, obviously you can incorporate these techniques into curtains, into quilts, into dressmaking. Um, what, what's, what do you find is really popular? What do people tend to incorporate? Lovely little, little drawstring bags and... It is very popular for making bags because it is, as I said, it's very, very tough. My friends in Japan actually use it with, um, with patchwork in bags and um, they, they're, very, they're, they're just bag mad, totally bag mad. <laughs> so am they, I. They I'm a bit of a bag fanatic, Susan, so we're in the same... So, yeah, you can make all kinds of things with it. I've made a lot of cushions. Um, I make a lot of things, obviously, that I use in class, that I teach people with, and projects that I've made for books and things like that. And I, I know if I use it for something like a cushion, I don't really have to worry about treating it too badly, and I can pop it in the machine and wash it if I want to, too. And it'll there be, it is. It'll be just fine. So this one this morning is the Ultimate Sashko book by Susan, and VKMZ09. Loads of different projects and patterns, and, and as we said, there's the, the history in there as well, um, sort of discovering that traditional craft and actually we're really lucky here today we've got the um <laughs> <You are. laughs> with the book definitely no, we, well, as you said you've got very limited stock on the well, um, I book only, elsewhere i only found out at the weekend because I've, I've just been at the great northern quilt show at harrogate and uh, the bookshop that was there uh, kaleidoscope they couldn't get hold of any copies and i haven't been able to get hold of any copies to sell for myself um because at the moment it's reprinting it reprints nearly every year yeah very popular and book. so what, what i've been saying to the people I've, I've seen over the weekend is if you need a copy get it off the show today because <laughs> it might be a few weeks before it comes back into the shop so you heard it here first mm, great opportunity yeah. to get the book today <laughs> if you can't get hold of it we're very lucky we've got some stock of this here at sewing quarter vkmz09 and also very lucky to have Susan here with us. But in terms of the actual, let's look at the technique then and mm -hmm. how we get started. I know specifically one thing that people um, ask about is it's a specific needle that we have to use for oh. this technique. Yes, I've got a few parked in here actually. Um, I think these are the same ones you'll, you let's have for find sale. The here. Thank you. So I've, these I've, two. They are Do you want you holding a needle? <laughs> well, I'm so they're right, short and long ones. They are short and long ones. These are out of the of this pack here, where you get the eight different ones. The these are made by Clover, there. so you get a really nice variety. I think these are actually the medium ones. I'm just thinking my my image of that is not well. I'll hold it in front of there. It's one of those. Oh, never mind. And <laughs> I, why do we I need a special pack. needle? Well, the thing is, these needles they're very sharp, and they they're very rigid. They don't bend. And when we stitch, we're going to pleat the fabric onto the tip of the needle. If you try and do that with an ordinary embroidery needle you'll find very quickly you can get a bend on the needle. Oh, OK. You see, you're, you're sort of holding it, you're holding it quite, quite firmly, really. Mm. Um, so that's why. And they're great. They, they just go through really nicely. Really so it's a little sharp. bit more durable and a bit, more, a bit stronger than yeah, a, a, lot, normal, a lot yes, stronger than a normal needle. a lot needle stronger than a normal needle. And I also find they seem, they seem to last really well um, because obviously I use my needles an awful lot. But you know how with a, a normal sewing needle, after a while, it starts to kind of lose its shine. And these don't. These just seem to go on forever. I'm sure I've got some in my needle, um, my needle case that I've had there for years and years and years. And I just love them. And the other, the other pack that you've got, the really long ones. Really long ones. Yeah, those are great if you're doing lots and lots of straight lines. Obviously, these are a little, uh, they're a little sort of more heavy duty yeah. than the ones we just looked at. So you'd want to use maybe a slightly more loosely woven fabric because a lot of pieces of sash go on a fabric which is a little bit more loosely woven. If you're wanting to work on like your normal patchwork fabrics, I would use the ones from oh, the other So pack. for more for curves and maybe things like this, you would use yes. this, if you're if just you're, starting, yeah. you would perhaps start with the, the pack of eight, the smaller that is a, ones. That is a really, really useful one. But if you think you're going to do a lot of straight line work, such as, Such let's just as. Have a well, look at one. the kind of stuff I was just showing there, the Hitomizashi, this is all straight lines. Even though I'll show you one, whoops, on here. You know, you look at something like that and you think, oh, I'm stepping up and down. I'm sort of, you know. 
like little steps. Yes. You're not. It's straight lines going back and forth. So this, again, would be yes. your long needles here for this your, one? Your long needles are really, really useful for that. But if you're only going to get one pack, I would say get the other Go one. Go for the smaller ones. But those are not so easy to find in the shops here. So these are brand new today. We've never had them on sewing courts before. We've managed <laughs> to get I, them in today I for Susan's loads. show. I use them um, loads. I use loads. Lots of people putting these in their baskets. So there's the smaller mm. ones that we were saying maybe more for curves or if you're just starting. If you're really going to get into if it. If you're really going to get into mm -hmm. it, you'd really sort of, you said, get both. kind of need get both. Get both, yeah. And then you've, you've got them. And they can they'll... be quite tricky to get hold of. Yeah, as I said, the, the ones with the threes, I get them when I teach my classes because I find a lot of the time people don't find them in the shops. These are a little bit more available, but all the same, it's got to be a shop that actually stocks them. Um, and not everybody does, so, yeah. OK, so you heard it here first. You've got those two <laughs> different types of needles this morning, um, the eight-pack and the, the slightly yeah. longer. Um, so... We're using um, embroidery thread today, yes. and then and well, so what happens? We obviously we start with our dark fabric, yes. or we go yeah. for a blue fabric because that's more traditional, as you said, yeah. with that with the indigo I, rules I and regulations. I indulge myself with three different shades of your blues. <laughs> Like, Spoiling yourself. Pick? Well, yeah, because I couldn't just choose one, you know, they, they were too nice. Mix and match. Yeah. And also sometimes introducing some colour, but obviously traditionally um, using the, the sort of cream or the white. Yeah, but now, which one's traditional? Again, I've asked my friends in user about it, and some of them have said, well, it should really be, it's white, def definitely white. And you've got a lovely contrast. And one lady said to me, well, you know, with the white thread, sash curl looks clean even when it's dirty, which I thought was hysterically funny. <laughs> Um, that's, that's probably yeah, quite said, true. It, it always looks nice and fresh, you know, when you've got the blue and the white. Even if it's a bit grubby, it, it looks lovely. Um, but if you want that sort of antique look, then a creamier thread obviously is going to give you the instant antique. The, you know, the old piece you held up at the beginning. It was more of a sort of the, a... Well, that was probably white thread originally. And over the years, it's, it's just discoloured a bit and it's, it's become cream. So it depends what kind of look you want, really. You know, whether you like the cream, whether you like the white. I like the bold white. I have to say, I think it does look very clean. And, yeah, it and, does. You know, and it, it does. just sort of looks very, yeah. really, really eye-catching. I love it mm. on this um, piece yeah. that you did And if here. it gets a little bit dirty, people will just think it's cream thread anyway. So you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how we start mm. this game. Yeah, I mean, I, I use little bits of colour on them because I found some of the Sashka patterns not particularly the ones we've got on the table, because they're, they're quite easy. But some of them I found very difficult to understand how they worked until I saw a piece that had been stitched in colour. Oh, and okay. then the penny dropped. And I thought, right, when I do, when I do my book, I'm going to introduce colour in everything. Um, people have been able to use coloured threads for Sashka. They've been on sale since at least the 1970s in Japan. You can get lots of different colours. But I thought it's a good way of showing people which part of the pattern links to another part. So when you can you start to see that weave. Yeah, when you see it all done in white it can or cream, it can be a little bit of a puzzle. So you put a, put a coloured line in, you can see exactly where you're going. So I said today I was going to show you a few show different... Show us how it's done. Yes, I will do. Um, well, these, these curved line patterns start with the grid. I think with that one you can even see the remains of the grid. Just about. Just, Just about. about. Well, how to get your grid onto your fabric, what to mark it with. There's lots of different things you can use. Well, actually, you don't need... I brought it along, but you don't need to use your quilting ruler. OK. Because you can mark on your mat and you can take the lines off your mat instead. I'll oh, show okay. you how it's done in a mo. The traditional thing to mark with would be one of these, which is a Hera. Yes. That's my old one. <laughs> <laughs> I've had this one since 1992. Oh, well, um, so it stands the test of time. Say, yeah, it stand the test of time. I'm giving away my age now. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's the one I've had for ages, and I would have to say I don't have any other marker from back then that would still work. So it's, that's about, um, sort of, you can use it. I'm just going to hold that one up, if that's How OK. How do you use it? You, yeah, oh, yeah. I'll just hold one up. That's well, fine. This is a modern one. one. That's an old, an old tatty Let's one. Hold up the, <laughs> should we hold up the new hold, one? Hold up is the that, new was one. Was that a hint? Yes. So this is a hair <laughs> marker, so you can use this to sort of create folds in the fabric so you can start to know where you're going to... Um, so this is, this is crucial. This is in your toolkit for Sashko. Well, it, it is and it isn't, actually. There are better things now. This is the old-fashioned marker that was used in Japan for marking lines when you sew kimono. And it is very effective. I'm going to show you just on the, just on the very, very edge of this. Um, I'll do it. Actually, I'll do it with yours. I won't do it with mine. I'll do it with yours. There you go. And that's not the way you would hold it in Japan. In Japan, you would hold it like that. Oh, OK. But bear in mind that, that people would be marking lines on kimono on the floor and we have got a nice work surface to work on. So I find if I'm using it on a work surface, it's actually easier to hold it like a rotary cutter. And just use it like... But you would draw towards you like that, whereas with the rotary cutter, you always push away, of course. Yes. Can you see that line? Just starts to create, you can just see here. It polishes, can... it polishes a line on the cloth. It's actually very, I think you can 
I'm oh wearing the wrong sure. colour today for this. I'm, I'm dressed for Sashko. I probably am as well, actually. Um, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little tiny shiny line. Yeah, if you sort of twizzle the fabric around a bit. There, there oh, it is. It's a little bit like pencils, isn't it? Like lead. Yeah, it does. And it shows very well on a dark fabric. And like I said, it is the indestructible marker that never, ever wears out on you. So you don't have to refill. There's no, no refills going no, on with the Heron marker. No. The only thing with it is that line will stay polished on your fabric until you wash it. It won't disappear until then. There's no other way you can get it off. So you have to wash your finished piece. OK. So it's also you... great for card making, actually. <laughs> Getting your crease in your cards. It is. It is. It's good for paper crafts, but that's just another little use for it. So other things that you can use, and I'm very glad I managed to nab one of these here today because I left mine at home on my sewing table. This I'll just do a little mark again on the edge. This is a sew line marker. So this is the white one. Obviously, if you're yeah. using these darker fabrics with your navies and your blues, um, then the white is going to be an obvious... You're not going to use a black marker, are you? No, you want I would, an obvious I choice. Use, I think the black one, you might just about be able to just see it. Yeah. <laughs> but I would tend to go for the white. The one I've got at home is, is the yellow one, um, simply because I find that very handy as well. And it's really good. And, you know, it's, it's quite funny. Um, mine is the older type. And, you know, they've got this little... Well, I'm just trying to twiddle around with the, the eraser. The more old-fashioned one, it wasn't obvious to me that that dot on the back was an eraser, so I didn't know for ages. You can just rub it off. But it rubs off. It comes off like that, you see, afterwards. So you take it off like that. I think it washes out, doesn't it? So that's the white remember. marker on your screen. Also, there are refills mm. available for that on the website. So if those you've got very, one and you want to pop nice. one in. So you can mark it up using the hair marker, using the, uh, the yeah. white pencil. There is a bit of preference, but the one that, for me... Have we got these? Is this a pen? This is the pen, I white marking pen. Know. Have we got we'll find out. I don't know. We should do. Um, yes, we may do because they're made by the, it's made by the same company, by Clover, who make the needles. Oh, OK. Um, anyway, this is amazing. I'll tell you what, I'll actually I'll line this up. We're going to try and get these Ooh. in. We haven't got them in today, but we're going to haven't try and get we? these in stock. Oh, no. gosh. Oh, right. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm using these then. No, show um, us. Show us. This is the best well, one. We'll, we'll get it in I want to you. show you what it does. Because the thing is, when people buy these, sometimes they don't realise that you can't really see the line until it's dried. And I've oh, had people okay. say, oh, I bought one and it didn't work. Well, it's a kind of liquid wax. This is the thing. I'm just using an ordinary ruler, by the way, and what I've done here, I've just twitched this bit of fabric around, so I've overlapped some nice convenient lines on my mat. I'm actually going to draw a one-and-a-half-inch grid on here. Um, and I'll move the, the ruler pretty quickly after I've done this. As I'm hoping, what the camera's going to pick up is that that line now is not really quite visible, but it dries, and it's drying incredibly quickly in here as well because the light. Yeah, as soon as it dries, it goes white. So you only need a light touch. Don't scribble back and forth. No. Because if you scribble back and forth, you find that you, you just run the pen out really quickly. Well, also, you might distort the fabric slightly. The, um, there is that, yeah. You don't want to sort of pull anything out of place. You don't. Just to quickly say, the, um, the Sashko source book, the one on your screens at the moment, really, really popular this morning. Um, and sort of other people struggling to get it anywhere else. We're really lucky that we had some stock of this. Where I'm so glad that it arrived. We've got some. <laughs> it's, it's arrived. Um, so yeah. BKNZ09. And um, obviously, you've got all the history of there of that traditional yeah. technique. Um, we've got the author here. We've got lucky on two, two counts. Lucky to have the book in stock. Lucky to have Susan here with us. Um, and lots of projects in there incorporating Sashko, whether that's into cushions or um, patchwork or bags or lots of different things in there. Let's just quickly look at some of those projects. That Let's one's a, a, it's a Noren door curtain, that one, the one you just looked at. The bag. And that little bag I use absolutely loads. I use all the things out of my books, you know. <laughs> you use the, oh, to hold your books. Well, I, 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 use, I use the projects. I, I sort of well, that's, run, that's run, what I you want. I test them afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, There's no point making things for the like. sake of absolutely it. Absolutely not. No, it's, it's just nice to use them. Even the chopsticks in that picture are out in my kitchen. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> everything's, every... everything's part of the book. Yeah. So you can see here, even with greetings cards and things, if you want to incorporate oh, if, that. If you just do a little piece, it's great for something like a greetings card. So, or, or stick it in a frame or whatever. So we mark the fabric mm -hmm. up. We just wanted to highlight that because the stock's going really quickly. So just give the call centre a ring if you do want that one. I'm just going to turn that round because in order to get my grid lines on, I'll just... Uh... I'll just go the other way now, across it. I find it's, it, it's, particularly when I've got it on a nice convenient height table like this one, I find it's a lot easier to draw the lines towards me. OK. Well, if I draw yeah. them going away like that, I'm trying to look over my ruler all the time. Um, so just to turn the fabric once you Yeah, just, just turn it. Um, 
rather puzzling now I'm sort of working between metric and imperial this morning because I cut my squares at 25 centimetres um, but I'm marking it with a one and a half inch grid now 25 centimetres is more or less nine and three quarter inches which means that I've got a nice edge all the way around it and it's giving me a nice convenient working area of nine square inches that's divided down into a one and a half inch grid. I always like to keep the maths easy. It makes sense doing it that way. Back to school Monday today as well, isn't it? That first day of term. We don't really need to be doing oh, too much maths. It oh is indeed. No. But so um, we've, we've got lots of different examples of things that you could make um, yes. using the sash coat. We've, got some, we've also got some pictures being sent in, so from oh, emails. So let's have a look at these pictures that have been sent in this morning. Who were these ones from? Producer Hannah? This one's from Julie, the first one. Let's see. Oh, it's on our screens behind us. Oh, oh look at that. Oh, there wow. it is. Beautiful. First ever attempt at sash coat. Well, she, she put little beads on it as well. I think she has. Gosh. Just little highlights. I it really gives it a different dimension. The, col the colour as it's, well. It's, it's lovely. It's gorgeous in colours. It looks like she's got pinks and reds on that. Wow. That looks really, really nice. Oh, it's super. And I've had another picture sent in as mm. well. Who was this one from? Oh, from Teresa. Oh, it's Let's not, have it's a look. Not behind me. <laughs> oh, she used your book. She bought your book. Oh, brilliant. And this was her first ever attempt at Sashko using the book. That's excellent. When I did the book, and actually, she really the, enjoyed it. Each, um, each chapter in the book, I did the first pattern on cream, just oh, for a bit okay. of contrast to sort of help people navigate the book a little bit. Yeah. And when we designed the book, um, we got the graphic designers to put like a band of colour along the, I think it's the, the side edge. So you can sort of see which section of the book that you're in just by so looking. Can, yeah, yeah, I noticed that on side, like chapter divisions yeah, with it, the colour. It, it really works. So while, while we were looking at those pictures, I've just marked a grid on here. Funny enough, the first pattern I'm going to show you, the, the one that was sent to us, that first image that had the pink and red, that's the pattern I'm going to show you how to mark. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, right now. See how we're going to yeah. do that one. Yeah, I'm going to do the same one. Well, I've got some... I've got some circle templates. I just have a, I've got a little stacking set of those. I bought them at a quilt show. Um, but you know, you could just cut it out of a piece of template plastic if you wanted to, yeah, something and use like those that. To create some yeah, samples. and uh, actually, if you want to work completely in metric, a Pringles lid makes an eight centimeter circle template. <laughs> so you've got, you've got an excuse to eat Pringles if you need to. Um, yeah, the, the you pattern... never need an excuse to eat crisps. No, you don't, probably. <laughs> the, the pattern is called Shippo, which literally means seven treasures. It's only been called that for about the last 250 years, though. Before that, it's called Wachigai, which is interlocked circles, which it does look, you know, it is more like interlocked circles, definitely. Um, so Wachigai is probably a, a better name for it. Still, everybody nowadays calls it Shippo. The name Shippo is a pun on four directions, which is Shiho. There's some terrible puns in Japanese. Oh, really? And of course, when you think four directions, it has got four directions. It's like a flower with four it's directions. Got, it's got almost that um, yeah. a sort of diamond in the centre section it has. there, it's, hasn't it? It's a lovely pattern and one that I really, really enjoy doing. And the, the thing that I like about it, it's very versatile, but like most of the patterns in Sashiko, it actually comes from all sorts of different sources in Japan. You know, you'll see it on paper, you'll see it on fabric, you'll see it carved into buildings. Um, I was at a temple once, I looked up at the roof tiles and the roof ridge had a whole pattern of that. Of using these the circles? The same these interlock, sort of circles. interlock circles. Yes, yeah. So the easiest way to do them, you've got your circles and you've got your grid and you're lining up your circles on your grid. And I start first of all just by doing a whole series of circles just individually, like that, just touching. If you find your grid's not bang on by the way or you find your circle template is a little bit too big you can always mark it just a quarter at a time and then kind of adjust it a little bit ah like, so they line up or yeah, they fit yeah. exactly into those grid squares exactly would so you, keep if you were, um, so say you're marking this onto this yes. fabric here now would mm -hmm. you then pop this fabric into the project or would this be would you you know would you insert this onto a backing or would you you just use this as is i would actually stitch it just through one layer Sashko traditionally was done through one layer, two layers, three layers, four layers, five layers. It doesn't normally have wadding in it. You, you never see wadding in old pieces. But what you find when you start looking at the history of Sashko, the pieces that have got the most dense, decorative and interesting stitches are nearly always done just through one layer. And I think it's because it is actually easier to stitch. It must be quite tricky to go through, you know, four or five layers 
with those. And I guess that's why those yeah. needles, as you said, are really, are really sharp. Yeah. If, um, <laughs> sort of, and they don't bend. Because if you're going through that many you, layers... You could probably get through that many layers with those, definitely. <laughs> um, the, the kind of things that I've got at home, so I've got a, quite a big collection of old Sashko that I started collecting when I was working out there. Um, the, the kind of thing that has lots of layers in... Things like rugs to go on the floor. And you probably think, oh, my goodness, walking on these. But, of course, people in Japan don't wear shoes indoors. No. So, um, you know, some of those are very, very thick. But then you find the more layers, the less fancy the pattern. So where I've got five layers and an old rug, it's just straight lines. So if you want to go for something a little bit more, like this gorgeous quilt behind us, yeah. if you want to start introducing more of the um, more intricate patterns or with colour or with more with more stitching detail, really you Oops. need to be... With one layer is the way to one do it. One layer is a lot easier. It really makes life so much easier. So if you're a beginner yeah. and you're just starting, you're thinking you might give Sashka a try, obviously the beginning of the book talks about the history, but then it, it introduces you slowly into into the process and then into projects of how to incorporate it those. It gives you all the basic techniques. And it, even if you're not a beginner, you'd still usually only work through one layer. My friends in Japan do, and some of them have been stitching Sashiko for 45 years. So it's, it really is just the preferred yeah, the preferred yeah. It's, way. It's, it's interesting because the technique kind of crosses embroidery and quilting in a way. You know, sometimes it can be quilting, sometimes it can be embroidery. Something like this, I just stitched through one layer. And of course, I did all my Sashiko pieces as little individual pieces, you see, like this. And then I put them together. Now, that pattern actually relates to this one because I start to put the rest of it in. That is half the lines that are in this design. It looks like apple core in quilting, that one. And now I'm just going back for the shippo pattern and I'm putting in... Creating those sort of diamonds the rest of the design. in the centre. It does, actually, yeah. It looks like an elongated diamond. Um, like a lot of very traditional Japanese patterns, it looks incredibly modern. And if you didn't know where it came from and you said to somebody, oh, this is a 1970s pattern, they'd probably say, oh, yes, it is. I've even seen this, actually, on Roman mosaics. It's a really old pattern that just seems to go all over the world. But it doesn't look dated in any way. No, like it's still, no. It's something I think you could still totally see being incorporated into modern dressmaking or to, into garments or into yeah. things for household yeah, goods. or absolutely. Cushions. It, I don't look at that and think, oh, old-fashioned, <laughs> don't really like the look. You know, it's, it's very it's it's, quite modern. It's, it looks very contemporary. And the other thing is, it doesn't, also, it doesn't look obviously Japanese. No. You know, people look at it and they're not going to go, oh, it's got pagodas or geisha or something on it. It doesn't look obviously Japanese. So you can take Sashiko and you can put it into just about any interior. And Sue has. Someone sent in a picture this morning of a cushion Ooh. in their home with some Sashiko. Let's have a look at this picture from Sue. Oh, lovely. Oh, look at that. Gorgeous. Oh, that, is, that is fantastic. And incorporating a couple of the different techniques there in the... Um... She's done that in one of my workshops. Really? Yeah, because I, I, I combine all those patterns. The one that's at the top left on the screen, um, that is actually the same one. As this that, one here? Yeah, as this one here. It's called Fundo. It, um, it, lit <laughs> it literally translates as scale weights, balance weights, but it's also the shape of ancient um, ingots, gold ingots, apparently. Um, when you, There's a design that's called um, Eight Treasures and Collection of Treasures, and when you see that... Um, with that pattern, it actually has a gold ingot in that shape. Unfortunately, I haven't got any of those at home, but <laughs> there you Not go. Yet. So I've just started, you know, marking this. Um, I don't know if the camera can sort of see it. Hopefully, can see it quite well. Yeah, you can start to mm. see those, like we said, mm -hmm. the elongated diamonds just there in these in these top circles. Yeah, it's, it's a but it's actually pattern. quite simple, isn't it? If you've got a template, a circular template. Yeah, if you've got a circular it's, template, it's fine. It's not anything it's, too it is tricky very, or fiddly. It's very very simple. And then when you come to stitch it. Um, I'll just put that piece down there so maybe, maybe you can see it quite well on that. It's not stitched as individual circles. Oops, sorry, there's a, a hair on there. Um, when people look at it at first, they tend to think, oh, it's individual circles, but it isn't. It's actually diagonal wavy lines. So you can see oh. how I've done it in the orange. And the pattern all interlocks. Sometimes the, the, the logic of the way the patterns work in Sashiko is actually very like machine quilting. They're continuous lines. You're keeping the lines going as much as possible. So, so rather than breaking those into small individual mm -hmm. circles, that's one of those things. Yep. You know, when you have the um, <laughs> like one of those pictures where if you look at it one way, it's a witch, and one way it's a, a yeah. an old lady. Or you know, when you have to change your eyes to look at different things. <laughs> when you, you said diagonal mm -hmm. lines, all of a sudden, then I can see. If you can yep. see this through, you can actually the colour demonstrates it really well. But rather than seeing that as individual circles here, you start to see that as lines, sort of weaving yep. all the way sort of yep. through, don't you? Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's because, as you said, it's about keeping 
the stitch Keeping going, the lines so long continuous. lines yeah. as opposed yeah. to short broken mm -hmm. circles or yeah. short, yeah. shorter sections. I'm going to show you a couple of other patterns as well because I want to show you the one that's on the back of here, so Gaiha. Um, I've got some other squares there that I put some lines on earlier. But just before I do that, can I just show you a variation on this pattern? Yeah, absolutely, yeah? of course. It's, it's actually at the top right-hand corner on the this big one. quilt behind us. Yes, up there. Just about. Yeah, can we, you can, can see we reach? It. Yeah. <laughs> and that is called maru shippo, which means round shippo. And the, what you have to do, you have to draw a little circle where the lines cross over. You see, and another thing, sorry, I just mentioned this before we go any further. Um, on this one, you'll notice that where the lines in the pattern cross, the stitches don't cross. With this style of sashiko, they never cross on the front. The threads will cross on the back, but not on the front. Oh, so you keep them as clean lines rather than yeah. any Yeah, you any don't have any stitches crossing over. It would make a weak point in your design because some of the patterns have lots and lots of lines crossing over, you know, six or eight. And by the time you've got that many stitches crossing over, if it was on the front, you'd actually end up with a bump. And it, would, it looks pretty awful. And it also makes a weak point because it sticks up higher than the rest of the sash coat and it would wear off really quickly. So you want to keep the overlapping on the back and the yes. front nice and clear yeah. and clean yeah. and, and, and yeah. easy and simple, yeah. really. Yeah. So if you want to turn some maru shippo, you need to draw another line inside of the, the curves that we've got at the moment. And you need a small circle. And I, I couldn't remember what size I'd used on that. I suspect it was an old pound coin. So before you get rid of all of them, hang on to an old one. Um, and you just pop it down like that on the place where you cross over. I do find coins make very useful small size circle templates. And a 10 pence piece is great for a one inch. For a different size circle. Oh yes, for different size circles. So I, I think I've got that slightly slightly off centre. So this here so is where you can again. start to put a twist on this design if you want to it add another is, element in. It is, you can add another element to it. I just thought because we had it on the court behind us, I felt I had to show people today. And then um, you would draw another circle inside. Well, of course, these little templates are like hoops, so I can draw on the inside of it now. So like do that. you always mark up, the first thing is obviously you've got your fabric, yeah. the first thing is the grid, and then you always, would you mark up the whole pattern before you start any stitching? Yeah, I would. You pretty, do? Pretty, pretty much. Most of them you do. There are one or two designs where I, I mark up like the first stage and then I would go back to it when I stitch that and I'd mark up the second stage. Can I, can I show you on here? Yes. Yeah? This one, um, this is a variation on a pattern called Asanoha. That's beautiful. Hemp yeah, it's, you can see how complicated it is, yeah? Yeah. Um, it's an elongated version of it. And I find with that, the best thing is to mark the first stage of the pattern, stitch it, then go back and mark the rest of the lines. Because otherwise, if you've got all the lines there to start off with, you get confused about which one stitch. I can imagine that that yeah. would be quite... I'm just going yeah. to try and find some of these in oh, the book. Well, actually, I, I prob I'll probably find it quite quickly I'm sure you'll find you. it more quickly than I will. <laughs> go for it, Susan. Grab the book off you there. There we go. Um, Here's a coloured version of it here. Over half the stock of the book has now gone, so please do oh, check out your wow. baskets. Yeah, if you want one, get one. Um, so here's a coloured version of it. So if I was going to mark and stitch this, I would start out by drawing the rectangular grid, which actually starts the square grid, and then it's divided down into rectangles. Oh, so you subdivide it. Yeah, you subdivide it. You put the diagonal lines on, and then you would actually start doing your stitching. You do all your vertical lines that I've done in red here. You do those first. Then you go and you do your wide zigzags. You can actually also do this just as lines going across, but the traditional way to do it is to start and zigzag down your line, and then you can zigzag back again. And then, only at that stage, would I then go and mark these shallow zigzags, because if I find if I've got both sets of zigzags on, um, I'll start following the wrong one and do it in the wrong sequence. But that's where actually, in the book, using the colour, it does actually help to it identify does, where those does. different lines yeah. are. I don't know if you can see in here, but yeah. rather than just having it in the book, in the white stitches, mm -hmm. it helps you to realise which areas you yeah. know are, are which pattern mm -hmm. to follow or which you yeah. can see here. It starts yeah. to break up the design a little bit more, yeah. more simply. But especially if you are a beginner and you're new to the technique, it um, makes it slightly less overwhelming, I yeah. think, to go, oh, you know, I'm going to follow that black and then I'm going to follow the red and then the... Well, it's an idea I actually got from my Sashko teacher, Sashko teacher. Because I saw Sasha. I thought you were going to say she was called Sasha. My no, Sashko teacher. No, it's all no, Sasha. No, she wasn't Sasha. actually. The lady who first taught me is Chie Ikeda. And her teacher, um, she'd done a sample uh, of the, the Asanoha pattern, the, 
the hemp leaf pattern. She put colour in it. For the first time, I could really understand it. Before that, every time I tried to stitch it, I just went off in the wrong direction. Just looks quite Sti overwhelming. And I stitched myself into a corner. And you'll find with all of the, the traditional patterns, there is a traditional way to get around it. And if you follow that sequence, you'll actually use less thread and you'll stitch more efficiently. So it's, so it's all it's about making learning. the most of everything, isn't it? It is, that was, it is it, about making it was the most about of everything. about upcycling or making clothes last yeah, longer or a it bit was, warmer. It was. And we're actually using embroidery schemes this morning, so the thread yeah. itself. So when you, um, so if, for someone that's starting with this, mm -hmm. obviously we've spoken about fabric, mm -hmm. um, going more for blues with the indigo yeah. rules in yeah. Japan. Then we spoke about the needles, that they're much more durable, mm -hmm. they're not, they are. They're not yeah. going to bend. Um, and then the next thing is obviously, once you've marked it up, is thread. Is thread. So, yes. so what, how do we how do we go about doing this? What do we? If you were using embroidery thread, do you separate the skein? If I was going to use embroidery thread, yeah, I think I, I would. I would probably split it and use three strands. Three strands. And then I would double the three strands. I haven't actually got some embroidery from the table. I've I've, I've got a few. <laughs> I've got the remains I of some of the... I might have some here. Oh, you might have. Oh, that's Let's great. See. We'll use yours then. I have. I've got the remains of what we were using for a class yesterday. Um, lovely. Can I totally destroy that skein? Yes. So um, <laughs> we're using this today. This is a stranded cotton skein, you can see, mm -hmm. which is absolutely fine to use. Um, as Susan said, if you want to use three and double it over, do you want to use the white? I'll um, use the white, thank But you. the specific um, Sashko thread, we've tried, we really tried to get it in for today. and we Hopefully we'll get, get it You can't get it anyway. This is stuck at customs. So we're um, <laughs> hopefully we're going to get that in soon. It's a specific thread for Sashko. Um, but this is fine yeah. to use as well if you want to do You actually want technique. a very long thread. <laughs> this freaks most people out, actually. You want a long thread. You're going to stitch with it doubled. So, so this is obviously a six can I, thread. Can I see the strands? It. Come on, come on. There's one project in the book actually where I did use embroidery thread because I had a beautiful hand dyed one and I really wanted to show it off. Tell you what, can you hold the end of that so it doesn't all go berserk? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the white thread. The green one is also on your screen and we've got a red one as well. So if you Ooh. want to incorporate some different colours. You're probably thinking, why on earth is she going to split it and then double it up again? There is some logic to this. What's the logic? It's that when, Fill you, me in. when you stitch with it, it's got a bit tangled up at the end, I'll just snip that bit off. When you stitch with it, you're not pulling through an awful lot of thread. You're actually pulling through the same amount of thread as if you were just stitching with the, the three strands. I'll show you what I mean. It's quite a big eye, isn't it, on the needle? Oh, it's as well. huge, yeah. massive. Yeah, really big. So I've brought those strands down together. There is actually a brand of, of Sashko thread in Japan that you can't get over here, which is stranded. Oh, so it's, mm. they, they actually would do that as well, the, they would the, split it. The more traditional thread isn't, but there is one brand that you can split and then you can decide whether you want to have, you know, ever so many strands. I mean, my teacher, she used a very fine Sashko thread, which is the one I, I was just about to leap and use there. <laughs> um, and she said to me, if you want it thicker, just put an extra strand in. But you see, I've, I've got the thread doubled. So now we, have, we are back to six. We are back to six. It just means that you're not pulling through. Twelve more... might be a little yeah, bit. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're not pulling through more than you actually need to. We've got about ten minutes or so left. That's, that so. is absolutely fine. Good stuff. Well, actually, I'll tell you what, can I just... Very, very quickly, I've got a piece here, I've marked part of it. Can I put a little bit more on that? Because then I can demo you another stitch. OK. Yeah? Right, I'll flip that over. Oh, wrong one. Um... We've got a message from <laughs> Tracy, let's see. Yeah. Morning, Tracy. Um, brilliant Sashko show today. I could listen and learn all day. Oh, that's really nice. That's <laughs> lovely. Good. It's, but... it's so lovely to come. I come pump into work on a Monday morning and I'm, it's like <laughs> having lessons. I just get to learn loads of new things from inspirational people. It's great. So mm. the, um, the ultimate Sashko book, Tracy, if you do want some more info, there's lo it's bursting with information and lots of different projects and introducing those into different Wonderful. things I better around the this. house. Or... Right. But if you've loved hearing from Susan, obviously, this is her book, so... You get a bit of you in there as well, don't you? It's not... You do, you do. I like a book with a bit of personality, rather than it just being... You know, sometimes <laughs> it's, quite, it's just a bit... Uh, you know, if it's just a very straightforward uh, sort of demo book, but when you've got a bit of the history and everything as well... I'm just going to mark just a tiny little bit there, because I know we, we're sort of coming up to, to the hour pretty soon. Um, the little piece that I've got here has got a pattern on it that's called Sagaiha, or Ocean Wave, which is also on the sampler behind me. Done a little bit smaller, I think... Yes, I did it on the sampler. Yes, I, I did it with um, a two-inch circle template. This one, I've done it with a three-inch circle template and a one-and-a-half-inch grid. 
and I can't see those lines. Where have they gone? Did I mark them properly? Hang on, was I using the same pen? I'll tell you what, I'll mark it with this and then people can see what this one looks like too. Okay. I wasn't going to mark the whole pattern though because we haven't got a lot of time. I'm just going to mark the bottom bit. Oh, the pencil is actually just... Oh, it's very yeah, good. It's... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As I said, I've got one of these at home. The thing I like about the other one is that um, you can iron the marks off. They're nothing to do with friction pens, by the way. Um, but the, the lines, they go on very easily and they come off very easily. And when I, when I tend to use my sew line marker is when I want to use um, you know, the yellow one. Yes, or to rub it <laughs> off, like you said, on the end. Yeah, it just, it just comes off pretty easily. So this, this particular pattern is meant to be an ocean wave. And normally I would have marked the whole thing all the way up. Um, I've got a little piece there. You can see, you know, I've highlighted it in colour that, um, you know, you're stitching across. It's almost like a clamshell. You're, you're going across in three stages. Like an ice scallop sort of shape, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But when you do it, you actually want to stitch from the bottom. You're thinking, well, why would you want to stitch from the bottom and work your way up? And that's because when you do a stitch pattern like this, I'll turn it over so you can see the back. And yes, it is messy. And for embroidery people, yes, we are going to start and finish with a knot. <laughs> Don't freak, please. Um, but you, you can see here all the little knots on the back. So you want to start at the bottom and work your way up because if you don't, if you started at the top, then when you did your next row and you were stitching along here, you'd have to get round all those little loopy bits and all those little knots. Yeah. And so it, you've got it to makes it really around awkward. Them, yeah. If you start at the, at the bottom. Start at the bottom. Start at the bottom. And I've just tied a little knot into that thread. Um, I'm just going to give you a really freaky tip as well. If you've got a needle, which is a very new needle, like the one I've got here, and you think the needle is sort of a bit sticking in the fabric, my hair is clean, I hasten to add. Do that. It's a Japanese sewing trick. It takes a tiny bit of oil off your hair. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe not if you've got lacquer in. No. But, uh, but yeah. A little, yeah. little bit of oil tiny, or grease or something. Yeah, it takes a tiny little bit of oil off your hair, which normally would be coming off your hands anyway, um, and gets onto the needle. And it makes the needle pass through the fabric a little bit easier. And it sounds really freaky. Now, I'm pleating that fabric on the tip of the needle. Can you see how shiny and yeah. ooh, lovely it looks? This is where you want to get in for a, a good close-up. And the other thing, actually, I didn't bring the needle all the way through to the front of the fabric. Now, this is not something that's in my book because I learned about it after I wrote the book. I was watching one of my friends stitching Sashka and I noticed she did it. And I said, why do you do that? She said, it stops the first stitch twisting. Ah, OK. Ah, right. Wow, I didn't know that. So that's a new one for me. But I'm, I'm literally pleating that fabric on the tip of the needle. I can get right round the curve. Don't panic the first time you do it. If you can't get right round the curve, just put as many stitches on as you can. But the stitching action is the thing. I keep going. As I come towards the, the little point at the bottom, I'm just eyeballing it and thinking, oh, thank you. And I, I'm just going to say I've got about three stitches there as well. <laughs> so I've got it all... Um, gathered there now. Yeah, it's kind of... Oops, gathered up. There we go. Pull that through like that. Ease it out. Oh, my, that was so, so quickly you established yeah, that iconic quick. pattern. Yeah, it's, it starts really, really quickly. So, you see, what, what you've effectively got then is all the, th the threads are lying parallel in the stitch. They're not actually bunching up. And then, to go the other way, I'll just start doing my pleating again. I'm trying to angle this so the camera can see it. Um, sometimes people say, oh, you sew away from yourself. How strange. Yes, it's because I'm trying to show you. Um, normally, I'd be you know, just sewing the normal way. I'm not going to go right round that because we haven't got a lot of time. How far do you try to leave between every... Obviously, you're trying to keep that fairly even. Is that is that one of the things that comes with practice, is the even spacing the between? The evenness comes with practice. It also comes with the stitching I was using, you know, when I was pleating it. But you want the gaps to be about a half or, at the very most, two-thirds of the length of the stitch. They're not equal. And they certainly don't want to be bigger. So the stitch is longer than the, uh, than yes, the gap, every, yes. always? You, you've always got more fabric sti sitting on the top of... Sorry, more thread sitting on top of the fabric than you have underneath. See, if I turn... There's, there's the front, and there's the back. I'll just and show we, that front once more, if that's front. OK. Front. You can yep. see, can see the stitches look a little bit bigger there. And there's the back, and that's what it should look like. And the thing you'll notice here, I've left a little loop. Wherever you've got a very sharp change of direction, have a small loop on the back, it stops your sashko bunching up. Another tip. And we've got Gross. some more tips coming up. You're Great. going to be back at 11, aren't you, I Susan? I am, yeah. And what are we doing at 11? We're going to look at, at the... Well, at 11, I was going to look at a project out of my Simple Sashko book um, where I've actually combined 
several of the stitch patterns I've just shown you now, plus another one. So I'm going to show you how to make so one pattern grow out of another. Gorgeous, lovely. I look forward to it. Lots of decorative. Love, I love having all these in the studio as well. It's lovely. Thanks. We'll go, go and grab a cup of tea and we'll see you again do. in an hour or so. Thank we're you. just going to look at Susan's book once more. I'll take these over to the other side and look at those fabric options as well. But lovely. It looks like I've had a history lesson, a sewing lesson. Yep. <laughs> a lucky girl this morning. Thanks. So... Um, the book from Susan, the first one that we've got this morning, is the ultimate Sashko um, source book. So we're here looking at all of the history behind it, looking at where the, the origins of that technique from Japan. And um, I can show you that in the beginning of the book here. Look at that. that. We've got this quilt hanging behind us in the studio today, this exact one you can see here in the book. So here, just a Sashiko his, a, a Sashko. I'm still sometimes saying it creeps in. A Sashko history. It's a creature of habit. Um, but you can just see here some, you can sort of the origins of that technique. I'm talking you all through the tradition. And then getting started, so talking you through as we have this morning, the needles, why you use certain fabrics, why you always use your blues. And then you start to move in, as Susan was saying, um, using, moving this into projects. So you've got um, different samples that you could use and incorporate into perhaps gift cards or into cushions or placemats or coasters. But really beautiful, ornate designs. You, it's, it's a very atmospheric book, actually. You really do feel like you've got a, a, taste, of, a taste of Japan. And as I was saying, I really don't feel, despite the fact this is a very old technique, it doesn't, it feels modern. It doesn't feel, you know, stuffy or old fashioned in any way. It, it does still feel like something you would want around the house. And like Susan was saying, incorporating it into bags. I mean, these are gorgeous. Imagine these as little laundry bags or drawstring bags that you could pop, um, you know, beautiful as little gifts, perhaps if you wanted to give those as little presents to somebody. And the cushions there are absolutely stunning. We've had some pictures sent in as well this morning from people that have had a go at Sashko using the book. Thank you for sending those in. Please keep sending in your questions for both Susan and Paul. You can do that studio at sewingquarter.com. And this is the quilt that we've got in the studio today. Please be aware as well, we've got a library of patterns in this book, um, all of the different stitch techniques that Susan's been talking you through. So if you've missed any of those, if you didn't quite catch perhaps how you did those, sort of marking out your diagrams, your grid diagrams, and then talking you through the actual stitch ones as well. But a really thorough guide, the ultimate Sashko source book. And Susan was saying it's really difficult to get this anywhere at the moment because it's currently being reprinted. So we're lucky we've got some stock here at Sewing Quarter. VKMZ09, if you do like this, please do check out your baskets. And also, obviously, all of the needles and the fabrics. Susan will be back doing some more Sashko at 11. But I'm joined again by Paul in the next hour. We're making Derek the Dinosaur, so don't go anywhere. I'll see you in three. Join us on Facebook. Simply search for The Sewing Quarter and like our page for the latest news and more. different ways you can buy from us here at the Sewing Quarter. You can order from us by calling our free phone number at 0800 112 4433 and talk to the team at our UK based call centre. Alternatively there are other ways you can buy from us. You can go online and shop through our website at www.sewingquarter.com. You can even watch the show there and shop as you go. You can check out as many times as you like throughout the day and only pay a small fee of £2.95 postage and packaging for the whole day. We also offer a 30-day money-back guarantee on all products excluding custom-cut fabric. Our friendly UK-based team will help guide you through every step. The Sewing Quarter website is simple and easy to use. You can view a live broadcast of the show on our homepage. Get instant access to our online shop, which has a wide range of wonderful products for you to choose from. You can also enjoy a selection of projects and guides, which we have on offer to help you enhance your skills and gain valuable tips. Watch the live shows and you can buy the product which is currently being shown on air. You can even message the studio to ask our presenters or team any questions you might have. 
Below, you'll find all the products from today's show for you to look at and purchase. On the right of the screen, next to today's products, you will find our simple program guide listing all upcoming shows. So, join us today at sewingquarter.com. Sewing Quarter had a ball at the Festival of Quilts. Most importantly, we loved meeting all of you at the Sewing Quarter Cafe. Thanks to everyone who popped by to meet us, including those who joined us for a spot of English paper piecing, all for the great cause, Project Linus. John Scott was even joined by Mandy Shaw on Sunday, and they laughed their way through a demonstration from Mandy's red and white Christmas book. If you didn't have a chance to drop by our stand or couldn't make it to the NEC, then we have a treat for you. We've filmed Mandy Shaw's live demonstration at Festival of Quilts, and you can watch the full video over on our website at www.sewingquarter.com. Simply click on the banner at the top of the page, sit back with a cuppa, and watch Mandy and John. Welcome back to Sewing Quarter this morning. We have got such a great show today. We've got Paul Clark from the Great British Sewing Bee and we've also got Susan Briscoe who's the author of this Ultimate Sashko book. So we've got an absolute treat here for you this morning and we're joined in this hour by our friend Derek the Dinosaur. So our floor manager Jay was just saying I should start the show by just going rah, here he is, he's ready to go. So we're going to be making this dinosaur in this hour with Paul and we're using a McCall's pattern and the lovely thing about this pattern is it comes with three different uh, dinosaurs in there and a wall hanging as well. So if you've got a little person in your life that perhaps loves dinosaurs and you want to make them something, a little toy, then there are three different dinosaurs within this pattern. You can see the one on our desk here, but also this wall hanging, which is really lovely if you wanted to add it perhaps to a playroom or a child's bedroom. Children do seem to love dinosaurs, don't they? Well, and adults, but it does seem to be quite, a, quite an obsession with their young children. As they're heading back to school today, maybe you want to to make them a treat. You might have a bit more time on your hands now they're back at school, perhaps you can finally get back to some sewing. So as I said, the McCall's pattern, you've got your three dinosaurs in there and the wall hanging. And, and this is being sold separately to our bundles this morning. So if you do want to make the dinosaur, all of your instructions in the pattern. Now, the dinosaur, we've made three different, but we've put th together three different bundles this morning um, to make it in three different colorways. So I'll start first of all with the green one. So you get a metre and a half of fabric. This is enough to make a one dinosaur. And you've got a, meter, a half a metre of your green. So this bright green here. Half a metre of your bold orange. Half a metre of your spot on green. Spot on lime green. And then you've also got a 30 centimetre square of felt, which you can use for the mouth and for the eyes. You've got a complementary thread colour there as well that ties in with the bundle. You've got a skein of embroidery thread, which again you can use for, um, for the mouth and the eyes. And then you've also got these popper eyes that Paul's going to show you how to use this morning. I've not seen these in use before, so I'm, I'm looking forward to a little lesson in those. And you've got obviously more in that packet than you would use. Plus your stuffing. So everything you need there to make the dinosaur. ZTGC00 is our green and orange bundle. And you'll see as we go through, but also two of these fabrics, you'll only use very little, as you can see on this one, just for these, um, these little triangles on the back. So, you know, whether you decide to keep that fabric and you can pop some in your stash, or you might have another fabric you want to combine, there is going to be some left over. So, so the blue dinosaur bundle, which is the one that you can see here, this is our cornflower blue solid from the Cower. Then it's been teamed with the crosshatch yellow there. You can see that linear look fabric. I think this one's called sunshine yellow. It's a nice golden colour. And then you've got spot on red as well there. So a nice bright poppy red, which you can see just if I show you on the back of the dinosaur here, you can just see how those colours all come together. And again, that's been teamed with your stuffing, with your felt, square of felt. So I'll show you how much you get. Again, you'd have some left over to pop in your stash, 30 centimetres square. You've got your eyes. Again, you'd have some left over of that and your thread. KEGC66, that's for the blue dinosaur. 
And finally, this is our dinosaur that we're going to be demonstrating with Paul in just a moment. So I'll show you this one as I've got a feeling it's going to be popular. This is our purple bundle. So we've got a really lovely turquoise linear look fabric. Um, so you can just see again that cross hatching detail. You've got a solid purple, a royal purple there. And then you've got a spot on aqua. You can just see that thread peeping in behind. So a nice deep purple thread. And again, your felt, your skein, your eyes and your um, toy filling. HYGC44, 2095 for our purple dinosaur. So let's head back over to Paul. I'm going to take our dinosaur friend and let's get cracking with our purple dinosaur. And he's done a change. I'm really impressed, Paul. You've done a quick change in that hour. So we've got another, we've got a new outfit ready to go. So this is the same pattern as the shirt same, you did. Exactly the same pattern. Just so, see how different it looks with different fabrics. So you like the pattern, I'm assuming. Oh, yes, yes. Got the, got the shirt in a couple of combinations. <laughs> if you missed it this morning, um, Paul was on eight and we were doing a, the bowling shirt. So if you do like this one, we had it on the mannequin as well earlier. Um, all of the details are on that eight o'clock show. But we're doing the dinosaur in this hour. Yes, total change. Something a bit different. <laughs> yes, it's the first ever soft toy I've made. Is it really? Yes. You've never, made, never done one before? Never done one. I've stuck with garments and uh, household stuff. Curtains, duvets. Things around the house. Never done a soft toy. So, I think that's encouraging. <laughs> Maybe if you've never done a soft toy before and you yeah. think, give yeah. something else a try. Give and it a go. How did you find it then, if it was your first one? Occasionally fiddly. Um, very small seam allowances, which I'm not used to. No. And um, big hands to get into little spaces. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. I did enjoy doing it. Something a bit different yeah, and a, it, maybe a challenge. I'm surprised it took as long as it does to make a shirt. The, so, the same yeah, amount of time for yeah, a toy. It took me all day to make it as much as it takes me to make a shirt. So, <laughs> so don't, don't feel like you're going to rush through this one. But take your time, you'll get there. It's quite straightforward. And so where would you like to start in terms of putting this to, in sort of how we make this one? OK, I've... I've Pieced a lot of pieces all, all together already. Uh, I'm going to start with the spikes down the back. Okay, doke. Because um, they're the straightforward bit. I think it says to start with the body piece, uh, but the spikes need to be stitched into the seam of the body. Yeah. So if I start doing the spikes, gets them out of the way. I like to prepare all the small bits first, and then you can just... It's a case of stitching it together. Actually, Jo Carter, who does a lot of toy making on the show, she always gets, she likes to get all the little bits and pieces made. Yeah. And then when you've got them and, you know, like we've got these laid out here, then you can just go for the assembly. Yeah. But rather than having a bit and then having to stop and make something, she would always sort of make all the limbs and make all the bits and pieces yeah, and then yeah. you're, you're yeah. ready to go. I found that a better way to go then. It's literally, if it's all hand sewing then towards the end then you can just sit down and do hand sewing. Get on a roll, have a film yeah, one. you've done all your machine stuff, then you're onto your <laughs> hand sewing. Uh, so, starting with the spikes, I've done four already. You've got... You have to cut out five. OK. And they're double-sided. So, you're cutting out ten of these little, little shapes. These are... It's sew-in interfacing with these, not iron-on interfacing. Oh, right, OK. So, you're also cutting out ten shapes of your interfacing so to do these as normal sewing right sides together interfacing on each side because then they're going to be turned the other way around so you can turn those out. i've got the sew on yeah. interfacing here actually so what's the reason for that then as opposed to an iron and interfacing what's the reason for leaning towards i think this it one? just makes it a little bit softer you're not stiffening the fabric but it gives a bit of body inside the shape itself so it's going to help them stand on end like those... Because like, yeah. you need, you need to, they need to stand up a little bit, don't they, for them yeah. to, look like a, for it to look like a dinosaur, but, but without it being rigid. Without it being solid, yes. And it, it's a bit softer for kiddies to play with. And it means your spikes can go one way, then go the other way, just like they do with Derek. Is yeah, totally all over <laughs> Good the place. Good old Derek. We need some more yeah. names for getting the D. We always go for alliteration <laughs> with toys. I don't know why. We always lean towards. Oh, what did we have last week? We had the giraffe, and we were like, oh, Gerald the giraffe. Gerald, or... Yes, of oh, the fox the other day. Yes, there was a fox one. Always lots of different yeah. toys. I like the fox. The reason it got called Derek, I've got a cat called Derek, <laughs> and he's just as dozy as a dinosaur at times. So that's well, why that's, that's why we name. christened him Derek. <laughs> Nothing to do with Derek Carpenter or Derek the Dover. <laughs> <laughs> Who ever knew there were so many Derek's? There are a lot out there. So stitch it, I've probably gone a little bit too bigger on the seam allowance here because I'm so used to doing a bigger seam allowance. Literally turn it inside out. You could press these open or you could just finger press them open. 
Not and this direct. is the um, the purple uh, bundle this morning, that Paul's working with at the moment. So the blue one, which is this dinosaur here, that's on the bottom of your screens. But this bundle here with the spot on aqua and the purple is the main graphic HYGC44. So turned inside out, you can either press it if you wanted to or just finger press it. The pattern says to edge stitch, so you're getting like a contrast stitching on this. Because I think with this bundle we're getting the purple thread, aren't we? Yes, the thread's in the bundle yeah, as well. Right. You just need to buy... The pattern isn't in this bundle. This is something that you would have separately um, from McCall's. But you get three different dinosaurs within this pattern. And also, um, that sounds so funny to say, you've got three dinosaurs in here. You're going to get a, tyra <laughs> a Tyrannosaurus Rex turn up. Um, but, and the wall hanging as well. But the pattern's on the bottom of your screen there. And the, so then you're just um, top stitching this with that thread. Top stitching round. Again, that holds the spike, gives a bit more body to it. As we said about maybe top I'm stitching. About the collar, actually. Yeah, about the collar yeah. on the shirt. Trim the edges, but they're going to be sewn inside. Now, you don't have to do all the same colour with these. Mix you could have match. different colours. Yeah. You could do reversible. Yep. Could go crazy. That's right, yep. Use your <laughs> imagination. So there are your spikes. You've got, as per the pattern, you've got. Three in one colour and two in the other colour. They will be stitched into the seam down the back. One is stitched into the head, back of the head. Now, I found when I did this, I probably stitched it a little closer to where the, the head is attached to the body, so it got a little bit messy. So maybe move it a little bit further up the head. OK. Give you a bit more... So in terms of the spacing of those, allowance. that's kind of down to you where you want, where you want to yeah. put them? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So then we were going to, so then you attach those onto the body or you carry on with limb sort of assembly? These get pinned into place. So if you've got them in the right order, then you've got marking points on the pattern. So you're going to line them up. Oh, so it is marked where, to, the where to put them? Yes. Yeah. But this is where you can get inventive, put them wherever you want them. Space them evenly, but there are po marking points on there, which... Oh, that's my marking pen. Do you need a pen? Somewhere. Let's see. Oh, here you go. <laughs> One of these brilliant ones. Just marking on the points as per the pattern. You've got these big circles here. So it's telling you exactly where Which to are there transferred across to the pattern, so put one there. But I've moved a little bit further down to give me a bit more seam allowance because you've got that quarter inch seam allowance across the top where the head will be attached. So it's sort of down to you, really, your okay. call of it on. Yeah, Are you quite yeah. methodical? How, what sort of style would you... How would you describe yourself? Once I've already done a pattern... One, I tend to follow a pattern when it's new to me. Yeah. Because it does. it is done in the right order. And that's going to be the Yeah, because if you do hand. some things out of step, you, you're going to go mess. <laughs> yeah. So I did perfectly with this. I followed it exactly as it was. Then I let my imagination go and think, ah, oh, I could do that that way, I could do that slightly differently. So the first time, so, maybe play by the rules yeah. and then... Yeah. Then play around a bit and, yeah. and add different things. And then work it to suit you, because some things you might think, oh, that doesn't work for me, I'll find my own way of doing it. Yeah. So play about. Have an, even, Don't be afraid to play things. about. No, absolutely. Yeah. One goes in the back of the head. So OK. I, as I said, keep that away from your seam allowance so it just gives you a bit more room. They then get sewn inside, so the other piece will go. That looks quite That's scary, it. this dinosaur on our screens behind us. Look, no, look here, here. Uh, He's just, like, coming out to get us. <laughs> he's coming in for a hug with his arms outstretched like that. He's watching, he's watching how he's been made. Uh, shall, I, <laughs> shall I do the eyes next? Yes, because, go for it. Um, um, sorry, I interrupted no, you there. You did right. your... Um, right. So you did the spikes on the back, then you laid it... You'd pin it onto the head as well. Yeah, it says in the pattern to baste it on, but, um, yeah, pinning's as good as basting as long as it doesn't get in the way of the machine. Because when you sew the head, the other piece on, that will be inside, and then it all gets turned the right way out, and there's your spike coming out the back of the head. So that's how we're going to have it sticking up there on the top? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. So if I do putting an eye on first, because, the, again, it's all this prepare first, and then sew it all together, because you can't get the eye on when the head's already sewn up. I've never seen these before. I hadn't. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> something something new. Both of us. Yeah. Um, so I put one together thinking I'll see how they work. But once they're put together, you cannot get them apart. Ah, oh, okay. So you get, I think you get six in a pack, so good job. I had 
Well, Want to practice on? No, yeah. we'll just pretend that this was to show you. Look, yeah. see, once it's attached together, you can't take these apart. They are, that is going to be... But this comes in your bundle. You get six, I think, in there. So you've got more than enough if, yeah. you, um, if you have a play with them as well. And you, you, you know. Yeah. So what I've done, there's a placement for the eye as well. And that is the, the eye pattern piece. Yeah. So I've done a little cut in the fabric where the centre of that placement would be. Then you get the piece of felt. I've done a little cut in the centre of that. Place the two together. And that just... It really looks should. just like a regular screw, doesn't it? It actually? is, yes. It goes through that piece. It's that piece. And it depends how wonky you've been with it. And literally just push that one onto the back. Oh, and it just locks and into place. And that is your place. It locks into place. So it's not going to be pulled out by very inquisitive children. No, that's, well, that's the it, thing as well with yes. sometimes using those sort of notions for children's toys. There's a reluctance in case it's, exactly. you know, there's a choking hazard or anything, but that is... That's fixed. You, know, you that's couldn't not going, get that undone. No, you not couldn't going get anywhere. that undone. Not going anywhere. And it looks really effective. as You can see here, on, well, you can see an owl, one spying on us, but it does, it creates a really effective idea. Different to stitching, because a lot of the toys we use and that we have are sort of stitched, in, stitched on. Yeah. I think in the pattern it does say it's a sew-on button, but... We're, we're giving the uh, popper. These popper buttons, which I think are great. And they're shiny. And the, Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a little bit of something <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. This is the blue dinosaur that's on your screen at the moment. And so you get the yellow golden sunshine uh, linear look fabric. You get the red polka dot and then you get the uh, blue solid as well, plus your felt and your eyes and your stuffing and everything. And then the pattern is on the bottom of your screen, QCBR92. Again, as I said, it's got three dinosaurs in that pattern as well as the wall hanging, so you can make a whole family of them if you wanted to. Yep. I'm not very good with dinosaurs. I don't think I could name what those ones, what those different dinosaurs were. I think we've got a Brontosaurus, and we weren't sure whether that was a Stegosaurus, a the bottom one. Stegosaurus. Yeah. So, there you go. That's your uh, historical lesson for the day. <laughs> I've had quite a good history lesson with Susan, actually, on Sashko, so I can't complain. Right. That's the second one put in place. Yep. Now I just realised I've done that the wrong way. What, because you won't be able to...? Yeah, because if you now, you've got to them... I'm trying to think, I can't get my head around that, because you're going to turn it the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And it's locked in now? And it's locked in now, so... So you'd have to cut another one? Yeah, so I'd have to cut another headpiece. OK. So, again, think about what you're doing so what before you do it. So what was the lesson in that? Let's, let's just lesson make sure in that, that... Make sure you've got your headpiece's mirror image. So when it's so you obviously you're just going to go right that side together. So there now, this dinosaur is going to have one eye poking in, <laughs> one eye poking out. Okay, so he's got. That's what you get for chatting yeah. with yourself at the same time. So actually, the right. eye would need to go. You would need to let the other way round yeah. the fabric and then put the eye into place. So I might even cut that out and try and. Is this, is this one left? No. I'm going to have to do go with that. the next we're bit. Do the next anyway. bit. And we'll, we'll, we can go with wonky okay, eyes. We'll go right. with wonky eyes. Go with wonky eyes. Yeah. You, you know that that would not yeah. be what you do at home. <laughs> <laughs> you always got to get something wrong when you say yeah. that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're all human. So, sewing the head. Do a quick one on this. I quite one. like wonky eyes. Why not? <laughs> good, good. Yeah, but one completely inside out. <laughs> not quite right. <laughs> Should think about what I'm doing before I'm doing it. Hopefully we'll get some um, emails in now, which sometimes happens of other people saying and mishaps that they've had. <laughs> Share them with us, come on. Yes. Send us some pictures if you've done. Have you done wonky eyes or wonky arms and legs on a toy? What have you done? A bit like the baking show when they turned in the cakes that they've got wrong. Yes. And they, the pictures of cakes. This is what it should look like and this is what it this turned out like. This is how it turned like. out like at home. Yeah. Like the new bake-off. Yeah. I do wonder so. if they'll do another sewing bee. There was t talk ah, of it, wasn't there? But so I don't hope know. so. Really hope so. Because they were three series, weren't there? Four. four. Were there four? Yeah, we were, I was in the third one. The fourth one was televised this year. But made last year, I guess, so they would be, they're ready to do another one if they were going to do it. I, yeah, I think they would have done by now. So let's see this wonky dinosaur head. <laughs> or wonky go. eyes. <laughs> There you go. We've turned out <laughs> the right way. But I mean, you've got more than enough fabric in your more than enough fabric in your bundle. If you're at home and this happens, you can cut another head out. Yeah, and you've got or a, if you've not, got a spare eye. You could have the screw on one side. But <laughs> here, here. <laughs> you could have this on that side, and then but this is the real side. That's all right. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. 
Sewing the body, we'll do a quick one on getting these edges in. There is another body underneath. With this fabric, a yeah. solid, do you, um, is there a right side and a wrong side? What's your school of thought on that? The sort of is, and I think the only way of telling is that from the salvage edge where you've got holes going in. Yeah, as opposed to coming as out. As a hose, coming, can you turn it over, the holes are coming out, it's where they punched it down on the edge. So if they're to going... Get it going through the press. If they're going down, then that's our top, that's our right side. I'm not sure which is which. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard it to tell you. when you look at them, it's really hard to tell the difference. So, good thing is, it doesn't matter, but that's, that's where you go wrong on things like that. <laughs> so, on the body bit... Yep. Sewing along the bottom, matching that up. Leave This is where you leave the space open for stuffing the toy. So, sew along, leave a gap. Fairly good gap. Mm. It's quite you, a size you, of a toy, you, isn't it? When you're stuffing it, you're going to be stuffing all the way from there up into the top. Oh, so we don't stuff the head separately, you do that all once it's attached? I didn't when I did this, and okay. the pattern just said to stuff it all in one go. Uh, the arms are stuffed separately and the legs are. I'll hopefully get to doing those in a moment. Um, all of the stuffing's in the bundle as well, so you've got enough there to, to stuff the dinosaur. Yeah. You said it used quite a lot, didn't you, actually, because it's quite a big toy. Virtually a whole bag, so the bag that you get with it... Uh, do we get a bag with it? Yeah, you do get yeah? a bag in that bundle. Used all of that, so just pinning these in place, because I'm not going to sew these in yet. With the sew the bottom of the body and then we'll put the the belly on it. Yes, because obviously we've got the um, white the tummy way. there as well. While you just do that, I'm just going to recap those other bundles for our dinosaurs. Okay, so back in I'm just going to sew along the bottom and then, and leave a gap. then I can start pinning the body in. Okay, yeah. we'll pop back in just a second. Okay. So let's, have, let's take our dinosaur with us. Have we got the pattern as well? Let's get organised, Amy, come on. Right, OK, so, and the blue dinosaur... Oh, the most popular at the moment is the purple, which is the one we're working with at the moment, so I'll start with that one. So in your bundle, you've got a metre and a half of fabric. You get half a metre of three different um, fabrics. So you've got this turquoise crosshatch uh, linear look fabric. Then you've got the solid purple, as we were just discussing, whether there's right sides, wrong sides. And then you've got your spot-on aqua there as well, which is lovely. We're using these for the, uh, the spikes on the back of the dinosaur's body and its head. Then you've also got your thread. You've got an embroidery skein. You've got um, a 30 centimetre square of the white felt, which you can use for the eye and for the mouth. You've got those eye poppers, so you get six. I believe there are six in there. And then, you, yes, six, just double-check that. And then also you've got the um, stuffing. So, as Paul was saying, you'll use most of that toy filling. You might have a little bit left over for your stash. But that one's the most popular, HYGC44. Then next in our dinosaur race is the blue one. So this is the one we can see here, Derek. So this one is made up of our blue, um, our red spot-on and our sunshine yellow linear look fabric there. You can just see on the back. These really effective eyes and all of the felt included in this bundle too. I'll just show you these fabrics. Again, a metre and a half in total. So half a metre of your golden sunshine, half a metre of cornflower blue and half a metre of your spot on red. KEGC66. Everything you need there to make the dinosaur. You just need to add the pattern. So you've got the, um, the instructions to follow. And then, finally, we've got our green one. So we've not seen this one very much this morning. And this is a green and orange combination. So maybe actually a bit more traditional in terms of dinosaur colours. But we've got lime green. Um, so you've got a lime green spot on. Then you've got a lime green solid. Let's just move this to the side. And then you've got your bright, bold, sort of a pumpkin orange in the middle there. And then, again, your felt your bright green thread, your eyes, your skein of uh, thread, and also your stuffing, ZTGC00, and that's the green dinosaur, 1995. And I mentioned the pattern. Let me just show you, we've not looked very much at these other, obviously you've got the pattern for this dinosaur that we've got here on the table, um, but you have got two other dinosaurs here as well, so if you want to add some other ones, you've got this, uh, you can see this one at the bottom in our orange. And then you've also got Another variation of dinosaurs there, so this is your B pattern. Your A pattern there, so that's more of a, a dinosaur that stands up a little bit more. We're on single figures for the pattern now, so you will need to check out your baskets on this. And the wall hanging there as well, so perfect for a playroom 
or a children's bedroom, you could hang that on the wall or perhaps on the back of a door or anywhere you like in the... That's it. QCBR92. So as I said, single figures on the pattern. So please do check out your baskets on that or give the call centre a ring. The number is on your screen. Let's take our dinosaur back to Paul. Where are we up to? Mm. You pinning away. I'm pinning away. OK. Put that on there. We sew in the bottom and left space open. So much like if you were doing a cushion, turn yeah. three. Yeah, or any other toys if you're used to doing toys. Then you get... The belly, belly of the dinosaur. This bit. Like the belly of the beast. You always want to give it a rub, <laughs> give it a rub <laughs> don't you? It's like a Buddha. <laughs> You've got to rub its belly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Awkward one to pin in. Uh, the pattern actually says stitch around, do some ease stitching around the edge of the body bit. Yeah. Yeah, because you're trying to get, a again, different curves being sewn together. So do a little stay stitching around the edge and gather that up. I've not done that with that. And as you can see, if you go, if you get wrinkles in it, then dinosaurs have got wrinkly bellies, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. Well, actually, their skin is a bit sort of shrivelly. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Part of the character. But also, the um, felt that you get in your bundle you could use for the tummy, couldn't you? And then from a yep. sensory point of view, you've got that nice... That nice sort of a dip, Yeah, and even more so, then I think you probably want to rub yeah. the tummy if you've got the felt on there. Because all you've got to use the felt for so far is the teeth and the eyes. Yeah, so there's so you've got a, enough quite a big do, piece left To do this sort of belly. centre section. Yeah. Make it nice and soft. So, pinned in and sewn in. Um, obviously, when it turns around, that's your belly shape. So, just with that curve, like you said, easing that in. Ease really. it in, but ease it in when you're putting it through the machine as well. You may get little gathers around the edge, but to me, that's character. Yeah, that's character. all right. So, because I'm running through it quickly, I'll leave that for now. And if I do this outer edge to show the spikes being put in place. So these are inside at the moment now, these These spikes. are inside, so pin it through both layers. Let's see, I'm rushing through this. So they don't have any toys on to... the sewing bee, do they? No, 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 it's purely garments. It's um, yeah, because even when we were given the alteration challenge, it was so tempting to think, Right, I've been given a pair of curtains, what can I do with that? Oh, I'll make a cuddly toy, but no, the specification was uh, make a garment for a lady or make a garment for a man or just something to wear. Are they strict in terms of specifications and what you have to... Are you sort of quite drilled? In? On some challenges, yes, it's literally... Uh, when they did the children's one, it had to be a children's garment. When we did children's week. When... I think when we did the vintage week, it had to be uh, a lady's garment. When we were given the wetsuit, I think it could have been anything. <laughs> or, no, it's evening wear. We had to turn your wetsuit into evening wear. That is, and it's that like, is so what? tough. Why? <laughs> Why what did would you, you make? want to wear that? Oh, I made a mess. <laughs> <laughs> a complete oh. mess on that. I think I made like a halter neck one with a, like a big skirt to it. <laughs> Cut the legs off and made a skirt of it. Someone's just asked to see the pattern for the um, shirt that Paul's wearing this morning. So we had this in the show at 8 o'clock this morning. Paul was talking through some different elements and how to do the collar and different parts of the facing and the sleeves and things. So you can go back on YouTube and watch that. But the actual pattern itself is the one from Quick Sew, EFPR12. That's still available this morning for the bowling shirt in sizes small to XXL. This is um, one that Paul made. Two and a half metres of fabric is enough to make that. Lots of people saying they're going to make that for um, their sons or their partners for Christmas. And Paul's modelling it this morning. You've modelled it in two colourways. Yes, ways. indeed. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few of these in my wardrobe. <laughs> Lots of bowling shirts. So we're just turning that round we right We turn that now. inside out. Bear in mind that's still pinned, so it's not going to be quite sitting right. But that, then, is your dinosaur body. It starts to sort of... You can see it now. It's coming together. Yeah. Now, I hate to Dead. say it, but we were saying purple dinosaur. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can... Obviously, that to me is absolutely iconic of a certain dinosaur, beginning yep. with B, that we all know. Um, and, you know, with that purple combination there. Yeah. We could... So uh, it would look good. It would look good. Look. Attaching the head. I know Jo does something different. She likes to attach her head in a stronger way or something. You could actually hand sew this on. It's more secure. Or yeah. machine sew it, which is better. Or oh, not better, uh, just, just what you're different. happier doing, yeah. yeah. 
get the right side out, and that's the one with the good eye. <laughs> I love when uh, things no. go wrong. That's, yeah. what's, that's what it's yeah, all about. That's it's what it's like about. two people. <laughs> Pop that inside. No. Because you turn that right. That was turned right that way to show you how it's going to turn out. Okay. Right. Well, when you're stitching it, it will be back the other way. Just turning him in. Because you're turning that way around. Let's watch out for the pins. That's the other thing we must obviously say with children's yeah. toys, just double, if you do use pins, some people don't like to use them. And um, if you do use them, obviously just double checking before you stuff that you've got all of those pins out. So the head goes inside, right sides together. And with those spikes directionally with the spike all facing. inside, because when that gets then turned out, make sure I get this right. Very easy for you to um, to get this wrong, isn't it? If you don't... It, it is. So because this is only the second time I've made this, I'm probably going to get it now. No, you it won't get it wrong. Does it? It is that way. Read the pattern a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Read the pattern check, about check five again. times before you actually come to make it. So yes, I think that's right. Right sides will be together. So your head. Going inside is the right way round. Another way to do it, if you wanted to do it... No, I'll do it, do it the way I'm going to do it. That's what works for me. Right sides together, put the head inside. Yep. This is where my hands are too big to do toys. That's probably why I've never done toys. Really? This doesn't yeah. naturally... To me, I find them very fiddly. But that goes... You've got your centre seam at the front. So that, so you would be then sewing that into the circle. Again, ease that into fit. I just pin it into place and then we can show you how it looks when it comes around the other way. Centre up your back seam as well. There's only six patterns remaining now for our dinosaurs, so if you do want to check out your baskets on those, I know they've flown out today. QCBR92 um, is the pattern that's on your screens at the moment. Right. It's this one just here, um, 8.45. And as I was saying, you've got three dinosaurs in there. Oh, we're down to four. It's, oh, it's no. drastically dropping. So this has become a pinning masterclass <laughs> instead of a sewing <laughs> masterclass today. The yes. pattern's <laughs> going to become extinct. We're going to run out. So when you turn it... Oh. That was right. The There's no, no stress. You got that one right. <laughs> there is your dinosaur with the there head. There he is. So Lovely. He's all just pinned at the Ready moment. Ready to go. So, because I want to quickly move on to the feet. Have we got time to do feet? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK. Feet. I've prepared two already, so I'll show you those in a moment, but... Because this is again. slightly different. Sometimes the... Um, limbs are hand sewn on or yep. sometimes they're built into that main body piece yep. and with this one they are attached afterwards so you can just see here which actually gives them a different feel to how they sort of hang yeah they, Don't, move they sort of move differently when they're attached like yeah. this you can see particularly with the arms you get a bit more um he's gonna give bit you a wiggle. hug a bit, bit more of a wiggle, wiggle. They do, wiggle. and also depending how you stuff them does affect you know whether they stand or whether they hang yeah. you know quite loosely or I've really, because I made an um, elephant pin cushion for the sewing bee. Yeah. I didn't put enough stuffing in. Its legs were just going like this all over the place. <laughs> it's a good so. laying out like you do that. that. Yeah, oh, so that must have been the first stuffed toy I made. The elephant yeah. pin cushion. Yeah. Bearing in mind you've got two feet and they're going to attach to the body, one at each side. So yeah. again, get your feet pointing in the right direction. On one of them, this is the piece where you're going to be doing the stuffing through you can see on there, yeah. you're not stuffing through one of the side seams. So make sure when you're sewing it, you don't do another foot point in the same way. Oh, so you, the snip needs you to be want, an alternate yeah, size. Yeah, because that stuffing wants to be... So you've got two opposite feet like that. Yeah, so you want them into the body. Yeah. You want that because that gets hold. attached to the body, so you don't see where that stuffing is going. So they're basically going to be cut okay, on so alternate they're... pieces. So the feet are going to... Go in the right direction for a little stroll. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you just keep walking around in circles. <laughs> <laughs> no good at that all. the wonky eye wouldn't, <laughs> yeah. be, wouldn't know where it was going. Not got a lot of hope going for him as in this dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the big foot first, because you're going to then put the base of the foot on. Because if you look at that foot, it's got. It's like a pad on the like bottom. Like a rare isn't it? piece at the bottom. Yeah. You can just see here the. Um, 
So if you're happier pinning things before you sew, then pin them. If, like me, you're just quick to get just <laughs> in a rush it. to get it done, then so just go around the shape. OK. There is one little bit to snip in there. Uh, these are great snips, these. <laughs> so sharp. Slip into your uh, yeah. curves. Cut into there, because when you turn it out, you'll get that little bit there. Otherwise, it'll look all to creased. To go like into yeah. a nice curve. Now, the foot bit, the base of the foot. Again, that's another sew on. This piece doesn't look like it will fit, but it does. And that gets stitched pinned and stitched all the way around so that when you turn it all inside out it's going to end up still being able to stand up you want it to be able to yeah. stand as opposed to being a just a flat piece okay that's how you start to get more 3d sort of shape to it as well don't yeah. you really yeah so i think there's a sort of neat way of doing that if you don't stitch right to the edge you can pin this into place a bit better so you can just ease that into the seam of the actual yeah. leg so again, pin that all the way around, stitch around the bottom of that. I'm actually getting through this a lot quicker, but we're not sewing it. You get through a lot quicker than... <laughs> just just <pin> in. <laughs> Yeah, but you can't give that to Kitty saying, can you, with full of problems? <laughs> Maybe not. Awkward but idea. that's the thing as well, is there is no, you know, there isn't a rush. Obviously, we're trying to get through it to show you the main points. Yeah, because... It's an after, it's a, you know, take, take the whole afternoon to do the project or to do a few time, bits. Yes. Come back and do the legs. Come back and do, you know, just assemble the body or yeah. you don't have to do it in, in one go. No, enjoy doing it. Don't feel like you've got to rush around and do it. But if I just get this one done, you see this one. We can show the other foot. And a lot of it is hand sewing. You're, you're doing uh, applique stitching, and... which, again, was something that's quite new to me. So you've, there's a lot to learn on this. If you're coming from a dressmaking background... Some new skills. Or it's, 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 it's a nice totally way to sort of try some new things out and to yeah. some different techniques. It's funny, isn't it, as well, how you can become quite... I don't want to say pigeonholed, but if you do a lot of one thing, you know, you become very good at that thing, but it doesn't necessarily yeah. make your general sewing, you know, you, sometimes it's nice to try different techniques and to make different projects. And, or perhaps if you do a lot of quilting and toy making is very new to you, or you've not done any dressmaking because you do a lot of quilting. Or... Yeah, it's good to... Um, Venture yeah. out. Get outside your comfort zone sometimes and just try something different. But it is amazing how you can be so comfortable doing one thing yeah. and that something else can feel so alien, really. Yeah, like this. <laughs> alien <laughs> and dinosaur-like. <laughs> but that's, that's what's lovely about the show as well, is lots of people say, you know, oh, this is the first time I've ever made a toy or the first time I've ever done Sashko. Or it's, you know, it encourages people to yeah. try new things and, and different techniques and, and, and different ways of doing things, really. If you practice enough, you can get your eyes in the right way. <laughs> That's going to bother you, isn't it? More than anyone else, it will bother Paul. <laughs> well, I managed to sew the wrong seams together on the first time I was in here. See, yeah. I was making a pair of trousers and I sewed the wrong seams together, so I had to unpick those. So. But usually, as well, it's the sort of thing you would be like, I would never do that at home. It just happens because you're. See, it's like, it does remind me of the Bake Off, where, you know, if they. They've made uh, it a million yeah. times at home and then they get in and it all collapses or they yeah. didn't whisk it properly or. Or goes to pot completely. Yeah, the pressure. <laughs> So this is the turning out. I think that I don't know if that turning out tool would work so well on the foot, but uh, it's great for loops like that. To get into those. Um, yeah. Sections. Derek, so, and uh, what can we call? I need another. Mm, Donny, that's a bit boring. Derek and Donny, yeah. yeah. Derek and. Come on, people, give us some yeah. suggestions. Suggestions for dinosaur <laughs> <Deirdre>. names. <laughs> Dexter. Dexter, that's Dexter. quite a good one. Got a boisterous dinosaur. Yeah. Okay, he's got wrinkly feet, but then dinosaurs do. There we go. That, that would Lovely. be the foot, and that because got another one there. Hopefully, have I got that the right way? Oh no. You've got our feet there, ready to go. Yeah. So then we've also got arms. Would you do those before you attach anything to the main body? Yep. The arm's slightly different and they are... You, you leave a seam open at the side to stuff them. Oh, so rather than the... Rather than it. there, because the arms are more flappy, where the leg gets actually sewn onto the side. You go around the whole circle 
the, uh, the leg. So you'll sew that on, but you'll stitch all the way round. So it's more firmly fixed. Okay. The arms, they're just stitched like a half moon around. So they, they... That's why they move a little bit they more. They move a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. But again, similar way, we can stitch all the way around the outside, leave a little bit open. We've got about 15 minutes 15 or so. 15 minutes. Oh, OK. So probably get on to... Have we got any stuffing? I could start stuffing our... I don't know if we've got any here. We'll get some. I'll start stuffing okay. our leg. Oh, the stuffing? Yeah. Have you got some? Yeah. Brilliant. Good go. find magic. This massive bag of stuffing does come in your bundle, so you can, you know, as Paul said, you use quite a lot of the stuffing for the dinosaur. You might have a little bit left over. It depends because um, people stuff their, I know it sounds silly, but stuff to different amounts, don't they? You know, whether you want it really rigid or if you want yeah. it a bit more squidgy. That's the purple bundle on your screens at the moment. That's the most popular, so that's the one that you can just see being made here at the mm. moment. But then also you've got the blue, which is this one, Derek. Derek's our blue, blue dinosaur. And again, it comes with your stuffing, it comes with all your thread, it comes with your eyes, it comes with a metre and a half of fabric in um, three different fabrics. Um, so the blue bundle there on your screens with your sunshine yellow, your spot on red, HYGC44. That's the second most popular. Oh, we've got a name suggestion from Kate in Warwickshire. Morning, Kate. Dynamo. Oh, I like that That's one. a good one. I do like that she one. She says, love the show. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs> that, that is a good one. Yes. That's a, the magician, isn't it? Is that yes, a magician called of course. Dynamo? It's a magic yes. dinosaur. Toes on the feet. Oh, oh, no, on the hands. The fingers on the hands. Clip into the point where you've sewn around. You see where all the stitching is on that because the stitching's a good, different contrast. Clip right into that point. Oh, you're going right up. Yeah, to, yeah. Going right up into that. And like I did with the shirt earlier, I'm Meeting going to cut two. right double across the point of the sewing. Yeah. Uh, careful you don't come too close to the edge of that. And across again. So that when you turn that through, you've got you can really push those points out Use, to yeah, make the make fingers. Them. So yeah, you get this so. sort of look rather than you just being a rounded... Yeah, rather than just being a rounded hand. Like a claw or a... Yeah. <laughs> More of a claw here on our dinosaur. Yeah. So really get into those three points. What would you do without it? Everybody uses these dobbers. Oh, I know. They're such a... And it's such an, like, you know, an easy, obvious thing, but you do need something to get right into those little fiddly bits. I use knitting needles. Do you? Yeah, but not one as big as this. <laughs> about a seven mil. It always shocks me quite how much stuffing you can fit into the... You I'm just, surprised you with just that. Keep go, it just keeps yeah. taking more. You can go yeah. more and more and more. So again with that... <laughs> Producer Hannah said she's like that with food. She can just, <laughs> <laughs> just keep eating and eating. <laughs> it's amazing how yeah. much, yeah. Just when you think, you're, in there. you think you're full, you can I'll tell always... You what, I, always I, like, I always biscuits. think as well, oh, dessert tummy. I fully believe that's a different stomach. I oh, could be full totally. up, yeah. but I can always make room for dessert. Always, yeah. Chocolate cake, I have mm. to say I've got a sweet tooth. Tiffin. Yes. Tiffin at the moment. Tray bake. Mm. Oh, do, you uh, yeah. do you bake? <laughs> yes, do I do you? some baking, yeah. So do I. It's not good. Well, it is good, but it's not good at the <laughs> same time. It's enjoyable, it's <laughs> enjoyable. OK. So, right. do you want to... We can show how you attach those, or do you think it would be nice to show the how we're going to do the um, the head with the mouth? What would you rather do? Yeah, how we do the head. Let's let's stuff the head. Do you so. stuff it before you do the mouth, then? Is that the Yes. Head? Yeah. Yeah, because then you've got the shape of where you're going to put, put the mouth. You, are, you have got a placement on the pattern piece. Oh, yeah. You see there, it's actually giving you a line for the mouth. Uh, for the mouth. You could make a happy dinosaur, sad dinosaur. Grumpy so, one. Grumpy one, yeah. yeah. You could do two rows of teeth. Yeah, you could have, like, coming together, couldn't yeah. you, if you wanted to? Yeah, that'd to. be good to do. Open yeah. mouth, two rows of teeth. You could even do... You, yes, you could have two curves, actually. I quite like that. Yeah. You can see it here. This is our one. So do you stuff so, the dinosaur as well before you do the... Um, you attach the feet and hands? Yes. Or arms, I should say. Yeah, so if you put another row... Underneath there, how does that look? But if you had the teeth going down, that would look cute. <laughs> he'd look like he's... He's, he's got ah, about to bite. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, he's maybe not so child-friendly. No. He's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. Yeah, you'd, you'd stuff the head first. So, you want to have a go at stuffing that? Um, 
What do I need to do? I can just sit and watch you stuff. So would you now. just stuff the head before you do the... Um... <laughs> no, I stuffed the whole body and then I did the applique round or the blanket stitch around the edge of the eye. OK. Would you use this to push that in? Shall I grab this yeah. And then also a blanket stitch around the edge of the mouth. Because actually you for you're falsely led to believe we've already done the eye because that popper's in place, but yeah. the, the felt <laughs> the isn't actually attached yet, is it? Yeah, They're yeah, laughing the, at me the, saying falsely <laughs> led to believe. <laughs> That's a very dramatic way of describing the eye. Because the felt is curling away there, so you, again, you could put black around the edge of that and it's, look, it's got eyelashes. Yep. So you could use black embroidery thread. I think the white comes with the kit. Uh, you just play about with it. Use your colour matches. So uh, you, you're left with a lot of different colours in the fabrics to do whatever you want. You could to put, mix and match them if you wanted you to. You could sew spots onto them before you start doing the stuffing. One of the everything. ones on the pattern actually has got spots on. You can yeah. see here, um, you know, you can mix and match the fabrics wherever you want, or you might have something in your stash that you want to incorporate. Or, but it does look quite cool. And also, you can see the um, stripy tummy on this one here. You know, if you want to mix and match your. This one's not got a mouth at all. Oh. How do you eat he's, he's not happy or sad. Or, I don't oh, know how he's going to eat, how's he gonna eat tiffin. <gasps> that's no good no at all. No tiffin for that dinosaur. No good at all. <laughs> so once you put enough stuffing in there that you're happy with, if you've got a floppy-headed one, then the mouth just gets pinned into place. So you can do happy or sad dinosaur, whichever you, have, whichever whichever you, you want to. And then just stitch around all the edge of that. So let's give the give them the right eye. <laughs> and with the stitching, you, this wasn't done on a machine. You did this. No, this by is hand. this is hand stitching. So it's a blanket stitch. Um, I'm here. Thread it up already. That's it there. So I know a lot of sewers will know blanket stitch already, but that was one again I had to learn today from this. So, do you want to do it on the good eye side? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use my good eye as well. That'll be useful. <laughs> Just in case. So you're going in through the felt. Not sharp enough needle. Oh. Actually, that is a good oh, with felt. Do, would you usually use a different needle? Obviously, it's thicker than a cotton, or it's um. <laughs> I guess it just depends. It is thicker, but I've just used, um, it is a tapestry needle I oh, okay. used there because that was good enough to get all the thread through. So, blanket stitch, remove all your bits out of the way. And you could split the thread as well, actually, if you didn't want to go for such yeah. a thick, you know, if you wanted it to be three-stranded as opposed to six. Yeah. The blanket stitch, bring your thread across, go back into the felt, back out to the fabric underneath and tuck that under your needle. So that when that comes through, Starts to that lock is it your into edge place. stitch. And I think I just did one stitch down each edge and then one at the point. So go into the point there, back out through the fabric. Looping it under. Wrap it round. We might be able to get a tutorial as well, actually, for and the um, blanket stitch, if we've got back one. Out. <laughs> that is your starting thread so that can get tucked underneath and then you just follow that all just the follow way that around. all the way around the zigzag and then go all the way around the eye as well so you're going to go into the felt come out through the fabric get a sharp enough needle wrap around the needle Again, by this point, Bring this is quite nice because you can have this on your lap and be doing yeah, this you know, so in I was the garden doing, I was or... doing this watching telly at the same time so Do then you, you can get as neat as you want, but come into the other point, one stitch, back out to the point, one stitch, back into the, the gums. Yeah, so just taking one around each sort of... Um, yeah, each I found that, that triangle, worked, really. so do one in the centre there, do one into the, the gum, but pin it in place before you go and then you know where you're aiming for, or glue it. Yes, you could use you fabric glue if you yeah, wanted to. Yeah, fabric glue, get it into place, it just holds it there while you're... You're doing the sewing so, to baste it in. Yeah. So then we. Do, so once you've done the mouth, then you just carry on stuffing. Carry on stuffing. Then arm gets sewn on again. You've got placement for the arms. All marked on our pattern. There. 
So that one's for the arms, that one's for the legs. And this is what you were saying about with the legs, it's going all the way. You're stitching around. all the way around that circle with the arm. You're just stitching round that Whereas outer edge to allow arm it. arm is yeah. giving it a bit of mobility there. You allow it a bit more flap. So it can actually move. that one goes there. Because it's... We've only got two patterns left, so please do check out your baskets on that if you Quick. do want it. Um, but this, so the arm will just be a halfway, so you can move it around oh. like this. Whereas with the leg, it's all the way around, so that's a bit more rigid, so it allows it to stand up, actually. If it yeah. wasn't, it would probably be doing the splits, wouldn't it? Yeah, on the that's table. why I've stuffed quite a lot into that leg. Yeah, to keep it. To do that. And that, the stuffing in the tail will also give it the third point of balance. And just to confirm, you'd stuff all of this before you started attaching the arms and legs. Yeah, you they're the last thing that. to go they're on. They're the last I thing. Did, uh, the, the arms, the top arms, the arm, top arm, not as bad as the bottom <laughs> arms, the top arms and the legs, and then I did the applique around the... So you actually did this last, yes, the mouth? Yes, that was the last thing to be done, the mouth. And then sew up where you've stuffed that, and that's a simple ladder stitch to sew all that up. Just to, come, just to pop it all into place. Yeah. Producer Hannah's saying, I wonder if you could use this as a doorstop. If you're obviously not for children, but if you <laughs> wanted to stuff it with more, you know, or with um, heavy beads Weighty. or with weighted... I think um, dishwasher salt, some people say, because then it smells nice That's and good. you get that weight. Yeah. You could, there's nothing to stop you having that as a doorstop. Yeah. Stand, it stands up quite nicely yeah. on its bottom arms. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Very good. So that's the end of our dinosaur then. Use, so you use that okay. pattern, um, obviously, the actual pattern itself has got all of your instructions in there anyway, yep. as well as the pattern pieces for cutting out. Yep. Um, are you back again soon, Paul? I think I'm back on Friday. Friday? Yes. I think I'm here on Friday. Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, great. I'm going to take the dinosaur with me. And um, also, maybe I'll see you Friday then. Okay. Well, I will see you Friday. There's yep. no maybe about it, unfortunately. <laughs> you will see me Friday. Look forward to that. Lovely. Thank you so much, you Paul. Then. Let's have Bye. a look at these. So... We are looking at these different uh, bundles that we've got for the dinosaurs this morning. Three different colourways. Um, the most popular one, which one's most popular? It's still our purple. Let's start with that one then. So you've just seen that one there that Paul was making. Um, a metre and a half of fabric in total. So you've got half a metre of your aqua spot on. And I mean, we use this for the spikes of the dinosaur today. You could make the body of the dinosaur using this if you want to. You've got equal amounts of all of these fabrics. So, you know, it's completely up to you how you choose to combine them. But to coordinate these, you've also got the purple. And you've also got the linear look crosshatch fabric there in the uh, turquoise as well. And then combined with that, you've got 30 centimetres square of your felt. So this can be used for the, uh, for the little tummy here as well. So that gives it a nice, a nice sort of different touch if you want to have that different feel to it. So that's your felt. Then you've also got your um, eye, your popper eye. So you can see here you actually get six. So you've got enough here for, for extra toys if you've got some other fabric and you're going to make a couple of the dinosaurs. Then you've got your skein of thread and you've got the, um, uh, the actual thread as well to, to assemble the dinosaur. And then you've got the bag of stuffing too. So everything you need there to make it, you just need to add the pattern. HYGC44, the purple is the most popular one this morning. And next up, next in line, is our green dinosaur. So let's have a look at that. So this is a bright lime green one, teamed with a bold orange. So you've got a spot on green here, and um, your spot on lime. Then this is really bright, half a metre of our bold orange. I'd actually be tempted to maybe do the body of the dinosaur in the orange. And then you could have green spikes and a green, um, the green tummy. And then you've got the lime green solid there too, half a metre of that. Again, with your thread, so that matches beautifully, all coordinating really well. Again, your felt, your eyes um, and, and your thread and the stuffing too. So again, everything you need there. ZTGC00 is our green dinosaur, 1995. And finally is our blue dinosaur. So this is my dinosaur, Derek the dinosaur, that's sitting next to me here. So we've got Dynamo, and this is our Derek. And this one here is teamed with a yellow and a red that you can just see coming through on the spikes. But again, there is nothing stopping you mixing and matching these. If you wanted to do the main body in the red spot on, or perhaps in the yellow, and use the blue somewhere else, then you can. Um, because as I said, it is half a metre of each of these fabrics. So I'll show you those. Again, all of your bits and pieces that you need. But the um, golden sunshine yellow linear crosshatch fabric. I love these linear looks. They just look, give a little bit more depth and interest than the plain solids. 
then the cornflower blue. My tummy just rumbled. That's because Paul was talking about tiffin. I'm going to blame Paul for that. You can't talk about baking. I've still got an hour to go. And then we've got the red spot on fabric there as well. KEGC 66. And that's the, for the blue dinosaur. We've only got one left of the pattern for our dinosaur today, so lots of you loving this. Please do send us pictures when you finish making it. And it's not just this dinosaur. There are also two other dinosaurs in there um, and the wall hanging as well, but we'll just quickly show you that. If you've got it in your basket, that's going to be the last one there this morning. Now, also, we've had loads of messages in this morning about the shirt that Paul was wearing. If you weren't here at eight o'clock with us, Paul made the bowling shirt on the show, so you can always go back. We put everything, all of our shows go up onto YouTube, so if you did miss anything, you can always go onto YouTube and watch the show there. Really great tips and hints of how to, how to make the shirt. Um, he went into detail of how to create the collar, um, inserting the sleeve, looking at the facing as well. EFBR12 is the pattern. There's the bowling shirt you can see there, and that's in the um, Anne's range fabric. But everything from today's show is on the website. I'll just show you how you can add those to your basket if you want to. So if you go to sewingquarter.com and you missed any of the earlier shows, that bowling shirt is there for you to buy. So just under the live feed of today's show, if you scroll down, there it is. So there are our dinosaur bundles. Then we've got all of our Sashko fabrics and needles and the book from Susan there. And then we had some fabric options this morning for the shirt. The most popular fabric was the elephant cotton on a cruise. So it's the red elephant that flew out this morning, 355 per half meter. It's a great price. Two and a half meters of fabric you need to make the shirt. And then the bowling shirt pattern is also in that shopping list. If you scroll down below, you'll be able to add that to your basket there if you want to do that. And also, you can always give the call centre a ring. So the number on your screen, 0800 112 4433. If you want to say, oh, I love the shirt Paul's wearing, where, where's the pattern for it? They can, they can send you in the right direction. Also, if you've got any questions in the next hour, I'm joined by Susan Briscoe, who's the author of the Ultimate Sashko um, book that we've got in, in the next hour. So we're going to be looking at that, looking at the Japanese technique all over again. So get your questions in for Susan. This is the time to ask. Don't go anywhere. We've got some projects and some bundles to look at with Susan in this next hour. And we'll be back in three minutes. Grab a cup of tea. We'll see you shortly. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter for more inspiration, top tips, news, and share your own creations with us. Did you know there are multiple ways you can contact us, even if it's just to ask a question? Our friendly team are always on standby. You can call our customer service team at 0800 112 4433, email us at help at sewingquarter.com, Visit our Facebook page. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter at Sewing Quarter and even message us through our website and our presenters will answer your questions live on air. I'm going to be showing you how to do a hem stitch. Now, a hem stitch is just a row of small slanting stitches that are used to secure your hem. So in this case, I'm pretending that this is going to be the bottom of a trouser leg. I'm first going to take my needle through the single hem. I'm going to leave a little bit of a tail before I place that back down. So then I'm going to do a double stitch. Now, this is just where you sew over the same area twice, so you're creating a, a knot. So that's one, two. So that's securing my thread now. And now we can begin doing our hem stitch. So you're gonna need to bring your needle in at a diagonal. So you wanna pick up a few stitches from what would be the trouser leg before then going into your hem. So you can make this stitch a little bit bigger and then repeating that process again at a diagonal. I'm going to be picking up a few stitches of the trouser leg and then we can pick up more of the single hem. So I'm making these stitches super big so you can see what I'm doing but when you do this at home you'd want to make these a little bit closer together. So 
there's my row of hem stitching and if I just turn this over you can see they're very small stitches on the other side so if you're doing this in a normal thread and not a thick thread you won't be able to see those at all. Britain's favourite sewing show is coming to London and we'll be there with bells on. The Great British Sewing Bee Live is taking place over four days from the 21st to the 24th of September at XL London. If you're a hobbyist dressmaker who's been inspired by what you've seen on the Sewing Bee, a seasoned professional looking for new ideas, or just fancy taking dressmaking up for the first time, this is the event for you. We are proudly sponsoring the Demo Theatre with live performances from designer, author and former Sewing Bee contestant Jennifer Taylor throughout the weekend. And with our discount code SQD, you'll get £1.50 off your ticket. So what are you waiting for? Grab your tickets now and join the buzz at the Great British Sewing Bee live this September. Good morning, welcome back. I'm joined by the lovely Susan Briscoe in this hour and we're looking at Sashko again. So she's actually the author of the Sashko books that we've had here at Sewing Quarter before. If you've not seen the technique or if it's something that's new to you or perhaps you've seen the books previously and you, you didn't know where they came from, Susan's here today talking us through all of the, uh, the process for that and some of the history behind this Japanese style of stitching. Now, in this hour, we've actually got a bundle that we've put together with one of Susan's books. Now, this one is the Simple Sashko. So what's lovely about this is it's all about introducing uh, different projects from the book with different, we've, we've bundled it with some fabric today so you could do a wall hanging that's taken from this. Now there are eight different projects in this book. I'm just going to show you this to start with as the book comes with all of these bundles this morning. Beautiful designs. You can just see here this, this, with this traditional style. But first of all, talking you through getting started with your tools and Lots of the things that um, Susan's actually talking about this morning with the fabric markers and using the different, you know, things to mark out your grid marks. So this book is bundled with fabric this morning. So there are four different fabric bundles. We'll look at the book and we'll start with, um, with looking at some of these different bundles and how they've been put together. So first of all, we've got a bundle here. Each of these have a metre and a half of fabric. So this is for a scarlet denim wall hanging. You get a metre of one fabric, half a metre of the other. So you actually get a metre of that scarlet denim. So this is a much thicker fabric. It's got a really lovely, as Susan was just saying, actually, a, a rustic feel. It's, got a, it's still um, lighter than a traditional denim, but it's a, a much thicker fabric. You can see if I turn it sideways than your um, cottons. And then it's paired with a thread and also a skein. So you can do, um, you can do obviously, that traditional Sashko stitching. And it's also paired with the book. So I'm going to show you what these bundles have been put together for. Let me show you the wall hanging. This is the wall hanging. So this is why you'd need a metre and a half of fabric so you could create this and start to introduce these stitches into a project, into something that's usable, whether that's for a workroom or your sewing room. So also for the wall hanging, the next bundle you've got is a blue bundle. So um, as Susan was saying, you know, a lot traditionally using indigo fabrics, that was the rule, that was the law um, for, for Sashko and for, for making. So we've got here a really lovely deep navy. That's your linen look fabric. And then paired with a solid blue there as well. And you can see here your blue thread. You get a metre of this darker linen look fabric. So a very traditional bundle here for Sashko. Again, paired with the book and the thread. We're very limited stock on that one. So please do be aware if that's the one you like, check out your baskets, NNGC22. Then another red option, we've got a linen look uh, red fabric here and then paired with a red solid and your red thread again and your white skein of course and the book. And this book's not available on its own this morning, we've only got this in the bundle. So the red wall hanging, 24.45, a metre and a half of fabric there with your book, IBGC00. And your final bundle is another, this is another uh, denim look fabric, but again, this is 100% cotton. It's slightly lighter in weight than that rustic red one. Um, paired with a blue solid. So you can just see, it's a very traditional looking denim, actually. 
but it's very lightweight denim from Art Gallery. 39.45, this is paired with a blue thread, the simple sash coat book again. Now this book again, so Simple Sashko, this is by Susan Brisker, who we have here in the studio this morning. It's only available in the bundles today. If you miss her earlier show, she was also on at, let me think back, nine o'clock this morning. Um, well worth going back, and we, we talked a lot about the history of the technique, where it came from, how Susan became sort of introduced to it, and why she started doing it. But let's have a quick look at the book itself. Just the type of projects that are in here. So not only talking you through the technique, holding your hand through how to actually make it and to, to use it, but um, how to in, you know, actually start to apply it to different things that you could use. Let's just hold that up so you can see a little bit more. So here's your basic technique. But this, this is really about the projects. So you've got greetings cards. We'll ask Susan some more about this in a second. Page turning upside down is harder than it looks. Then you've got the blue sample cushion. I don't know if you can just see here, I'm trying to stop the light from catching it there, but you can just see really lovely ornate stitching detail. Nice thorough diagrams talking you through all the step-by-step -step instructions for that. Here you can start to see how it looks. It looks like the blue bundle is going to sell out, so you will need to check out your baskets on that. You've got coasters and table mats. Let's just skip forward a little bit. There are your coasters again. This is the wall hanging. So this is what we've bundled these fabrics for this morning. So we're going to be looking at how to create the wall hanging and using that Sashko technique. And then you've also got some samples. These are gorgeous that you could frame and you could hang up, you know, in different areas around the house. Really, really beautiful. I have to say, I do love it on that traditional blue background. It's such ornate. And there's another wall hanging there as well. You'll notice the, um, we've got a beautiful quilt with all different samples stitched into it behind us. As when I go over and meet Susan in a second, you'll be able to see that. But the wall hanging, not to be confused, the one that we've bundled is this one. Let me just show you once more. This one here, so it's got three pockets, so it's perfect for a sewing room, perhaps if you wanted to, you know, store bits and pieces. You can see here we've got embroidery hoops and different things all in there. But let's take this over to Susan. So we've got those four different bundles, two red options, two blue options, and all of those coming with the book, with your thread, with your embroidery scheme. And the navy bundle, this one here, really, really popular. Looks like that's going to sell out, so please do check out your baskets, NNGC22. So, Sashko with Susan Briscoe, we are back. Hello. Let's have a look. We've got, I've ended up with three books, three of your books here on the desk now. Look, we're all lined up. We're stealing them from you. Lots of copies. So, so obviously we looked at the ultimate yes. book in, your, in the other hour. Was this the, which book did you do first? Ultimate Sashko source book actually came first. That was your first one. Um, this one we done, we've done quite recently. Um, I did have another Sashko book out after Ultimate, which is now out of print. And we went back to that. We took some of the projects from that. There's, I think there's actually two projects from this one, this one that's also in this book. But I rewrote the instructions for Complete Beginners and we redid the diagrams and made it a little bit easier to follow. Um, so, yeah, that, that was the start of this one. So this one is ideal for beginners, you would it say? It is. It was really, really aimed at the beginners. So if someone that hasn't maybe done the technique yeah. before or is new yeah. to it, this is a hold your hand through the step-by-step -step it, it process. Does, it, does, it does do that very, very much. And actually with those bundles that you've got, as you were talking about them just then, I was quickly riffling through the book and looking at the exact fabric quantities that were used for that pocket hanging. And I thought, they'll be able to make some of the coasters and some of the other little projects out of that. Oh, so you could have enough left over to they, do... I think they will... Yeah, I think they would need to get maybe another thread. Um, but they would have enough with the fabrics to do some of the smaller projects as well. Those lovely little coasters, mm. I don't know if you can see those in the book, but they're really gorgeous. They'd look mm. lovely, you know, on, a, on the dining room table. Or, but we see a lot of the blue. It's, it's, it's nice as well if you the want blues, to do... It's very traditional. The, re the red. Yeah. Yeah, the red's lovely. I was just, I was looking at those before and thinking how gorgeous they were. You said rustic, didn't you? That was the yeah, words rustic. you used to describe it. Yeah. But this was the quilt I was referencing, mm. if you did miss earlier. So many different techniques have been incorporated into this, you know, the different Sashko techniques. Which is your favourite? Oh, Put you on the spot now. That is, that is really, really difficult to say which one is my favourite. Um, mm. 
You really have put me on the spot. Do you want to think because about that there's, one? there's so many patterns that are just gorgeous. Sometimes you, you, you can't just do one pattern. You've got to do another one and another one, another one, which is actually what I did with that little pocket hanging I'm going to demo in a mo, because I, I couldn't just put one pattern on it. I've actually put um, three different patterns on the front of that. Let's look at that then. It, let's it have a progresses look. from one pattern into another. So let's really talk about this. If you see here, you can yeah. see those three different patterns. Yeah, you can. You see at the bottom, we've got a single row of the Shippo design that I showed you earlier, the interlocking circles. We've got yes. that. And at the top, we've got actually two slightly different variations of the Sagaiha pattern. That was the clam type that, one we looked at, it wasn't looks, it? It looks almost like a clam shell. It's actually an ocean wave. And there's two slightly different versions of that. And then in between them, there's another pattern that also works with the same size circles, the same grid, and that's called Nawaki, and it means grasses. And it's actually grasses bending in the autumn wind. I love so, that there's a story behind yeah. it. I'm, I'm a sucker for a story. I do love sort of a yeah. bit of history and yeah. why. And so how do we do this? How do we, how do we, well, what how I, do we get what started? What I've done to start off with, this is basically the pocket, the front of the pocket from that panel, because the, the panel has got pockets in. You can put things inside it. Um, and it gives you all the sizes in the book anyway, but it is actually 10 and a half inches across. And what I've done while I marked the pattern, out, I folded it double. So you see, that is, that is actually the full pocket. OK. Um, just so I could locate the top line for my design. Where you want it to And sit. I'm going to mark the whole lot on that for you right now. Um, is when... this, sorry, just to clarify, mm, for the yes. bottom, the main bottom panel, yes. or for these smaller ones, this is for this main, this main that pocket is, at the This bottom. is the big one at the bottom. OK. Yeah. And then you've got the two smaller ones above that. Um, they're made the same kind of way. In other words, you've got a single piece of fabric that's folded in half for the front of the pocket. I'm only going to, when I stitch those, by the way, I only stitch through one layer and then I fold them afterwards. But I find it's easier to mark them with the fabric folded in half because you know where the top of the pocket is. That makes and sense. And you don't get it in the wrong place. You as know? you said earlier, it is much easier to just stitch through that one layer as oh, opposed absolutely. to multiple. absolutely. And the much, finished much size of this is um, 14 and a half inches by 11 and a half inches. That's the finished size of the wall hanging. So we're looking at this front pocket to start with. You are. And, if, and if, you're, if you're wondering why I made it to this size, it was so you can put A4 paper in it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so you could fit... This, I don't know if that's A4, but that was, that's you know... That's not, but that's... It's a little bit smaller than A4. But I, I had this crazy idea that I would have this hanging up next to my computer printer and I'd have some sheets of paper in it. Just ready and of to course, go. I never have. I've always got it in the workshop box or something, but yeah, that was the idea and I thought I could, I could do that. And the top pockets are big enough to put envelopes in. Oh, so it's like a little, it could be like a stationary holder. It could be like a stationary holder. Yeah, Lovely you, you for could, the office. <laughs> you could pop those in, you could, put, um, you could put some pens in the top pockets and things as well. Yeah. All different bits and yeah. pieces. Yeah. So, all, so all part of trying to be super tidy, which I'm not. <laughs> We will be organised. We will make ourselves organised. We'll just Absolutely. so nice things to Absolutely. be organised. It's the illusion. So, so again, we're using the grid marking that we were looking at before. If you missed earlier, Susan talked about yep. the process of marking that up using yep. either um, the hair marker or the sew line pencil, yep. um, which is what you're going to use now. Well, I decided to use the sew line because I thought um, earlier on it probably looked a bit clearer on camera. Um, you can see. And also because, um, unlike the, the white marking pen I was using as well, because you can see this line the minute it's actually marked, so I can go a little bit faster with it, which I thought was a good idea. Lovely. Um, the template that I'm using, this circle, is actually two and a half inches, and the top of the pattern, of course, has the Sagaiha design, so I've got the clamshells, and the clamshells for that, it has, it has two lines, so I'm going around the middle as well. I could have just used a smaller one, but I thought... Do it in Easier one go. To just sit in yeah, because I'm trying to show you this very quickly because it's another technique I want to show you for marking. And I want to get it all done in the hour. So I've got to um, put my skates on. The time on there. goes quick, doesn't it? It's it, so hard it, to get carried away. It goes quick when you're enjoying yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's because, as well, I'm, well I'm, genu I'm naturally so inquisitive anyway, but I ask, I'll probably maybe ask questions, it slows things down. But No, not at all, not at all. Um, you know, it's, it's fun talking about it, but it's, it's just so quick to mark something like this. So that's my first line of Sagaiha. Uh, I always think with these patterns, it looks really nice if you start with a whole curve there. I mean, yes, you could have started that way, but... To have just, the complete curve. It just sort of looks nice at the top. It you know, complete. it looks a bit more finished. Um, I'm just being fussy now, aren't I? So no, I think it's nothing, no different to sort of fussy cutting a fabric, is it really? It it's, isn't. It's, it's, it's picking and choosing It's showing your it off rather nicely, yeah. Now, also today, we've never had them on the show before and we've managed to get them in um, and they, they can be quite difficult to get hold of. We've actually got the Sashko needles, so we've got yeah. two different um, types of needles. These have been they so, so popular this morning. I'll show you, first of all, this pack of eight needles. So these are the slightly smaller ones. 
These are the ones that you would use, um, you know, perhaps more regularly. The smaller ones would be great for this, actually, because you've got the curves. So for curves. And you're, and you're changing are... directions. I find them easier to use for that, yes. I so do. that's the pack of eight needles there from Clover. And these are new to us today, and, and what Susan was saying is that they don't bend easily. They're really, you know, we're definitely going to be reordering these because they're flying out. But also they're we've fantastic. got um, the slightly longer needles as well, which are great if you're doing lots of straight lines, yes, you said. Yes, it uh, is. Perfect. And these are the ones that you said are slightly more tricky to get hold of. Simply because a lot of shops here don't bother to stock them, I think. Um, it's funny, isn't it, how a technique can... Is I that just them. because it's perhaps a technique that's not that well known, or...? I, I really have no idea no. why um, a lot of the shops only get the, the smaller size ones rather than the big over here. I have no, no. Not a clue. Not a clue. I, I like the long ones, you see, as well. But We're going to start a Sashko. <laughs> Everyone's going to go on a mission now to start yeah. tr trying it. They're, they're very, very useful. But if I was doing, you know, a pattern like this one where I'm changing direction a lot and I've got the curves... Oops, I put that line where I shouldn't have done so. It's a good thing with this. You can just rub it out, can't you? Oh, there you go. We've had a message good. from Polly. Let's have a look. Oh. Uh, morning, Polly. Um, morning. Bought the hair marker. Can you use it for all the pattern marking? Just loving this show. Many thanks, Polly. You're the hair. <laughs> yes. yes um, you can. I, I find the hair is best, actually, again, straight lines. Um, but you could... Oh, what have I done with it? You could actually use it around a curve. Not a very tight curve, where you're going around the coin like I did before. That would be a bit tricky. But you certainly could use it around this. Oh, yes. I can see that. I don't know yep. if the camera can see it, but yeah, I, no, you can, I can see certainly it. see it. You can see um, it. I hogged this marker earlier on because I thought it was picking up better on the camera so people could see what I'm doing. The little bit I'm working on now, this is the Nowaki pattern. This is the, the grasses. Um, Irene's also messaged in and asked, oh, yeah. what, um, in terms of the circle template, I know you mm. said um, you mentioned a Pringles lid earlier, didn't <laughs> yeah, you? Yeah, did. that <laughs> you know, That would be uh, perhaps ideal. That was for the eight-inch circle, wasn't it? That was eight centimetres. Eight centimetres, eight sorry. Centimetres, if you want to work metric. Um, another thing you can do... Is Otherwise, you... that's the biggest Pringle I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's not. No, it's, it's eight centimetres. That, that just happens to be the size of a Pringle lid. It's just, yeah. a, it's just a bit of a joke, that. We found that out when I went to teach once in Germany and they wanted to work metric, and I thought, I can't use my regular templates, what can I use? So I went around measuring things I could find in the kitchen and I discovered that the Pringles lid was, was eight centimetres, which, of course, was great for them because they, they had metric rulers and everything. Um... So coins are obviously good for smaller ones. Coins, you, you can go around the kitchen. I mean, people used to do this years ago. When you look at old pieces of Sashko as well, it's obvious that they, they use things like kitchen dishes and stuff like Tea that. Teacups or just sort yeah, of... Yeah, rice, rice bowls, anything. Um, you know, this is what people used to do over here as well. I mean, I, I bought these years ago at a quilt show um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty useful, really. Or you we'll could... have to try and get some in. We will. We'll have to find, try and find out um, who actually made them. But nowadays, there's a lot more... Um, templates, I think, available than they used to be. So you're bound to find something we'll really see. good. We'll see. We'll find something for yeah. you, Irene, you, if you, you don't want to use the you could, lid. Um, you could also get some, you know, that template plastic. I don't know. Do yes, you have that? Yes, that you can cut yeah? yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's a good cut idea. It yourself. And you can get a little circle cutter. Yes, we have those too. Oh, you have those? <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Well, you see, if you have that, you can make the circles to any size that you want. Um, you know, it's you could cut that sheeting and just create a circle if you wanted yeah. that plastic yeah, template. You, you can cut to whatever size you like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a, a bag that's actually in the first Sashko book where for the fabric I wanted a, a large scale check and I ended up using Ikea tea towels. Oh, really? So um, I had to cut my own templates for that because they ended up being something like two and seven eighths of an inch. And all sort of some sort of a really weird size, yeah. So I did that, you know, with the, with the, um, the circle cutter. I'm just going to put the, um, the shipper design along the bottom and then I'm going to go back and finish off the Nowaki because the Nowaki has little grasses growing on it. There is actually a piece of that on the quilt behind us as well. It's... Is that one up there? Oh, yes. Can we'll you see that? Yeah. It looks so like actually, we're combining two of these here, but you can see these... Um, the grass. But in the wall hanging, I'll show you it in here. So this oh, yes, book is bundled do. with all of these this morning. And um, so you've got, a, you've got a metre and a half of fabric to yeah. make the wall hanging and the book. Uh, let Which me find the right Which is more than enough fabric. You'll be, you'll be able to make some of the little projects in it as well. The denim and blue bundle is still available. It's just very limited on stock. Oh, the navy and linen one has sold out. Um, but the red ones are still available as well. And that scarlet denim too. That's lovely. But you get the book, you get your thread, you get your um, skein of embroidery thread as well for the actual sash coat um, stitching. And then you've also obviously got a metre and a half of fabric there. 
and this is the uh, pattern that we're drawing out at the moment. So, once you, so now you're going to do the grass section. Yes, um, you're using the same circle, pop it down there so the circle is actually right against that grid line. Can you see that? Yes, that's just... Oh, yeah, yeah, we can. Super. And I've eyeballed this at the top. That's about a quarter of an inch down. So first of all, I'm going to draw a line from the middle down to there. That's my long bit of grass. OK. Yeah. And then, again, move the template down a little bit more. You're still pivoting on that point. And that's my short bit of grass. I haven't gone all the way up to the line now. I've Is it always it just short. two blades? It's always just two. Always two. Yeah, yeah. Because when you come to stitch it, what you'll actually do, well, I'll get to the other side, for obviously, you'll go from, from there. But you would go up the short grass, strand across the back, down the long one, over the top. Oh, and that's okay. the way you move along that pattern, you see. And that's going to stop you, as you were saying earlier, ending up with too much bulk in any one place. Yeah. Because then if yeah. you have a lot of stitches in one area, that area then becomes much more raised and it's going to yeah. wear more quickly at a exactly. different rate. Exactly. So you want it to be fairly, fairly yeah. flat and yeah. uniform. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's my first little row of grasses. Obviously, what happens down here... Um, have I, got a little, I don't know if I've got a little piece with this stitch. No, I've got the piece up on there, which I can't turn around and show you the back, unfortunately. But um, where, you're, where you're going up here and then down here and then over there, it means that you're going in and out of the fabric very, very close down here. And you do actually bring all the stitching lines down into that point. You don't, you don't sort of blend two lines together. No, so they, you keep they, them as individual strands. They come as individual ones. But, of course, you can't go in and out the same hole. No. So you have to stagger where the little um, row of stitches ends. And that's why, as well, you're going along one and then you're going to cover it on the back. You're going and along. Then, yeah. yeah, and then over there. So it'll work like that. So I'm just putting the, the rest of the grasses in here. So once we've drawn it out, I guess yes. the next step is the actual stitching. It is the actual stitching. I'm going to have to This is the bit that I really thread. want you to see. It's... Um, <laughs> We need some more thread, did you say? I well, we, 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 we had that piece we split earlier on. Have you, have you still got the other half of that? Um, 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 um. We, can... we could use that. Excellent. This one. That, that would be really good, yeah. yeah. If you really can't get the hang of stitching with the doubled thread, you know, I guess with the, the stranded one, you could just use one strand, but you will find it... I mean, six strands, rather, you know, don't split it. You'll find it a lot harder to pull it through because it'd be quite a bulky. Bit yeah, it'd be a little bit thicker. It's very easy to sort of split the um Oh, dead easy, the thread, dead yeah. easy. There, there is a, a brand of Sashko thread that's sold in Japan, which has four strands and you can split it. Oh, so then it's going even Yeah, even so, thinner. you know, it's, it's different, again, a little bit to this, but uh, this, this is working OK. But quite quickly, you can start to mark out the pattern. So this is for the oh, front pocket really of that wall hanging. And then once you've done that, mm -hmm. then you just you jump straight in and you go straight for stitches. I would jump in and I would start stitching. But if I was doing this at home, actually, I would, at some stage before I did my stitching, possibly, just when I cut the fabric out even, um, something that I, I do very often, I take it to my sewing machine and can you see that I've done like a little overlock stitch? Yes, on the edge. On the yeah. edge. It's just so that the fabric doesn't fray while I'm stitching. And if you're going to use the packs that we've, we've got, you know, the sort of linen-y kind of fabrics that are in those and the, the one you described more like a denim, um, with those two, I would definitely say overlock or zigzag the edge before you start doing the sash coat. You don't want it fraying. You're handling it a lot when you're doing a sash coat and you don't yeah. want it fraying away. And as long as you keep that stitching really narrow, you see it's only about an eighth of an inch, about three millimetres or so, that will disappear into your seams when you come to put your little wall hanging together. But in terms of when you're actually doing the stitching, obviously for the longevity and to stop it from wearing away, always yes. zigzag or overlock it's, your it's edges of really, fabric. It's a really, really good idea. If you haven't got a sewing machine, you could just over sew along the edges because, you know, you, of course you can put sashko together without a sewing machine, but personally I tend to machine mine together. I hand stitch my sashko and I machine it together. That's actually the other thing, <laughs> as, a, as a point, you know, if you don't have a sewing machine and you do do mm. something, you know, by hand or perhaps you yes. do cross stitch, this is a lovely technique as well for that to, well, it, to well, make it into something else. Most of my Japanese friends who do this, they, a lot of them don't have sewing machines no. and they make everything by hand. So typically they'll make a piece of sashko, then they'll put some patchwork around it, they'll make it into a bag and the whole thing's hand sewn. That's, that's so it's, just, right, it's great as well if you yeah. don't have a sewing machine. It just yeah. gives you the option to. Yeah. We've got a photo sent in from Karen. Have we? Let's have a look. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, that's lovely. 
That's lovely. The patterns on that are both Hitomi's Ashi patterns, actually. Um, the one that I can just see a tiny bit of on the right, that looks like a variation on one called Kaki no Hanazashi, which is persimmon flower stitch. And the, the one that's a diamond shape, oddly enough, is called Hishizashi, which means diamond stitch. <laughs> Kara yeah. said she went to one of your workshops and she's been addicted ever since. I kind of recognise those from that, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Gorgeous. Really lovely. And also it's lovely to see how you can start to incorporate it into, oh, yes. you know, yeah. into things. Like you said, you use mm. your bag with it on all of the time. You, you oh, know, yes. You're not just going to sit to piece and, and have it, you know, I'll, there. I'll, sh I'll show you my beaten up Sashko handbag. It's been carried around. It has. I made it four years ago. And the funny thing is everything else out on it, on it is wearing out, apart from the Sashko. The Sashko is the best condition thing. All but, the other fabric is starting to go. But historically as well, that's, that's what we were talking about this morning, <laughs> is that the, the Sashko was done, you know, to, to extend the life of fabric or to recycle it. It makes, it, it, makes it tougher, much, much tougher than if it didn't have any Sashko on it. It's quite incredible, really. Um, but I'll show you that because, yeah, you, you will be amazed. Maybe I should have brought it in the studio and showed it to people as well, <laughs> but it, it really has been beaten up and it's been all over the world with me. So I was just marking an extra little curve there at the top of the Sagai had, because with the Sagai had the ocean wave pattern at the top, I thought I'll have, um, I'll have two versions of it. I can't remember which way around I did them in the book, I'd have to look at the picture, but um, did I put that version at the top or did I put? Yes. I did, I did, wow. I, this is amazing. Better memory than you thought. I made that ages, literally probably about 10 years ago I made that, so it's, it's quite surprising. And I can remember all of it. <laughs> um, and then just down here, for the second row of Sagai hat, I'm actually going to draw the, the third curve slightly differently. So I've taken... This, this is just a two-inch circle that I'm using now. And I put it like that. I did it so that it was just about a quarter of an inch up. There we go. Why are you just finished doing that? Would you mind yeah, if I sure. show some of these samples that you've brought in? No, I'm just aware that... That time's going to fly. Oh, it's Let's all right. put this aside. We're, we're doing OK. <laughs> oh, also, we just talked through those bundles that we've got this morning. So all of these bundles have the book in, and they also have a metre and a half of fabric. So the first one I'll show you, this is the denim blue bundle. This is the only blue bundle we've now got left in stock. So you can see a metre of the denim there on the bottom. You get half a metre of the solid blue. You get Susan's Simple Sashko book which is perfect for beginners. And also, you know, you've got your different pro eight different projects in there to incorporate Sashko and your threads, ABGC33. Then we've also got the red bundle, which is this fabric here. So you've got the, um, how do you feel about the red? You've got the linen look fabric and it. the solid red, <laughs> do you? I love it, yes, yeah. Um, although it's traditional to do sash coat on the blue, you do see, well, you see some old pieces that are done on other fabrics. Can I show you one I've got with yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. Really, it's really wild. Absolutely. This, this isn't wild. just, um, oops. This isn't just coloured, it's, it's plaid, it's plaid. It's got a variation on that Shippo design right on the corner and... Totally different feel. Totally different it? look, totally different look. No, so I think, you know, if you want to do Sashko with colours, that is absolutely fine. And when I've, when I've taught a lot of people in the past, many people have said to me, well, I love the Sashko, but... I don't have a lot of blue in my house. Mm. It's not my kind of colour. You know, I prefer red or green or something, you know. And they often find that stitching on a different colour kind of goes with their decor a little bit better. So it's something you can tie into, you know, what yeah, you might of course have you can. In, yeah. in, in the feel of your house. Yeah. But there's also the scarlet bundle as well that's on your screen. So that's the mm. uh, red denim, which is that really lovely rustic. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done placemats with, with red. Oh, have you? And they're gorgeous. Christmassy yeah. as well, a bit Christmassy. They were a bit, actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And two, the red solid too, and also yeah. the book. All of them have the book with them this morning, so you can make that wall hanging. Yeah. So we're at the point now where we finish the drawing. I finished the drawing. Where did that thread go? It oh, is. We had one we split off earlier. Here's one we split off earlier. So the scarlet denim bundle, that's the one on your screens there. A metre of the scarlet denim, half a metre of your solid red. It's mm. sort of a burgundy red. And then you've got your thread, you've got your skein of um, embroidery thread as well. And also, the, again, the book, Simple Sashko book. So I've threaded my needle, I've brought the two ends down This is together. the bit. Let's get sewing. I love this, this, this bit. This is the, yes, this is the fun bit. Um, you know, you want to make sure that your threads are really nice and smooth. So usually I, I just smooth them down like that. This will work actually whether you're using stranded or whether you're using Japanese sashiko thread. Um, they, they will behave. And you can get hold of it tightly like that. Snap it with your thumbs. Oh, OK. That is supposed to get all the extra twist out. Could you just do that once more so we can get a close-up on that? <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. You, you get hold of it like that. Snap it, well, you hold it anyway, just tight. Snap it with your thumbs 
and apparently that gets all the extra twist out. And I have no idea what it really does to the thread. Just but it, gives, puts it in a spin. But it looks cool. <laughs> so you can just do it. Um, and it's a nice little thing to do. Anyway, I'm just going to tie a knot there. If I was going to do this, um, I was going to stitch the whole thing for real, um, what I would actually do is deal with each pattern section separately. I wouldn't try to stitch part of the shippo design and then go up into the Nowaki. I would actually do those separately. I would find it a little bit too confusing for my brain mm. to know where I was if I tried to sort of mash those two patterns up together. So imagine I've already done my shippo design. If I was going to do that, I would have stitched along that curve and I would go around there like that. You know, think they're, they're curving lines. And then I would have gone back to the other side. So you sort of snake that through. Yeah, that's what I would have done. So doing it a little bit differently to the way you normally would, because of course, as we showed you earlier on, you know, we would, we'd actually do a diagonal wavy line, but because we've only got one repeat, we can't go whizzing off on those long diagonals because no. we haven't got them. Um, so imagine I've done that. You'll have to sort of think about it a little bit there. And now I'm going to stitch my Noaki, and I'm going to start at the bottom of the Noaki. Oops, I brought that all the way through at the front. Actually, if you, if you do that by mistake and you come through at the wrong side, it's a little trick you can do. Get hold of your thread, wiggle the hole around a little bit. Just turn that so they can Oops. see. Sorry, I'm just going to turn that I over. I was really quite tough with that. I, I wiggled just it wiggle around. That out. Yeah. yeah. To try and make the hole a bit bigger. And then I would need to hold it up to a really good light source to do this. I'm tempted to hold it up at the studio lights, but uh, <laughs> Very bright. I, I will dazzle myself if I do that. Actually, just holding it like that, I can see the hole and I'm going through with the eye end of the needle. And, and just it, putting it back It through. undoes the stitch. And then if you just give your fabric a little sort of twist like that, it'll close the hole up. So if you start wrong. But again, this was folded over to start with, and, and now Susan's oh, just taking one it, layer yes. of fabric yeah, to stitch Yeah, because through. I'm only going through um, one layer. Because yeah. it's, it's easy, much easier to do well, that. Well, it's easier to do, but it also means that the inside of the pocket will be nicely finished. And when I put um, fabric or thread or a pen or something in, there won't be a load of um, stitches on the back for it to get caught on. Can I just pause you oh, one yes. second? If we can. just tip it towards the camera so that y you can see. So just sort of weaving in and out. Mm -hmm. How would you describe this? You're just catching the... What I'm doing, I'm pleating the fabric onto the tip of the needle. So that's ultimately mm -hmm. what it... That's what that Sashka is. That is what I'm doing. I'm pleating it onto the tip of the needle like that. And I'm going along. I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom of that curve. I just wanted to do a little tiny bit of those grasses just so you can see what I do with it. Because some people would say it's just it's like a running stitch, or it looks like a... Well, it know, is a running stitch. Yeah. It's just the way you do it. It's just... It it's the way you do it. <laughs> so that was all pleated together, and then you yep. pull it through. And then I've eased it all out. I mean, if people are watching this later on, on, on the repeat, they can rerun that bit, can't they? Just go, go in <laughs> slow motion. Go in slow motion, have a look at it again. And now I'm going to go up the short bit of thread, thread, grass, the short bit of grass, run up there. Just catching that fabric. Yeah, it's... If we maybe do the... If we show the pull through in really slow. Yeah, you see, if you look at that... Can the camera see that? Um, it's quite useful, actually, because the, the shine of the needle against the fabric, you can really see the length of the stitches you're doing. And um, just take the last one. And then I can pull it through again. So when it's like pulled that. through, it gathers, doesn't it? It gathers a little bit, yeah. And that helps to make... That all the strands in the thread lie parallel. They're not twisting up. If they were twisting, you'd know because they would look like little knots. Rather than that traditional yeah. flat. Yeah, it looks really nice like that. And then just ease it out. You can keep letting go of the needle as well. It's not going to go anywhere. No, because it's... Because it's tied on. And then I would come here, you see, to start the next bit of grass. And I would go down the next little bit of grass, keeping an eye on time. You're we're, we're, we're fine like at the moment. <laughs> 15, so. 20 minutes. OK, thanks. Very therapeutic, actually, just watching you, it's, watching you it's, stitch. It's very therapeutic. It's very addictive. Is the camera catching all of that OK? Probably is. Um, yeah, that's good. I'm trying to make myself slow down a little bit because I do this quite quickly. Do you, naturally? Yes. Um, the more you do... Now, you see, I'm coming down to the bottom there and I'm going to have to squeeze in all the stitches for the next squeeze. bit of the arc as well. Can you see that? You just lift that tiny bit. That's Thanks. it. You can see the needle in there. Yep. So... Just, I don't know if we can just see there as well. Mm -hmm. That's where you can start to see that gather. Oh, there we go. Maybe if we look at the screen, it might help. <laughs> that's it. You can just see how they're all... Yeah. That sort of starts to pull yeah, it together. That's super. 
and I'll go through there. Now, I want to show you the back just a little bit. Oops. I don't want that to be too tight. Can you see what's happening? Woo! I'm not, I wasn't quite in the right space there, was I? Um, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little tiny loop just down there. And that means that my, my thread's not pulling my fabric up too tightly. And I've also got a little bit of a loop here as well. I haven't pulled that tight. If I keep pulling it tight, it'll make my sash coat sort of all bunch up and pull in. So those gathers that you're creating, you, you mm. need, it needs to then, once you've, you've finished it, it needs to have room to, to breathe, really, and to, co it to, does. to come out flat. It Otherwise, does. it's going it to really going to have a yeah. bunched if effect. You keep, if you keep pulling all those little um, changes of direction on the back, if you keep pulling them very, very tight, then what will happen, your sash coat will start to bunch up. And there, you see, I'm coming in again there. So you can see I've actually got three lines all coming in. Um, I want to show you a little joining knot as well for when you run out of thread. I know I haven't run out of thread, but I'm going to pretend I've run out of thread. Um, I'll just take a couple more stitches, go through to the back. Imagine I've now got no thread. I've come to the end of it. And there's a wonderful little joining knot that you can do. It's actually in the book, this. Where have I put my scissors? Oh, uh, I, put, I put them down. It's all right, I've got them here. <laughs> I, I tidied them away after the last time and uh, forgot where I put them. So I'm going to pretend that I've actually finished and, oh dear, that's all I've, that's all I've got. Yeah. yeah. Oh dear, run out of thread. I totally run out of thread. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Right. I can join in a new thread. So imagine this is a complete new thread. I know it's a little bit on the short side. And that one there is my old one. Um, so I'm going to tie those together. And you're probably thinking, that is so small, I can't possibly tie it together. I'm going to use a thing called a, we would call it a weaver's knot. In Japanese, it's a hatam musubi, which means a loom knot. It's Say the same thing. A weaver's knot, hatam musubi. Hatam hata musubi. Hata is Japanese for loom, for, okay. you know, for a weaving loom. And musubi is knot or bow. It's the, same, it's the same word, actually, that's used for the big bow on the back of the kimono, musubi. Musubi. Yeah. yeah. So it's a hatam musubi or a loom knot, and in order to tie it, I need to have my finger and my thumb on the top. Okay. Okay, and I'm gonna put this, so I'm gonna have to lick it. <laughs> I'm gonna put the new thread down there, and I'm putting that down on the right of the old one, and then I'm gonna hold it. I'm sort of doing this in my fingers, and I've got the fabric in between. Okay. Then I'm gonna bend the old bit, oops, over like that, so they're crossed. Yep. Yep. Then I'm going to get hold of this. I'm going to do all the rest of the work with this. I need a loop going over my thumb. So it's going off to the left like that. It needs to be underneath my thumb. Easiest way to do it, lift your thumb up and put it down quickly again. Yep. <laughs> underneath the new end, hold it again. Over the old end. And then you bring your thumb up onto the loop and you bend the old end in like that. Ah, okay. Stick your thumb on it, hang on to it, and pull. You've got to hold those ends as you pull, because if you if you don't hold the ends as you pull, it'll come out. Um, I'll I'll do that again. I'm going to try and watch what's coming up on the screen. Um, I'm just wondering the best way to do this. It's really, really great actually because you it. think when there's a t only a tiny short thread at the back, there's you no way you do could it. attach. No. Yeah, but this is amazing because it means you waste almost no thread. So there's the new end, it's going down like that. I'll leave that a little bit longer so you can see the difference. That's the old one, it's been bent over. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, could I sort of turn around a little bit so you sort of see it the other way around? What, feels, what feels more natural? Does that look better? Whoops. Whatever feels most natural to you, I don't want to... Well, it feels unnatural, but I want people to be able to see it. <laughs> um, so you make the loop going off there to the left. I'll, I'll have to turn it around, sorry about that. I really need a camera over my shoulder. It for was this. quite clear before. It the was. thing is as well oh, is that right. you can um, you can always go and pause on YouTube. Yes. Do you want to just, just pause, try it once more where it was pause here? Pause on so YouTube, we can try and... go back and watch it again because I know people will be intrigued by this and then want to see it done again and again. Producer so, Hannah said the way you did do it before was very clear, so it's Oh that's wonderful. Well this is the new end, put it down like that. That's the old one. Bend it over, make a loop going off over your thumb, lift your thumb up, put it down again quick underneath the new end, hold it over the old one. Bend the old one through the loop, hold that, and then pull. 
so good. That's it, so. It that's won't great come out. Tip. It's, no. an, it's an amazing knot, and I'm not very good at knots. But that one, you made <laughs> it like, one, you sure you're not a sailor? One, it really works. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. You, if you want to, you can trim it off a little bit. I, I tend to leave ends on like that, and okay. that, that's perfectly okay. And then you can just keep stitching, and that is a wonderful way to join in another thread. While you carry on stitching, we've had a couple of questions Ooh, have we? in. Oh, email, so let's have a look. So, what, what was that one? Sorry, what? Hannah. <laughs> Would you use a thimble? I don't. You don't use a thimble. <laughs> I don't. If you were doing sash coat through lots and lots of layers, um, you know, say you want, you really did want to make something like a floor rug, and you're going through five layers. There's a, a thimble you can get. It's called a coin thimble. And it's like a, a ring and it fits on like that. There's a disc. There's a picture of it in my books, actually. And you would hold, you'd hold the sashka needle. You'd have to imagine I've got one. You'd hold the sashka needle. Normally, you'd use the really, really long one and you kind of hold it back towards the thimble so it nestles. Oh, hang on. I think we had a picture. I think we, I think we do we have a picture of it in this? Maybe, maybe, maybe this I didn't. I think it, I I'll, think I'll it might be in the other one. Um, it's only really useful with the Here very... It is. Oh, there it is. That's wonderful. It's useful with the very, very long needle. If you're going through lots and lots and lots and lots of layers. But if you're not, you really don't need it. And I've, I've just been doing... Um, I've done a borrow bag. It borrows the Japanese um, rag patch work. And it, in place, it's got five layers. And I didn't even use a, a thimble for that because the sashko needles are so sharp, they do actually go through. So because it's so strong and it isn't going to... Mm -hmm. You don't have to apply too much pressure. No, it's, it will go through. It'll go through, OK. Yeah. And so we also had one other question. Who was that one from, Hannah? Oh, it just says... Okay, so um, would this be good for a beginner? What sort of projects would you advise? That you know, what sort of things would you do if you were just starting out? This book, I, actually, you said I would start with something small, like a little coaster, something like that, because you know, if you don't get it quite right, this you way. can always have a glass of wine or a G and T, and start not, again. Not look too closely, um, because the other thing I, like I've got to tell you with a lot of the the very old sash coat, it's not very well marked. It's very very wobbly. Um, some of those very small patterns. I mean, I've, I've done a little piece here where I, I, I did it using some colours. This is the Hitomi's actually the one-stitch Sashiko style. And that kind, people often didn't even mark it. They just went for it. Yeah, just went for it. So a lot of the old pieces look really wobbly. Well, if yours isn't looking too good, get all the marks off and then tell people, well, you know, years ago, they used to stitch without putting any marks on. And then just let them draw their own conclusions. So for a beginner, if you do want to start, with, go for something small is the I'm moral go, of the story. Go, go for something small, then you're going to get it finished and you're going to feel pleased with it, aren't you? So, and, and then also, work your way up to the bigger things. Well, absolutely. And also yeah. in this, with this book, with the, mm. uh, with the bundle today, you've got a metre and a half of fabric, so there are enough to do some oh, of the yes. smaller projects first, and then the wall hanging. How do we, can we just look at how oh, we yes. would actually um, fold this pocket then? How, how would we do that? When it goes once in, in when, once it actually goes into the wall hanging, it will go in like that, it's folded. So you leave it folded just You leave like it that. folded like that. You would pin... I've got... It's not quite the same size, but I've got another square... I'll show you a picture in here. ..that I cut. Um, hold on a moment. I'm trying to find another piece of fabric now that hasn't got something marked on it, because I've got lots of things that I marked earlier on. Um, it's a different colour, so you can see the difference. Imagine this is the same width. It isn't. It's a little bit narrow. But you, you're just going to stack it up more or less like that. So there's your other piece of fabric behind. Your backing. And you could, you could tack or pin up the sides. And then you treat that like a patchwork piece when you sew it to the next pieces. So that's your pocket. So you just attach those in there and then it's perfect for your yeah. A4 paper. Yeah. Like there are said. diagrams in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> it is Lots of diagrams, actually, to show you how it's done. But that, that's basically the idea. You, you're then going to treat the pocket front and the pocket back. And because, of course, you've stitched your sashiko, but then you've folded it up. I mean, you're not going to see the sashiko on the back. No. So it's nice and um, secure. Yeah. And all you just treat it as one thing. Encapsulated in there. And then you, you start sewing your strips around it and you put it together into the pocket. Lovely. I'm mm. just going to look at those bundles we've got for the wall hanging. Yeah. And then we'll come back and we're going to look at how to use the paper. I want to show you how to use Chaco paper. Okay. Yes, very quickly. <laughs> we'll be back in just a second. Let's okay. look at these first. So, these, we've only got uh, one blue bundle left this morning, so I'll start with that one first of all. And this is, you've got your very light denim fabric, so you get a metre of this. Nearing single figures on this blue one as well, so if you do like this one, please do check out your baskets. A metre of the denim look, um, cotton. It's a, it is a very lightweight still, it's not um, a thick denim. 
and then you also get half a meter of your solid blue paired with that and your thread and your skein of white thread too for the actual sash coat and with the simple sash coat book as well so that all comes in a bundle eight different projects in there not just the wall hanging and as susan said this morning you could use the um you could use some of the leftover fabric to perhaps create a couple of coasters or if you're only just starting with, on your sash coat journey you could start the, you could do the coasters to start with and then move into something slightly bigger like the um hanging then we had two red bundles. I'll start first of all with this one that's got the, um, this is our scarlet bundle. Is this the one with the denim? This is a lovely fabric. This is much thicker. It is still a cotton and um, you get a metre of this, but it is a much thicker fabric, much more durable, perfect for, um, you know, for home wear and things if you want something with a little bit more longevity. It's got a bit more body and weight to it. You can see here actually if I just show you the reverse side of that. But as we just saw, you know, Susan was using a different fabrics there, different patterns, not just your plain indigos. And perfect if you have got different uh, colours around the house, perhaps blue doesn't go. Or maybe if you wanted a tote bag or something and you wanted a different colourway, you've got a red option there, teamed with a red solid. And again, the book and thread. And finally, we've got a brighter red bundle. So these are both 100% um, cotton, but this is your uh, linear look fabric. So this is more of a silky cotton as opposed to that thicker sort of denim feel to it. A metre of this, which has got a nice sheen to it. Half a metre of the red solid in the background, that poppy red. And the simple sash code look as well too in that bundle. IBGC00-2445. Let's just quickly look through this book before we head back over to Susan. So the different projects that you've got in here. So this book's only available in the bundle today. You've got eight different projects in the book. I'm going to start at the back where I keep showing you the same things. But you've got here um, another wall hanging. So this is a different option. Almost like a patchwork look there, actually. It is patchwork. It's a patchwork. Yeah. Is it, that's patchwork with Sashko and being informed by Susan. Really lovely. You can just see how these ornate designs all come together. But also everything broken down, lots of, um, you know, lots of diagrams and lots of step-by-step -step instructions. You've got these beautiful framed samples here. So if you wanted to perhaps, um, you know, to pop those in different rooms in the house. And again, they would look very different with different background colour fabrics. Perhaps if you did try that with the red. This is the wall hanging we've been looking at this morning, the pocket hanging. You've got enough fabric in your bundle to make that and you'd have some left over for some of these smaller projects like the coasters. Nice, actually quite an autumnal feel with those reds as well. The table mats. But eight different projects, that lovely cushion. I don't know if we can look a little bit more closely at that, but it's really gorgeous. Sort of that ornate design you can see there with the stitching coming it's coming <laughs> you just need to see it a little bit closer up so you can really see the pattern IBGC00 that's for the red wall hanging so a meter and a half of fabric and your book which is included in all of these bundles today so let's have a look. We're going to look, we've got one other technique we wanted to look at, which was using some paper. So we're going to do that now. Um, and what was this paper called? Chac it's called Chaco paper. Chaco paper. Yes. So this is something, again, you've introduced us to lots of new things today. And this is new to us at Sewing Quarter. <laughs> right. It's, it's a good way to put a pictorial design onto a piece of fabric. It's, it's not only used for sashiko, you know, it's used for things like Japanese embroidery as well. It's a little bit like dressmaker's carbon, but it's chalky rather than waxy. So it comes okay. off more easily. You know how dressmaker's carbon, you have to more or less burn it off, don't you, with the iron. With this, it will just rub off. So this, so comes, this comes as a packet and then you, it, because of that wax, it rubs... It, it, it's, yeah, it, it comes off. It rubs it comes off, off more easily chalky. rather. It's more it's chalky, chalky than it is, yeah. um, you know, with the carbon, like mm -hmm. you said, where you need to really sort of iron it. Yes, so yeah. um, you get five sheets of paper in here in different colours. So if we just see how that paper looks <laughs> well, when it arrives. Well, it's, it's quite strange. I, I've used this actually already. <laughs> um, it, looks, it looks like that. It looks white on the back. <laughs> it looks not interesting. And it's coloured on the face. And you can see I've used this already a couple of times to do a fish and a few other things. And I've, rather than delve into your packet and <laughs> mess it You've all up... You've got one already open. I've, I've brought a packet that I've been using, because the, the wonderful thing about this stuff is it just seems to go almost forever. 
I've used this. This is one of the packs I use in my students. And they have been used again and again and again. Actually, that's a slightly paler pink. This is from a really old pack. But I don't know if you can see how many times that has been used. So you can reuse this with you different You can use patterns. it again and again and again. And there's still a lot of life, even in that piece. It's probably been used 20 or 30 times. What sort of patterns do these suit, then, these, these, these Anything paper? pictorial something that's not geometric. Um, although some people do like to draw the geometric designs on paper and then transfer them over. Personally, I like to usually draw them straight on the fabric because I feel like I can see what's going on. But if you wanted to, you could actually draw them on paper and then use these to transfer. So there are, are there some examples in the book of more of the motif type ones rather than, there, there you'll probably are, find them more actually, easily than I um, Yeah, I'll try and make sure we don't get any chalk on ourselves as well with that. Because those pictorial are, ones as opposed to the geometrics, yeah, what you would I, be using I've got a little for. section in here of motifs, assorted different motifs. There you go. Um, and as well as, you know, small motifs based on flowers and things like that, I also put some useful kanji characters in, just in case you wanted to occasionally put kanji on something. Um, something rather strangely that we are probably more into than my Japanese friends are putting kanji on things, it, but it does make it look rather good. Um, What's kanji? Kanji is the, is the Japanese writing. Oh! Yeah, okay. it's, it's the pictograms, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. See, I see. But then these designs up at the top, these are all um, Japanese kamon, which are family crests. And I just love doing those as motifs in sashika. I've got two just in front of me here. This one is, um, is tachibana. It's um, orange blossom, Japanese traditional That's orange blossom. That's a beautiful, it's a nice yeah. floral, isn't it? And this one is nawaki. Uh, not nawaki, sorry. It's noshi, I should say. Noshi actually sounds like the word that means to extend. Therefore, it's lucky. Oh. And it's usually nowadays represented by a bundle of ribbons or fabrics. Years ago, apparently, it was strips of dried abalone shellfish. And it used to be put onto gifts and tithes and things like that. It has very, very special auspicious meaning. But to us, of course, it just looks pretty. Which is a good it excuse. Is pretty, yeah, absolutely. It's but if excuse. it's lucky as well, we'll take that too. It is. It, it's, extending it's, life and extending all of those things, we'll take that. People sometimes ask me, you know, about the, the Sashka designs and they say, you know, well, why are they all lucky? And I think, well, who would want to stitch something that wasn't? No, that's very it's, true. It's funny. Anyway, in the packs, yeah, you get, you get five different colours. So you've always got a colour that will work with whatever fabric you've got. Yes, so you've got a, a blue, yeah. a green, a red, a white, and a yellow yeah. in, the, yeah. uh, in yeah. this yeah. pack. The, the red's more pinky, actually. <laughs> uh, as I said, that, that one is a really, it's an old, old sheet. That's what it looks like more now. Um, so you've got the white, you've got the blue, and the blue actually shows remarkably well. Even e It would even show on that blue. Um, it's surprising. People tend to automatically think, oh, I'll just use the white. You've got the yellow, which is a bit in your face, and <laughs> you've also got a green. I'm just wondering, I think the yellow might actually show up best for the camera. Okay, let's have so a look I'll, at that I'll one do then. with the yellow. What I've done, I've taken my design, which um, I've actually produced it on my computer printer, that one, because what, what you can do, you can find a crest design, you can find some of them online as well. Um, this is actually one that I originally drew up for a workshop that I teach and uh, I print it off on the computer. When I'm printing on the computer, I don't like to have too much black ink as well. I just like to do things in outline. So I've pinned it to my piece of fabric and then I've slid my piece of paper underneath. And the colour of the um, paper that you're putting underneath goes to the right side of the fabric? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, it does. It has to go that way around. Yeah. And, of course, you can, you can move your paper around, you see, while you're marking, so you can keep using little bits of the paper that you haven't maybe drawn on before. This one's been used probably about five or six times. Then you need to use something like a ballpoint pen to do the transfer, and you want something like a cutting mat underneath. Don't do it straight on your nice tabletop. I know this, is, this one's oak, so this would probably actually take it, <laughs> but I still don't want to try. No, just in case. You can end up with an impression of whatever you're drawing on the table. So, so you want a mat or something underneath? Yeah, put something hard, or if you haven't got a mat, something like the back of a, a sketchbook or something. So I'm just going to go now along the lines. And I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm just using a perfectly bog standard ballpoint pen. I went and pinched it from Simon a few minutes ago <laughs> because I'd forgotten to put mine in. Um, I'm just going around the design and I'm doing it as quickly as I possibly can because um, I don't want to take up too much time with this. And this is going to be transferring this pattern? Yes, yeah. I'm really pushing on hard. Don't use a pencil because a pencil, you can't get enough pressure. Um, think of a kid scribbling. Literally, you know, the, the way yeah. that a five-year-old might draw on a You really can sort of go forward and back a little bit. And, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm getting a lot of pressure on that. I'm doing it really quickly as well. 
Um, but as opposed to where before we were using those circular templates to mark out all of the pattern mm -hmm. with the grid and everything, if you want to go for something a bit more um, pictorial, as you said, yeah. then this is the way to, to mark the it fabric is. for that. It's, it's really easy. Yes, you could use a light box if you've got one, but they're not the cheapest thing in the world. And uh, the paper is certainly a hell of a lot cheaper than the light box um, and probably a bit more portable as well, really. So I've just done that. So in this pack, there. you get five sheets of paper. You've got the mm -hmm. five different colours as well. Um, so as Susan was saying, you know, for all the different colour fabrics, yep. you've always got something that's going to mark. And it, also, if you're using a more a busy patterned fabric in the, you know, in the background, um, then you've got you've got a chance to transfer it onto something and so yeah. you'll be able to visually see yeah, it. Yeah, the, the the choice of different colours is really good. Um, if you're trying to use something like a shock cotton where you've got two different coloured threads, be really aware of the two different colours in the threads as well. Because you might think, oh, this one, it, it's, it's green, so I can use blue to mark on it. But actually, you might find that it's yellow threads going one way and blue threads going the other. And if the blue is very similar to the blue of the paper, you won't see it. So then you'd pick a pink? Yeah, or, exactly, yeah. exactly. You pick something that's, that's completely different. So that, ah. there, whoops, can you hold it up? That's, the, that's how that's transferred. I don't know, I can the camera actually? Yes, we'll it can, get it. We'll get you it. can we'll see get it. it, you can see it, yes. There it is. There you go, that's, that's pretty good. That's the yellow and the blue. Yeah, that's come out very well. I've got a little piece I put in, I'm not sure if we've put it on the table. Is it these pieces? Uh, yeah, the, oh yes, it's one of these. Um, because yes, it, it brushes off when you stitch these. See, this, this was done with it, that cushion cover. That Same is thing. really lovely. It does. It has a very a different feel to it than more pictorial ones, don't they? As opposed to those. They do. To those they do. They have a, a very different look. But oh, I want, the I want fish! Oh, I fish. like this. I wanted to show you look that because that was marked Amazing. on in April. I, I taught that as a class for the Prague Patchwork meeting. Oh. Oh, we actually goes the other way. <laughs> oh, this. You got. You got him going sideways. Oh, oh, he's upside down. There you go. Oh, he's that way. way. He's that way. He's, he's swimming down towards oh, you, I say, and I've it's a Japanese you. carp. And of course, I told him on his tummy. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we, we did that um, in the class. It's, it's actually a design I've done for quite a few years. Um, so that was marked up in April, and this piece here. Oh dear, how many years ago did I mark this up? Quite a long time ago. I don't know if you can actually. Can you see? Using the paper, you mean, and that it's still Use, the marks are still there. Using the paper, the marks are still yeah. there. I can still see them. But where, where they did start to come off a little bit, I've just touched it in, I think probably using the Soline pencil, or either that or a, a, a Clover pen, one of the two. You know, if, if you're doing a design that's, that's quite elaborate and you've been carrying it around a lot and handling it a lot, yes, the chalk will start to come off eventually. But at least you know it's going to come off. And before the line completely disappears, you can just take your other marking pen or pencil and just touch it sort up. Sort of a stencil, just to kind yeah, of go just, just pop it back on, and you know it's fine. Yeah. And so also this morning, if you missed the ultimate Sashko book, this is and um, the book that Susan did first. So this is an, sort of a whole, well, encyclopedia, yes, isn't it? it? Is. Of, you know it the is. history of yeah. it, what yeah. it's all about, where it came from. Um, you know we've only had a small look at it really. We've barely had a chance to delve into some of the projects in here, but gorgeous sort of traditional what's your favorite thing in the book that is really hard to say <laughs> baby. that's something i ask you to choose oh, a favorite I'm, child and my projects i don't know one one of the things that has been incredibly popular in it and it isn't something that i made because of course i've showcased the work of my japanese teachers and and their group at the back um, one of the things that has been incredibly popular, it's right at the front of the book, so we'll get to it eventually. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful big version of that Noshi panel that I've just been marking up. It's a huge one. There's a big, big, big wall hanging, and there's a picture of it in the book. We didn't give the pattern because, you know, it's, it was... Oh, we've gone past it. That's okay. It's... Um, it's something that one yeah, of my friends is. did. There you go. But I have to say, if you wanted to do that, there'd be nothing to stop you tracing it off and just enlarging it. But that's about six foot long. It's huge. Wow. It's a massive wall hanging. She's got it in the hall of her house. It's wonderful. Gorgeous. So it, it just goes to show you can make something small, you can make something big, you can make something hang on the wall, you can make something that's a bag that has to be tough. You can use it for all sorts of things. It's, it's just great fun. Amazing. Thank you so much for our intro to Sashko today. I feel like we could carry on delving even we further could, into we it. Could. We'll have to get you back. We'll have to get you back and do some more Sashko. Loads of lovely I'd messages love from you this morning. So Good. thank you. Let's just have a quick look at the menu for tomorrow as well. Um, so Jennifer Mills is in in the morning. We've got a back pleated jacket at eight o'clock. 
9 a.m. That sounds nice for autumn, actually. Quilt as you go. Then we've got a craft tote. I'm always happiest with a bag on my shoulder. And 11 o'clock, we've got make a menagerie. So we're looking at lots of different fabrics in that hour with um, different animals and different, different things that we've had on the show before, different toys. But again, a massive thank you to Susan today. I've learned so welcome. much today. I feel like I've had a history lesson as well as learning nice <laughs> techniques. It's lovely. And Paul as well. Big thank you to Paul Clark from the Great British Sewing Bee, who we've had in today. As I said, tomorrow Jennifer Mills is in. We're doing some dressmaking, also looking at some toys that we've had on that have been really popular on the show. And Susan, we'll have to get you back. I'd love have to an, come back. Have another look at our um, book. I've had a great time too. Good, I'm glad you've <laughs> enjoyed excellent. it. Thank yeah, you so much. Super, thank you. <laughs> we'll see you again tomorrow. See, I hope you have a great day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Don't forget, shopping with us is easy and simple. You can just contact us at 0800 112 4433 and speak to our UK-based call centre to place an order. Or shop online with us at www.sewingquarter.com.